Russian coalition, a move that was seen in St. Petersburg as rank treachery. Vienna thereby irretrievably forfeited the Russian support that had once been the cornerstone of its foreign policy. Cavour was the first European politician to show how this realignment could be exploited to his state's advantage. The events of 1859 were instructive in other ways as well. Under Napoleon III, France emerged as a power prepared to challenge by force the European order established at Vienna in 1815. The Prussians now felt the ancestral threat from the West more keenly than ever. The shock effects of the French intervention in Italy was heightened by memories of the first Napoleon, whose ascendancy had begun with the subjugation of the Italian peninsula and continued with an invasion of the Rhineland. The Prussian mobilization of 1859 may not have been the disaster some historians have described, but it did nothing to allay the sense of vulnerability to a resurgent Bonapartist France. As for the Austrians, they had fought bitterly to keep their Italian possessions, inflicting 18,000 casualties on the Franco-Piedmontese of Magenta and Solferino. Would they not also fight to defend their political preeminence within a divided Germany? Prussia's position was in some respects worse than Piedmont's, for it seemed clear that the middling states of the Third Germany, unlike the lesser North Italian principalities, would support Austria in any open struggle between the two potential German hegemons. Almost all Germany, for the last forty years, has cherished a hostile spirit against Prussia, William wrote to Schleinitz on the 26th of March, 1860, and for a year this has decidedly been on the increase. The Italian war was thus a reminder of the centrality of armed force to the resolution of entrenched power political conflicts and the view gained ground within the military leadership that Prussia would have to reform and strengthen its army if it was to meet the challenges facing it in the near future. This was not a new problem. Since the 1810s, financial constraints had meant that the size of the army had not kept pace with the growth in the Prussian population. By the 1850s, only about one half of the young men of eligible age were being drafted. There were also concerns about the equality of the Landwehr militia, created to fight Napoleon by the military reformers, Scharnhorst and Boyen, as its officers were trained to much less exacting standards. Leading the campaign for military reform was the new regent, Prince William of Prussia. William was already a 61-year-old man, with an impressive spray of whiskers, when he began in 1858 to deputise for his older brother, who had been incapacitated by a sequence of strokes. William's emotional attachment to the Prussian army was deeply rooted in his biography. He had worn a uniform since the age of six. On the 1st of January, 1807, at the age of nine, he received his ensign's commission, together with promotion to lieutenant as a Christmas present. His earliest experiences in service were bound up with the memory of invasion and the flight of the royal family to East Prussia. Unlike his more mentally agile elder brother, William disliked his lessons and was never happier than when in the company of his fellow cadets and military tutors. It is easy to imagine how important the companionable routines of service must have become after the trauma of his mother's death in 1810. William's devotion was focused on the regular army of the line, not on the auxiliary militias of the Landwehr. William was repelled by the civilian ethos of the Landwehr, which he regarded as both militarily ineffective and politically unreliable. Boyan and Scharnhorst had set out to forge a military establishment that would feel and engage the patriotic enthusiasms of the people. William and his military advisers wanted an armed force that was responsive only to the will of the sovereign. It would be going too far to suggest that William already had in mind the unification of Germany by armed Prussian force. His thinking on the German question was much more open-ended than that. Yet there is no doubt that he was a consistent enthusiast for the idea of a closer German Union of some kind, and that he envisaged this as occurring under Prussian captaincy. William had shared his brother's enthusiasm for the ill-fated Air Fort Union, and was disappointed by the Prussian retreat at Olmutz. Whoever wants to govern Germany must conquer it first, he had written in 1849. Whether the time for this unification has come, God alone knows but that Prussia is destined to stand at the summit of Germany is an underlying fact of our history. But when and how, that is the question. During his posting to the Rhineland as military governor in 1849, 
William cultivated contacts with small German liberal enthusiasts of a Prussian-led union. Prussia's historical development shows that it is destined to lead Germany, he wrote in April 1851. In order to meet the challenges of a more aggressive German policy, Prussia needed a flexible and highly effective military instrument. William and his military advisers aimed to double the size of the Prussian army by raising the number of recruits in each annual levy, extending the period of basic training by six months to three years, and lengthening the period of service in the regular army reserve from two to five years. The regent also proposed to draw a clearer line between the regular army and the Landwehr, which was to be separated from the front line and regular reserve units and relegated to a subordinate position at the rear. The government's call for military reform was not in itself particularly controversial. Military expenditure had been in relative decline since 1848, and there was broad support across the liberal majority in the parliament for the idea that Prussia needed a stronger army if it was to remain capable of independent action. The events of 1859, moreover, produced a remarkable mobilization of liberal nationalist opinion across northern Germany, culminating in the foundation of the National Society. Nationalverein, in September 1859. Led by the Hanoverian nobleman, Rudolf von Benningsen, this was an elite body of several thousand parliamentary deputies, university professors, lawyers and journalists whose purpose was to lobby the Prussian government on behalf of the small German cause. The real problem lay in the question of the political relationship between the army and the parliament. Three aspects of the regent's reform program particularly antagonized the liberals. The first was the plan to do away with what remained of the Landwehr's independence. The military chiefs viewed the Landwehr as the defunct remnant of a bygone era, but for many liberals it remained a potent embodiment of the ideal of a people's army. The second bone of contention was the regent's insistence on a three-year training period for soldiers of the line. Liberals rejected this in part because of the cost implications, and in part because they believed, with some justice, that the three-year period was intended less as a military than as a political measure, to ensure that soldiers were imbued with conservative and militarist values, as well as trained to make war. Underlying these issues was the central question of the monarch's unique, extra-constitutional power of command, the Commando Cabalt. Conflict over the military was pre-programmed into the Prussian political system after 1848. The issue had both a constitutional and a broader cultural dimension. The constitutional problem was simply that the monarch and the parliament had potentially conflicting rights over the army. The monarch was responsible for command functions and in general for the composition and functionality of the military establishment, but it was the parliament that controlled funding. From the crown's point of view, the army was an organization bound in personal loyalty to the monarch and quite independent of the parliament. Liberal parliamentarians, by contrast, took the view that their budgetary powers implied a limited right to co-determine the character of the army. This implied not only policing expenditure, but also ensuring that the army reflected the values of the broader political culture. This latter issue was the tripwire that had precipitated the crisis of the Berlin Parliament in 1848. On both sides, the issues involved were of constitutive importance. William insisted that the Commando Gewalt was an unalienable attribute of his sovereignty, while the Liberals saw that the curtailment of their budgetary powers or the creation of a reactionary Praetorian Guard, honed for the purpose of domestic repression, would make a nonsense of the powers granted to Parliament under the new constitution. The military constitutional conflict that resulted gradually brought the Prussian constitutional system created in 1848 to a standstill. Early in 1860, the government presented two bills to Parliament, one outlining reforms and the other approving funds. William saw these bills as distinct in their constitutional status. It was permissible for the Parliament to have a say in the question of financing, since budgetary powers were essential attributes of the Assembly. On the other hand, he did not recognize the right of the deputies to tamper with the details of the proposed reform itself, which fell, as he saw it, within the sphere of his power of command. The Parliament responded to this gambit by making only a provisional grant of extra monies, tactically an unwise step, as it turned out, since it permitted the government to go ahead with the first phase of the reforms, even though final approval had not yet been given. A process of political radicalization set in among the Liberals. In January, a group of 17 deputies broke off from the main body of the Liberal faction 
to become the core of the new Progressive Party, Fortrich's party, thinking that a more conservative parliament might give the administration an easier ride. William dissolved the parliament and called for new elections. The new chamber, returned at the end of 1861, was even more resolutely liberal than the old, with over 100 Progressive Party members. The conservative faction, who had ruled the roost in the 1850s, were cut back to a rump of only 15 members. The new chamber was no more willing to approve the military reforms than its predecessor. In the spring of 1862, it too was dissolved. The new elections of May 1862 merely confirmed the intractability of the standoff. More than 230 of the 325 deputies belonged to liberal factions. Among the men who ran Prussia's military establishment, there were some who now favoured an all-out break with the constitutional system. Of these, the most influential was the chief of the military cabinet, Edwin von Manteuffel, cousin of the minister-president, whose conservative reformism had done so much to secure the new constitutional system after the 1848 revolutions. Edwin was both more charismatic and less politically flexible than his cousin. He was an army man of the old school who equated his relationship with a monarch with the fealty of a German tribesman to his chieftain. Contemporary prints show an upright, hyper-masculine figure with thick curling hair, the lower half of his face concealed behind a hedge of dense beard. As a member of the military cabinet, a body attached directly to the person of the king, he stood completely outside the parliamentary constitutional order. Manteuffel could be ruthless in defense of his honor and that of the Prussian army, which he appears to have seen as essentially the same thing. In the spring of 1861, when a liberal city councillor by the name of Karl Tvesten published an article criticizing the proposed military reforms and attacking Manteuffel personally for seeking to alienate the army from the people, the general offered the councillor the choice between a full public retraction and a duel. Unwilling to endure the humiliation of a retraction, Tvesten chose the duel, though he was no marksman. The councillor's bullet flew wide, while the generals drilled his opponent through the arm. The episode highlighted not just the polarisation generated by the military question, but the increasingly raw style of public life in post-1848 Prussia. There was a moment of collective paranoia in the early months of 1862, when Manteuffel's extreme views enjoyed a certain resonance among conservatives close to the monarch. But the post-revolutionary consensus held firm, and the general's great hour never arrived. Neither King William, Friedrich William IV had died in January 1861, nor the majority of his political and military advisers seriously contemplated an all-out break with the constitution. The Minister of War, Albrecht von Roon, the chief architect of the proposed reforms, preferred a search for a compromise that would spare the system while preserving the essence of the reform program. Even King William found it easier to imagine his own voluntary department from office than to contemplate a return to absolutism. By September 1862, he appeared to be on the point of abdicating in favour of his son, Crown Prince Friedrich William, who was known to be sympathetic to the liberal position. It was Albrecht von Roon who persuaded the king to step back from the brink and adopt a measure of last resort, the appointment of Otto von Bismarck to the minister-presidency of Prussia. Bismarck Who was Otto von Bismarck? Let us begin with a letter he wrote in the spring of 1834, when he was just 19 years old. His school-leaving certificate had been delayed, as a result, doubts arose about whether he would be able to matriculate in the University of Berlin. In this transitional moment, forced into idleness and full of uncertainty about what the future held, the young Bismarck was moved to reflect on what would become of him if he failed to gain entry to university. From the family estate at Knipov, he penned the following lines to his school friend, Scharlach. I shall amuse myself for a few years, waving a sword at raw recruits, then take a wife, beget children, till the soil, and undermine the morals of my peasantry by the inordinate distillation of spirits. So if in ten years' time you should happen to find yourself in the neighbourhood, I invite you to commit adultery with an easy and curvaceous young woman selected from the estate, to drink as much potato brandy as you fancy, and to break your neck out hunting as often as you see fit. You will find here a fleshly home guard officer with a moustache that curses and swears till the earth trembles cultivates a proper repugnance to Jews and Frenchmen, and thrashes his dogs and domestics with agrarious brutality, 
when bullied by his wife. I shall wear leather trousers, make a fool of myself at the Stettin wool market, and when people address me as Baron, I shall stroke my moustache benignly and knock a bit off the price. I shall get pissed on the king's birthday and cheer him vociferously, and the rest of the time I shall sound off regularly, and my every other word will be, Guard, what a splendid horse! This letter is worth citing at such length because it demonstrates how much ironic distance there was in the young Bismarck's perception of his own social milieu. The milieu of the East Elbian Junkers. Bismarck often liked to play the part of the red-necked Kraut Junker of the Prussian boondocks, but in reality he was a rather untypical example of the type. His father was the real thing. He was descended from five centuries of noble East Elbian landowners but his mother's family carried the imprint of a different tradition. Bismarck's mother, Wilhelmina Menken, was the descendant of an academic family from Leipzig in Saxony. Her grandfather had been a professor of law who entered the employ of the Prussian state to serve as cabinet secretary under Friedrich the Great. It was Wilhelmina Menken who made the key educational decisions for her sons. Bismarck consequently received a rather uncharacteristic upbringing for a member of his class. He began, not with cadet school, but with a classic bourgeois education as a boarder at the Plamann Institute in Berlin, a school for the sons of senior civil servants. From there, he progressed to the Friedrich Wilhelm Gymnasium, and later to the universities of Göttingen, 1832-3, and Berlin, 1834-5. There followed a four-year period of civil service training in Aachen and Potsdam. Bored by the monotony and lack of personal autonomy that were the hallmarks of civil service training, young Otto retired to the astonishment and dismay of his family to work on his own estate at Knipov, where he stayed from 1839 to 1845. During this long interlude, he played the Junker in heroic style. These were the years of heavy eating and drinking, with epic breakfasts of meat and ale, and yet a closer examination of life at home with Otto von Bismarck reveal some thoroughly unyunkerly pursuits, such as wide reading in the works of Hegel, Spinoza, Bauer, Feuerbach, and Strauss. These observations suggest themes that are important to an understanding of Bismarck's political life. His background and attitude help to explain the fractured relationship between Bismarck and the conservatives who were, in their own eyes at least, the natural representatives of the landed aristocracy. Bismarck was never really one of them and they, sensing this, never really trusted him. He never shared the corporatism of the old conservatives. He had never been attracted to a worldview that saw the Junker interest as pitted in corporate solidarity against the state. He had little interest in championing the rights of the locality and the province against the claims of the central authority. He did not see revolution and reforming state as two faces of the same satanic conspiracy against the natural historic order. On the contrary, Bismarck's remarks on politics and history were always informed by a deep respect for, and even at times a crude glorification of, the absolutist state, and above all of its capacity for autonomous action. When Prussia was invoking in his speeches, it was the Prussia of the great elector and of Friedrich, never the backward-looking utopia of the corporate state that put a curb on absolutism. Like his maternal ancestors, Bismarck would seek his fulfillment as an adult in service to the state but he would serve the state without being a servant. The link to the estate was not in itself a destiny. It was too narrow and boring for that, but it represented an assurance of independence. The tie to the estate, with the sense of mastery and separateness that it brought, was a fundamental strut in Bismarck's concept of personal autonomy. As he explained in a letter to his cousin at the age of 23, a man who aspired to play a role in public life must carry over into the public sphere the autonomy of private life. His concept of that autonomy of private life was emphatically not bourgeois. It derived from the social world of the landed estate, whose lord is responsible to none but himself. The consequences of this understanding of his own place in the world can be observed in his demeanour as a public figure, and particularly in his tendency towards insubordination. Bismarck never behaved as if he had a boss. This was most glaringly apparent in his relations with William I as Chancellor. Bismarck frequently pushed policies through against the monarch's will. When the king created obstructions, Bismarck resorted to tantrums and fits of weeping, backed up by the threat, sometimes unspoken and sometimes explicit, to resign and return to the comfort and peace of his estate. 
When Bismarck wanted to consolidate his relationship with the monarch, he generally did so not by endearing himself directly to the sovereign, but by engineering crises that highlighted his own indispensability, like a helmsman who steers into the storm in order to demonstrate his mastery of the ship. Bismarck appeared to stand outside the ideological prescriptions of any one interest. He was not an aristocratic corporatist, nor, on the other hand, was he, or could he be, a liberal. Nor for all his civil service experience did he ever identify with a fourth estate of the bureaucrats. Throughout his life he regarded the pen-pushers, Fieder Fuchser, of the administrative bureaucracy with a certain disdain. The result was a freedom from ideological constraints that made his behavior unpredictable. One could call it realism, pragmatism, or opportunism, an ability in any case to spring from one camp to the other, wrong-footing his opponents or exploiting the differences among them. Bismarck was not accountable. He could collaborate with the forces of liberalism against the conservatives and vice versa. He could flourish the democratic franchise as a weapon against the elitist liberalism. He could puncture the pretensions of the nationalists by seeming to take charge of the national cause. Bismarck was perfectly conscious about all of this. He disparaged theory and principles as yardsticks for political life. Politics is no science. It is an art. And anyone without the knack for it should leave it alone. If I am to proceed through life on the basis of principles, it is as if I were to walk down a narrow path in the woods and had to hold a long pole in my mouth. Bismarck's ability to toss away the pole when it became bothersome shocked those friends who believed they were his ideological soulmates. One of these was the conservative nobleman Ludwig von Gerlach, brother of Leopold, who fell out with Bismarck in 1857 over whether Napoleon III should be treated as a legitimate monarch, despite the fact he had been carried into power by a revolution. So Bismarck was not a man of principle. He is better described as the man of detachment from principle, the man who disconnected himself from the romantic attachments of an older generation to practice a new kind of politics, flexible, pragmatic, emancipated from fixed ideological commitments. Public emotion and public opinion were not authorities to be indulged or followed, but forces to be managed and steered. Bismarck's post-romantic politics was also part of the broader transformation wrought by the Revolution of 1848. In this sense, Bismarck belongs in the company of Cavour, Field Marshal Saldana, Pius IX, and Napoleon III. The point has sometimes been made that Bismarck learned much from the populist authoritarianism of the French emperor, and that his governance as German chancellor after 1871 amounted to a belated German version of Bonapartism. However, the importance of the French model should not be overstated. Prussia itself, as we have seen, underwent a transformation in governmental practices after 1848. Like Otto von Manteuffel and the new king himself, Bismarck was a man of 1848, prepared to mix politics in new combinations. Like Manteuffel, he saw the monarchical state as the key actor in political life. It was during Manteuffel's period in office that Bismarck acquired his shrewd respect for public opinion, not as the arbiter of the future, but as a subordinate partner to be cajoled and manipulated into cooperation. As the Prussian representative at the headquarters of the German Confederation in Frankfurt, Bismarck was entrusted with the covert channeling of government funds to friendly newspaper editors and journalists. Governmental manipulation of the press was a device that Bismarck would later raise to a high art. In the autumn of 1862, Bismarck was installed as minister-president in Berlin. His objective, as he explained in a letter to the crown prince, was to secure an understanding with the majority of the deputies, while at the same time safeguarding the powers of the crown and the proficiency of the army. Bismarck opened play by concocting a modified military reform program that would enlarge the army and secure government control in key areas, while meeting the liberal demand for two-year service. This gambit founded on the resistance of Edwin von Manteuffel, who succeeded in persuading the king to withhold his support. It was the old problem of the antechamber of power. Bismarck immediately understood that the key to remaining in office now lay in neutralizing all rivals for the king's confidence, and he altered his policy accordingly. The attempt at compromise was abandoned, and Bismarck switched to a policy of open confrontation designed to assure the king of his absolute dedication to the crown and its interests. The military reforms were put in train and taxes collected without parliamentary approval. 
Civil servants were informed that disobedience and political involvement with the opposition would be punished with immediate dismissal. And the Parliament was baited into ineffectual and self-undermining expressions of outrage. All this sufficed to convince the King of Bismarck's skill and dependability, and soon he began to overshadow the other competitors for influence over the monarch. In other respects, however, Bismarck's position remained extremely fragile. A further election in October 1863 produced a chamber with only 38 pro-government deputies. The battle for public opinion had evidently been lost. The king was so downcast by the election results that he reportedly sank into despondency and remarked while looking down from a window above Palace Square, Down there is where they will put up a guillotine for me. The political paralysis in Berlin also appeared to be undermining Prussia's ability to make the running in the German question. In 1863, while Bismarck struggled with the chamber, the Austrians were busy drafting and proposing reforms that would breathe new life into the German Confederation. Berlin seemed to be drifting. The Prussian minister-president's achievements in the realm of foreign policy appeared modest, to say the least. In 1863, he succeeded in blocking the Austrian reform project and continued to stave off Vienna's efforts to join the German customs union. More important was Bismarck's rapprochement with Russia, formalized in the Alvensleben Convention, the 8th of February, 1863. This agreement, by which Prussia and Russia undertook to collaborate in the suppression of Polish nationalism, secured the goodwill of St. Petersburg, but it was deeply unpopular with Polonophile liberals and helped to make Bismarck a widely hated figure. After only 18 months in office, the new minister-president had made a mark as an unusually energetic, ruthless and inventive political tactician. From a contemporary standpoint, however, it was still easy to imagine that he might struggle on for a year or two before being dismissed to make way for a compromise settlement with the lower house of parliament. It was the Danish War of 1864 that transformed Bismarck's fortunes. The Danish War In the winter of 1863, Schleswig-Holstein was in the news again. Friedrich VII of Denmark had died on the 15th of November, 1863, triggering a succession crisis. As there was no direct male heir, the Danish crown passed instead via the maternal line to Christian of Glücksburg. A dispute arose over who had a legitimate hereditary claim to rule over the duchies. The details of the Schleswig-Holstein controversy have always been taxing to follow, the more so as nearly everyone involved in it was called either Friedrich or Christian, and the following is a sketch of the salient points. A series of international treaties had established in the early 1850s that the new king of Denmark, Christian of Glücksburg, would succeed on the same terms as his predecessor, Friedrich VII. In 1863, however, the waters were muddied by the appearance of a rival claimant, Prince Friedrich of Augustenborg. The Augustenborgs did have a long-standing claim to the duchies, but Prince Friedrich's father, Christian of Augustenborg, had agreed to renounce it as part of the 1852 Treaty of London. In 1863, however, Friedrich of Augustenborg declared himself unbound by the Treaty of 1852 and defiantly adopted the title Duke of Schleswig-Holstein. His claim was enthusiastically supported by the German nationalist movement. It is worth reflecting for a moment on the distinctive quality of the Schleswig-Holstein crisis. Modern and pre-modern themes were interwoven. On the one hand, it was an old-fashioned dynastic crisis, triggered, like so many 17th and 18th century crises, by the death of a king without male issue. In this sense, we might call the conflict of 1864 the War of the Danish Succession. On the other hand, Schleswig-Holstein became the flashpoint for a major war only because of the role played by nationalism as a mass movement. The galvanizing effect of the Schleswig-Holstein issue on the German national movement had already made itself felt in the Frankfurt Parliament of 1848. In 1863-4, German nationalist opinion demanded that the duchies be constituted jointly as a new German federal state under the rule of the Augustenborg dynasty. Nationalism was crucial on the Danish side as well. The Danish nationalist movement demanded that Denmark defend its claim to Schleswig, and it was supported in this by the mainstream of Danish liberal opinion. 
the inexperienced and ineffectual new king, Christian IX, thus faced an explosive domestic situation when he came to the throne. At one point, the demonstrations taking place outside the royal palace in Copenhagen were so turbulent that the city's chief of police warned of the imminent collapse of law and order in the capital. It was anxiety about the prospect of political upheaval that forced the hand of the new king. By signing the November Constitution of 1863, Christian IX announced his intention to absorb the Duchy of Schleswig into the Danish unitary state, a gesture denounced by the German nationalists as an unpardonable provocation. There were now three conflicting positions on the duchies. The Danes insisted on the incorporation of Schleswig as set out in the November Constitution of 1863. The German nationalist movement and the majority of states in the Confederation favoured the Augustenborg claim and were prepared to support an armed intervention. The Prussians and the Austrians opposed the Augustenborg claim and insisted that the Danes and the Augustenborgs abide by the promises made in the international treaties of 1850 and 1852. After much horse trading at the Confederal Diet in December, a resolution was passed, by just one vote, that an intervention could proceed on the basis of the London treaties. On the 23rd of December, 1863, a small Confederal task force crossed the Danish frontier and moved northwards without resistance to occupy most of Holstein, south of the River Ida. The strains within the Confederation soon began to tell. The task force, with only 12,000 men, had been sufficient to take undefended Holstein, but Schleswig would be another matter. The Danes were expected to put up a vigorous defence, and a much larger force would be required to ensure success. Still acting in concert, Prussia and Austria declared that they were prepared to invade Schleswig, but only in their own right as European powers, and only on the basis of the treaties of 1851 and 1852, not as representatives of the German Confederation and not in support of the Augustenborg claim. In January 1864, the two powers presented their joint ultimatum separately to Denmark, without consulting the other confederal states. And when the Danes refused to comply, moved their combined forces across the River Ida and into Schleswig. It was a remarkable turnaround. The Austro-Prussian rivalry of the 1850s and early 1860s seemed to have made way for a mood of sweet harmony and cooperation but the apparent unity of purpose concealed a pandemonium of conflicting expectations. For the Austrian Chancellor, Count Johann Bernhard Rechberg, the joint campaign was a chance to discredit the German nationalist movement while establishing an Austro-Prussian condominium over Germany and reinvigorating the trans-territorial institutions of the German Confederation. It was also a way of preventing Berlin from securing major unilateral gains, such as the annexation of Schleswig, at Denmark's and Austria's expense. At the back of Reichberg's mind was another threatening prospect. Napoleon III, who had begun to warm to his role as Europe's troublemaker, had suggested to the Prussians that France would support the outright annexation of Schleswig-Holstein, along with the lesser states of northern Germany, to Prussia. It looked as if Paris was angling for another anti-Austrian war, with Prussia playing the role of Piedmont. Rechberg, who was kept fully informed by Bismarck of these initiatives, knew this was a war that the Austrian Empire could not afford to fight. Bismarck's agenda could scarcely have been more different. The Confederation, as such, played no role in his planning. His ultimate objective was to annex the duchies to Prussia. The Prussian chief of staff, Helmut von Moltke, may well have been the key influence here. Moltke was strongly opposed to the transformation of the duchies into an independent principality, on the grounds that the new entity might become a satellite of the Habsburgs and open up a hole in Prussia's northern seaward flank. As Bismarck knew, however, a unilateral annexation would have exposed Prussia to the threat of combined reprisals from Austria, the rest of the Confederation, and possibly one or more European powers. The extra troops would also come in handy, especially if, as Moltke warned, the Danes succeeded in exploiting their superiority at sea to evacuate their troops from the mainland. The agreement to work with Austria was thus a temporary device to limit risk and ensure that all options remained open. The Danish war came to an end on the 1st of August, 1864, when the Danes were forced to sue for peace. Three features of the conflict deserve emphasis. 
The first is that the Prussians did not outperform the Austrians militarily. One early mistake was to nominate the Prussian Field Marshal, Count Friedrich Heinrich Ernst von Wrangel, as overall commander of the Allied forces. The 80-year-old Wrangel was old for his years, and though popular with the conservatives at court, at best a mediocre general. All his combat experience had been acquired against civilian insurgents in the revolutions of 1848. While Wrangel lurched from blunder to blunder in Denmark, the Austrian units acquitted themselves with courage and skill. On the 2nd of February, 1864, one Austrian brigade charged and took the Danish positions at Uber Selk with such panache that old Wrangel rushed to embrace and kiss its commander on the cheeks, to the embarrassment of his Prussian colleagues. Four days later, the Austrian brigade Nostitz broke through heavily defended Danish fortifications at Ufersee, while a Prussian guards division on their flank looked on almost inert. These were frustrating setbacks for an army that had not experienced war for half a century, and desperately needed to prove its mettle, both to the international community and to a domestic population that had been following the political struggle of a military reform. A second striking feature of the conflict was the primacy of the political over the military leadership. The Danish war was the first Prussian armed conflict in which a civilian politician exercised control. Throughout the war, Bismarck ensured that the evolution of the conflict served the objectives of his diplomacy. He prevented the Prussian forces from pursuing the Danish army into Jutland during the early weeks of the war, so as to reassure the great powers that the joint campaign was not aimed at the territorial integrity of the Danish kingdom. There were slip-ups, to be sure. In mid-February, Wrangel sent an advanced detachment of guards north to the Jutland border, despite instructions to the contrary. But Bismarck persuaded the war minister to send a sharp reprimand to the elderly general, and Wrangel was relieved of his command at Bismarck's insistence in mid-May. It was Bismarck who oversaw Prussian communications with Vienna, ensuring that the terms of the alliance evolved to Prussia's advantage. And in April, it was Bismarck who insisted that the Prussian forces attack the Danish fortifications at Dupel in Schleswig, rather than mounting a protracted invasion of Denmark that might have dragged the other powers into the conflict. The decision to attack Dupel was controversial. The Danish positions there were heavily fortified and manned, and it was clear that a Prussian frontal attack would succeed only, if at all, with numerous casualties. Is it supposed to be a political necessity to take the bulwarks? asked Prince Friedrich Charles, a brother of the king, who had been placed in charge of the siege. It will cost a lot of men and money. I don't see the military necessity. The case for engineering a showdown at Dupel was indeed political, rather than military. A full-blown invasion of Denmark was undesirable for diplomatic reasons, and the Prussians sorely needed a spectacular victory. There was much grumbling among the commanders, but Bismarck's will prevailed and the deed was done. On the 2nd of April, the Prussians began a heavy bombardment of the defence works, using their new rifled field guns. On the 18th of April, the infantry went in under the command of Friedrich Charles. It was no easy fight. The Danes offered fierce resistance from behind their battered defences, and subjected the Prussians to heavy fire as they climbed the slopes before the entrenchments. Over 1,000 Prussians were killed or wounded. The Danes suffered 1,700 casualties. Bismarck's dominance throughout the conflict generated considerable tension and ill feeling. When the commanders protested, Bismarck was quick to remind them that the army had no business interfering in the conduct of politics itself an extraordinary declaration in the Prussian setting, and one which reveals how things had changed since the revolution of 1848. The army, however, had no intention of accepting this verdict, as War Minister Albrecht von Roon made clear in a memorandum of the 29th of May, 1864. There has been, and is now hardly any army, that regarded itself and understood itself to be purely a political instrument, a lancet for the diplomatic surgeon. When a government depends, and this is our situation, particularly upon the armed part of the population, the army's views on what the government does and does not do are surely not a matter of indifference. In the exhilaration of victory, these altercations were quickly forgotten, but the issue underlying them would later resurface in more acrimonious and menacing forms. Bismarck's assertion of control over virtually every branch of the executive, papered over but did not solve, the structural problem of civil-military relations at the apex of the Prussian state.
1848 revolutions had parliamentarized the monarchy without demoralizing it. At the heart of the post-revolutionary settlement lay an avoided decision that would haunt Prussian and German politics until the collapse of the Hohenzollern monarchy in 1918. Prussia's victories in Denmark, Dupel was followed at the end of June by a successful amphibious assault on the island of Alsen, also transformed the domestic political landscape. The resulting wave of patriotic enthusiasm opened up latent divisions within the Prussian liberal movement. The arnhem boitzen bork petition of May 1864, which called for the annexation of the duchies, attracted 70,000 signatures, not only from conservatives, but from many liberals as well. Prussian military successes also had an unsettling effect more generally, since they seemed to demonstrate the effectiveness of the reform program so bitterly opposed by the liberals. There was a growing desire for a settlement with the government, reinforced by the fear that if the conflict dragged on, the liberal movement would forfeit its purchase on public opinion. During 1864 and 1865, Bismarck and his ministers played skillfully with the parliament, confronting it with bills that divided the liberal majority or forcing it into unpopular positions. In the Naval Construction Bill of 1865, for example, the government asked Parliament to approve the building of two armed frigates and a naval base in Kiel, at a cost of just under 20 million thalers. The creation of a German navy was a fetish to the liberal nationalist movement, especially in the aftermath of the Danish War, where naval operations had played a prominent role. The overwhelming majority of the deputies strongly supported the proposed expenditures, but they were forced, nevertheless, to reject the bill on the grounds that, in the absence of a legal budget, no new funds could be approved by Parliament. Bismarck seized his opportunity to deliver a tirade against the impotently negative attitude of the Chamber. The Minister-President could afford to gamble in this way because the coffers of the Prussian government were full to overflowing. During the 1850s and 1860s, the Prussian economy experienced the transforming effects of the First World Boom. Rapid growth in the railway network and in associated enterprises such as steel smelting and machine building was supported by a phenomenal expansion in the extraction of fossil fuels. During the 1860s, the coal mines of the Ruhr district in the Prussian Rhineland grew at an average rate of 170% per annum, bringing economic and social change at a pace unparalleled in the history of the region. This growth was sustained by the convergence of change on many different levels. Quality gains at every stage of production, savings through improvements to transport infrastructure, a highly liquid capital market, supported by the gold rushes in Australia and California, a favourable balance of trade and, as we have seen, the withdrawal of the Prussian government from various forms of regulation that had previously obstructed growth. Although the boom slowed somewhat during the First World Slump of 1857-8, the 1860s saw a return to robust expansion, though on a broader sectoral basis than had been the case for the previous decade. By contrast with the 1850s, when growth was largely driven from within the heavy industrial sector, the 1860s witnessed more coordinated expansion across heavy industry, textiles and agriculture. This was sustained by steadily growing investment through banks and in joint stock companies that yielded increasingly high rates of return. The combination of this prolonged boom with the fiscal and financial improvements of the 1850s and the expansion of production in the state-owned mines had a predictable effect on government revenues. In March 1865, Bismarck boasted to a confidant that the Danish war had largely been financed out of budget surpluses for the previous two years. Only two million thalers had had to be sourced from the state treasury. Nor did it seem likely that the money would run out in the near future. Obliging entrepreneurs such as the Colonia banker Abraham Oppenheimer and his Berlin colleague Gerson Bleichruder besieged the minister-president with lucrative offers to privatize government enterprises or buy out the state-owned shares of semi-public companies. The financiers are pressing loans on us without parliamentary approval, Bismarck declared, but we could wage the Danish war twice over without needing one. Prussia's War Against Germany On the 1st of August, 1864, King Christian of Denmark ceded all rights to the duchies to Prussia and Austria, and they passed under a joint Austro-Prussian military occupation, pending a decision concerning their future by the German Confederation. 
All of this looked rather like the inauguration of an era of harmonious dual hegemony, based on cooperation between the two German major powers. This was certainly what the Austrians were after, and Bismarck did his best to encourage their hopes. In an instruction of August 1864 to the Prussian ambassador in Vienna, he offered the ingratiating observation that a true German policy is only possible when Austria and Prussia are united and take the lead. From this high standpoint, an intimate alliance of the two powers has been our aim from the outset. If Prussia and Austria are not united, politically, Germany does not exist. This was no more than eyewash. Bismarck's objective was still to annex both duchies to Prussia and neutralize Austrian political influence in Germany. He planned to do so, if necessary, by war. Already in 1863, he had suggested to the Russians that Prussia might soon mount a surprise attack on the Austrian Empire as under Friedrich II in 1756. His tactic was to keep all options open by eking out the joint occupation while at the same time picking fights with the Austrians at every possible opportunity. In the diplomatic struggle that ensued over the future of Schleswig-Holstein, the Austrians were at a geopolitical disadvantage. The duchies were extremely remote from Vienna, and Austria's interest in maintaining a troop presence there was correspondingly lukewarm. In the autumn of 1864, the Austrians offered Berlin a choice between two courses of action. The Prussians could either a. recognize the duchies as a separate state under the Augustenburg dynasty, or b. annex them to Prussia and compensate Austria with land along the Silesian border. Bismarck rejected both options, declaring that Silesia was not negotiable, and adding rather mysteriously that Berlin had special rights in both duchies. This was followed up in February 1865 by a provocative declaration to the effect that Prussia intended to regard any form of independent Schleswig-Holstein as a Prussian satellite. In the meanwhile, the Prussians and the Duchies continued to extend their control, prompting furious complaints from the Austrians, who responded by taking the matter to the Confederal Diet and putting the Augustenburg succession back on the table. By the summer, it looked as if war was imminent. The crisis was deferred when Francis Joseph sent an ambassador to negotiate a new agreement with King William. The result was the Convention of Gastein, signed on the 14th of August, 1865. Based on a proposal by Bismarck, the Convention maintained joint Austro-Prussian sovereignty in the duchies, while placing Schleswig under Prussian and Holstein under Austrian control. But Gastein was no more than an interim arrangement conceived by Bismarck as a means of gaining time. The Prussian provocations in Holstein continued, and in January 1866, Berlin seized on a pro-Augustenburg nationalist meeting in Holstein to accuse Vienna directly of breaking with the terms of the treaty. On the 28th of February, a Crown Council in Berlin resolved that war between the two German powers was inevitable. The assembled generals, ministers and senior diplomats agreed that Austria had failed to honour the Gastein Convention and continued to treat Prussia as a rival and an enemy. There was general assent when Bismarck pointed out that Prussia's mission was to lead Germany, and that this very natural and justified ambition had been unjustly blocked by Austria. The Crown Prince was alone in pleading for a non-military resolution. Bismarck's next step was to seek an alliance with Italy. Negotiations began soon after the Crown Council, and a treaty against Austria was signed on the 8th of April. 1866. The two states were now committed to assist each other in the event of a war breaking out with Austria over the following three months. Bismarck also revived the time-honoured Prussian tradition of the Hungarian Fifth Column, deployed by Friedrich the Great during the Seven Years' War, and again in the 1790s by Friedrich William II. But his contacts with the Hungarian revolutionary movement produced nothing of any consequence. At the Crown Council of the 28th of February, Bismarck had announced as well that he intended to seek more definite guarantees from France, and feelers were duly extended to Paris. These produced a chain of vague proposals and counter-proposals. Exactly what assurances Bismarck gave to Napoleon has been hotly disputed, but it seems likely that French neutrality was bought with a promise of compensations in Belgium, Luxembourg, and possibly in the region between the Rhine and the Moselle, encompassing the Prussian Tsarland and the Bavarian Palatinate. Since the Austrians secretly purchased French neutrality on very similar terms, 
including a French satellite state in the Rhineland. Napoleon III had every reason to be confident that France would end up as a beneficiary of the Prusso-Austrian conflict, whoever emerged as the victor. Russia was the third power whose attitude was crucial to the success of Prussian designs. Russia had blocked the Unionist designs of Friedrich William IV and Radovitz in 1848-50, while helping to restore Austria's fortunes. By 1866, however, things had changed. Russia was locked into a process of fundamental domestic political reform. Relations with Austria were still core. Cool. Russian strategic planning foresaw Austria and Britain, not Prussia, as the most likely opponents in a future war. The post-Crimean estrangement between the two eastern empires had already yielded dividends for Cavour in 1859. This lesson was not lost on Bismarck, who had just left his post at Frankfurt and happened to be stationed at the Prussian embassy in St. Petersburg when the Italian crisis broke. Bismarck had cultivated relations with Russia with great care since coming to office as minister-president, and there seemed little reason to fear intervention from this quarter. These diplomatic preparations were flanked with other measures intended to disorient the German liberal camp and unsettle public confidence in the German Confederation. On the 9th of April, Bismarck sprang a proposal on the Diet calling for the creation of a German national parliament to be elected by direct universal male suffrage. The confederal representatives were still mulling over this unexpected initiative when news of troop movements in Italy triggered a partial Austrian mobilization on the 21st of April. Now began a chain of troop deployments and countermeasures that culminated in a full-scale mobilization on both sides. As the two German great powers prepared for war, it became clear that most of the lesser states of the Confederation supported Austria. On the 9th of May, a majority of representatives to the Diet voted in favour of a resolution demanding that Prussia explain its mobilisation. At the end of the month, the Austrians formally passed responsibility for the duchies to the Confederation. During the first week of June, Prussian troops entered Holstein, encountering no resistance from the Austrians, who withdrew into Hanover. On the 11th of June, the Austrian ambassador to the Diet denounced the Prussian occupation of Holstein as illegal and in breach of the terms of the Convention of Gastein, and proposed a resolution calling for the mobilization of the Confederation against Prussia. On the 14th of June, at the last plenary meeting of the Diet in Frankfurt, this resolution was passed by majority vote, and the Prussian ambassador walked out, declaring that his government regarded the Confederation as dissolved. Five days later, the Italians declared war on Austria. With Russian and French neutrality virtually assured, Prussia went to war with Austria in the summer of 1866, under an auspicious great power constellation. Yet the outcome was by no means a foregone conclusion. Most well-informed contemporaries, including Emperor Napoleon III, who had actually fought the Austrians in 1859, predicted an Austrian victory. The combat performance of the two armies in the Danish war had done nothing to dispel this view. It is true that Prussians had embarked on a program of military reforms after 1859, but these were not as revolutionary as has often been claimed. In any case, Austria too had responded to the disasters of 1859 with its own reform program. Its artillery was sophisticated and deployed by well-trained battery teams. It was true that Prussia enjoyed a slight superiority in numbers in the Bohemian theatre of operations, where the war would be decided. 254,000 Prussians faced the 245,000 troops of Austria's North Army. The situation would have been very different, of course, had the Italians not committed over 200,000 men to their offensive in Venezia, forcing the Austrians to divert an extra 100,000 troops to the southwestern front. Austria also enjoyed an important strategic advantage. In the diplomatic contest of 1866, most of the middling German states opted to side with Vienna against Berlin. The Prussians were thus obliged to mobilize not only against the Austrians, but also against the other German combatant states, including, most importantly, Hanover and Saxony. In all, the Confederal armies of 1866 mustered some 150,000 men, dispersed among a number of separate armies. This meant in turn that Prussia's chief of the general staff, Helmut von Moltke, had to break the Prussian army into four blocks small enough to be transported quickly by Prussia's widely separated rail lines to the Austrian, Saxon 
and Hanoverian frontiers. Austria, by contrast, could operate on a much more concentrated terrain and had the advantage of interior lines. Why, then, did the Prussians win? Bismarck's famous invocation of blood and iron has often been seen as a reference to the role of industry in consolidating Prussian power. Prussia, or at least parts of Prussia, had certainly experienced a dramatic growth in their industrial capacity during the later 1850s and 1860s, but this played a lesser role in Prussia's victory over Austria than we might suppose. The figures we would need to make direct comparisons are not available, but there is little to indicate that a major qualitative gap separated the economies of the two antagonists in 1866. In some respects, indeed, the Prussian economy appears to have been more backward than the Austrian. A larger proportion of Prussians than Austrians worked in agriculture, for example. Of the various weapons that played a role in 1866, the ones requiring the most sophisticated manufacturing processes were the field guns of the artillery. And here it was the Austrians, with their accurate rifled cannon, who clearly had the advantage. In any case, this was not a war that pitted industrial economies against each other. It was a short, sharp fight, in which both sides managed to get by on pre-stocked weaponry and munitions. It is true that Moltke attached great importance to the use of railways, but in the event his elaborate planning nearly brought disaster upon the Prussians, whose supply trains caught up with their armies only when the Battle of Königgrätz had already been won. In the meantime, the Prussian armies lived off the land or paid their way, much as the armies of Friedrich the Great had done. Industrial power thus mattered less than politics and military culture. Although the army of the German Confederation disposed of some 150,000 men, these were hardly a formidable fighting force. They did not properly constitute an army, since they had never trained together and did not possess a unified command structure. Here was the consequence of a half-century of particularism within the Confederation. Moreover, the armies of the middling states were unwilling to take the initiative against Prussia, appealing to the stipulations of the confederal constitution, which forbade the German states to settle their differences by force. They preferred to wait until Prussia had openly breached the peace. Bavaria, for example, which controlled the largest single contingent, the 65,000 men of the 7th Federal Corps, informed Vienna early in June 1866 that the Austrians could rely on Bavarian support only if the Prussians actually invaded a fellow German state. They were thus unwilling to contemplate pre-emptive action of any kind. Many of the other individual federal corps were hamstrung by internal political divisions that made swift and concerted action virtually impossible. In the case of the 8th Federal Corps, for example, comprising troops from Württemberg, Baden and Hesse-Darmstadt, the commander, Prince Alexander of Hesse, was an Austrophile who favoured intervention on behalf of Austria, but the staff chief was a more cautious Württemberger. His orders from his sovereign were to slow the prince's deployment to a crawl and to do what he could to prevent movements east, so that the troops would be available if necessary to defend the frontiers of Württemberg itself. In the face of the Prussian offensive, the Hanoverian army withdrew south in the forlorn hope that the Bavarians or the Austrians might march north to join them. After a small victory against a numerically inferior force at Langenzalsa, they were pushed out of their defensive positions by Prussian reinforcements, compelled to surrender on the 29th of June, and provided with free train tickets home. News of the Hanoverian defeat further reinforced the determination of the South German states to sit tight and guard their frontiers. The only truly effective contribution came from the Saxons, who abandoned their home territory to fight alongside the Austrian North Army in Bohemia. The chief author of the Prussian victory of 1866 was the chief of the general staff, Helmut von Moltke. In Bohemia, to a much greater extent than in Denmark, Moltke was able to unfold an innovative strategic conception. His approach to the Austrian war was to break the Prussian forces up into groups small enough to be moved at the highest possible speed to the point of attack. The objective was to mesh the converging units wing to wing only at the last minute in order to deliver the decisive blow in battle. The advantage of this approach was that it reduced the logistical strain on narrow country roads and one-track railways, and thus saved on tailbacks and traffic jams. The increased speed and maneuverability of the forces in the field raised the likelihood that the Prussians, rather than their enemies, would be able to determine the timing and the setting of the decisive engagement. 
It was a conception of mobilization that required sophisticated use of the most modern infrastructural resources, of railways and roads in particular, and of telegraph, since the separate armies would be out of immediate contact with each other and would need to be rigorously coordinated from headquarters. The chief potential drawback of this approach was that it could, as we have seen, so easily go wrong. If the armies were forced off course or failed to keep pace with each other, there was the risk that the enemy might attack them individually with a superior force. Complementing this aggressive strategic approach was a set of measures designed to make the Prussian infantrymen the best in Europe. In the mid-1860s, Prussia was the only European great power to be armed with a breech-loading rifle, the Dreiser Zungewehr, or needle gun. This was essentially a rifle of the modern type, in which a cartridge consisting of a projectile mounted on a small cylindrical case of explosive charge was loaded into a metal chamber and detonated by a blow from a hammer, known as the needle on account of its elongated shape. The needle gun had one crucial advantage over the traditional muzzle-loading weapons, still used by most European armies. It could be reloaded and fired between three and five times as fast. A man lying behind a tusk of grass or standing behind a tree could reload, aim and fire his needle gun without emerging from cover. There was no need to drop powder, wadding and shot down the barrel of the weapon. This allowed for a much more flexible and lethal application of infantry firepower at close quarters than had previously been possible. There was nothing particularly mysterious about the needle gun. The technology was widely known. Yet most military establishments chose not to introduce it as the general weapon of infantry warfare. There were good reasons for this. The early needle gun prototypes were notoriously unreliable. The gas seals were sometimes faulty, so that the chamber exploded or emitted a searing spray of burning powder, not a feature that inspired enthusiasm in the average rifleman. Many soldiers trained with early generation needle guns found that the bolt action was prone to get stiff and sometimes had to be hammered open with a rock. There was also a tendency to jam during frequent fire. Another concern was that men provided with this sophisticated instrument would fire too fast, squander their costly ammunition, and then toss away the now useless gun and leave the field. By contrast, it was argued, the old muzzle loaders, with their slow rate of fire, imposed a degree of discipline on the infantry lines. Perhaps the most important reason for rejecting the needle gun was simply the widespread contemporary preference for what were known as shock tactics. These were based on the notion a kind of orthodoxy among the military thinkers of mid-19th century Europe, that infantry firepower was ultimately of secondary importance in any serious military confrontation. It was the artillery that should focus on high accuracy, high impact fire. What counted in the front line was the ability to unseat the enemy from a coveted position, and this was best achieved by swift charges of massed infantry with mounted bayonets. The Prussians overcame most of the practical objections to the new weapon by rigorously testing and modifying the Dreiser prototype, with the result that its specifications steadily improved over successive batches, while the costs of production and ammunition fell. At the same time, policies were set in place to improve the technical mastery and fire discipline of the men who used the weapon. Between 1862 and 1864, while the Austrians cut their annual expenditure on target practice, relying instead on shock tactics, the Prussians introduced an extensive regime of marksmanship. Infantrymen were trained to use their weapons at all ranges, educated about how to use their sights to compensate for the arc of a bullet, and required to keep a record of their successes or failure in a shooting log. Here, the military command could reap the rewards of Prussia's exemplary education system. Without the kingdom's exceptionally high rates of literacy and numeracy, a regime of this kind would have been impossible. All of this implied the cession of a much greater level of autonomy and self-governance to the rank-and-file soldier than was the norm in Europe's mid-century armies. The new Prussian infantry were, in theory at least, professionals, not cattle to be herded in the direction of the enemy by their officers. The Prussian army's ability to achieve technical innovation over a range of separate but interdependent domains owed much to the general staff which specialized in integrating weapons research with the evolution of strategy and tactical doctrine. The result of these changes was a growing complementarity between Prussian and Austrian practices in the field. While the Austrians focused on refining their shock tactics, especially after the disasters in 1859, 
the Prussians focused on fire tactics centered on the needle gun. Moltke was able to combine flexibility and speed in the offensive strategic deployment of large units with the controlled and defensive tactical deployment of infantry units on the battlefield. By contrast, the Austrians tended to be strategically defensive and tactically offensive. None of this made a Prussian victory inevitable. There was little reason, without hindsight, to suppose that fire would win the day over shock. The Austrians used shock tactics with great success against the Italians, at Custoza on the 24th of June, 1866, and the Prussians themselves had used them with effect against the Danes entrenched at Dupel. It also made sense from the Austrian standpoint to adopt a defensive strategy policy on the assumption that the attacking Prussians, with their separate armies and extended supply lines, would at some point expose themselves to a crippling Austrian strike. Nor was it obvious that the needle gun would prove a decisive advantage. After all, the 1854 model muzzle loader used by the majority of Austrian infantrymen was a more accurate weapon with a longer range. In the event, however, the war in Bohemia showed that the advantages of speed outweighed those of range, and that waves of infantrymen charging with bayonets mounted stood little chance against the shredding fire of well-placed infantry armed with breech loaders. On the 28th of June, the Austrians were subjected to a painful early demonstration of the potency of fire tactics. When General Klan Galas, commander of the Austrian I Corps, engaged two companies of Prussian riflemen on a bridge across the river Isa at the little town of Pudol. The men of one corps initially cleared the town with little difficulty. When Prussian reinforcements moved up, the Austrians launched a bayonet charge to repel them. But instead of running away, the Prussians stopped in their tracks, deployed their forward platoons, and began firing rapidly into the mass of approaching Austrians. The shooting continued for 30 minutes. After the momentum of the Austrian attack had been broken, the Prussians combed through the town street by street, keeping touch by their rifle flashes as dusk turned to night. Of the 3,000 Austrians engaged in the Battle for Padol, nearly 500 were shot. Prussian casualties were about 130. By two o'clock in the morning, the Austrians had had enough and withdrew. On the previous day, an encounter between units of the Prussian 2nd Army and the Austrian 6th Corps on the Nachod Plateau in Bohemia had produced similarly unbalanced casualty figures. 1,200 Prussians against 5,700 Austrians. In this bloody engagement, over one-fifth of the Austrians committed were either killed or wounded. Even in situations where the Austrians prevailed, as at Trautenau, where the Prussians were caught on the back foot and forced to withdraw out of Bohemia into the mountains, the scything fire of the needle guns took 4,800 Austrian casualties to 1,300 Prussian. The victory of the Prussian armies cannot, of course, be ascribed solely to the needle gun. Although it is difficult to gauge exactly the impact of such factors, there is evidence that the Austrians suffered from lower morale by comparison with their Prussian adversaries. Poles, Ukrainians, Romanians, and Venetians figured prominently among those who deserted or were captured and wounded by the Prussians, suggesting that motivation among the non-German, though not the Hungarian, troops was lower than among Austrians proper. Italian subjects of the Habsburg crown obviously had little reason to relish a war that was also being fought against their countrymen. One Prussian officer participating in the skirmish at Unerwasser on the 26th of June, 1866, was surprised to come across three Venetian infantrymen sitting out the firefight in the tall corn around the village. At the sight of the approaching Prussian, they reportedly dropped their rifles, covered his hands in kisses, and begged for mercy. There were also problems of communication. In many Austrian units, officers and men spoke different languages. Recalling the Battle of Munchengretz, the staff chief of the Austrian I Corps reported of the mixed Polish and Ukrainian 30 Regiment that it had fought bravely until dusk, when the men were no longer able to see the officers miming examples of what was needed. By contrast, the Polish recruits to the Prussian army proved willing and reliable soldiers. The Austrian command culture was a further factor in the defeat. While there were certainly misunderstandings, failures of communication and episodes of disobedience by Prussian subordinate commanders, the Austrians suffered from a systematic crossing of lines of command, so that the movement of armies was frequently dogged by inconsistent or conflicting orders. 
there was a tendency to lose time in debating the merits of instructions from above, and officers lacked a clear sense of the immediate and longer-term objectives of a given engagement. Supply trains failed to arrive, so that troops retired from protracted actions without food or drink. The Austrians also failed to maintain a staff organization with the power and cohesion of the Prussian general staff. By the beginning of July, the staff of the North Army in Bohemia had degenerated into a loose gathering of couriers and order drafters. Finally, the Austrian field commander, General Ludwig Benedek, made a number of serious errors, the most disastrous being the deployment of Austrian troops at the beginning of July around the fortress of Kunigretz in a position where they could be pinned down by the Prussians with the river Elbe cutting them off at the back. It was here that the decisive battle took place on the 3rd of July, 1866. For 17 hours, nearly half a million armed men contested a front between the river fort of Kunigretz and the bohemian town of Sarva. This immense engagement was no triumph of military planning. Benedek had not originally intended to give battle at Kunigretz, he had been trapped there on his way to Olmutz, and initially hoped that the Emperor would let him off the hook by entering into peace negotiations with the Prussians. As for the Prussians, as late as the 30th of June, their two separated main armies were still finding it difficult to stay in touch, and there was confusion among the Prussian commanders about the precise location of the Austrian North Army. When battle opened on the 3rd of July, it was partly by accident. Prince Friedrich Charles, commander of the Prussian First Army, had encountered an Austrian force on the previous evening, became convinced that Benedek had decided to stand and fight, and launched an attack in the small hours of the morning, without consulting his commander-in-chief. The odds were still with the Austrians, who held the high ground, were well entrenched, and enjoyed a decisive advantage in heavy artillery. Yet it was the Prussians who won the day. After the Prussian First Army had engaged the Austrians for most of the morning, the Second Army, under the command of Crown Prince Friedrich, moved up to attack the Austrian flank. As the noose tightened around the Austrians' position, Benedek failed to take full advantage of openings in the enemy line. He also made the error of committing 43 battalions to a desperate fight in the Sweetbild, a patch of dense wood on the Prussian left flank, where infantrymen used needle guns to cut down wave after wave of Austrian troops. By the end of the afternoon, the Austrians had been forced to withdraw. The Prussian victory was comprehensive. Over 40,000 men of the North Army had been killed or wounded. There remained not a single combat-effective Austrian infantry brigade on the field. On the 22nd of July, 1866, Emperor Franz Josef capitulated to the Prussians. The Austro-Prussian War was over. Just seven weeks after it had begun, the Austrian Emperor was spared any annexations, but had to agree to the dissolution of the German Confederation and the creation of a new Prussian-dominated North German Confederation to the north of the River Main. Prussia secured carte blanche to exact annexations as it pleased in the north, with the exception of the Austrians' faithful ally, the Kingdom of Saxony. Schleswig and Holstein were annexed, along with parts of Hesse-Darmstadt and the entirety of Hanover, Hesse Castle, Nassau, and the city of Frankfurt. The unfortunate burghers of Frankfurt the scene of Prussia's diplomatic humiliation on the eve of the Austrian war, was subjected to a punitive indemnity of 25 million guilders. Bismarck had prevailed over his German enemies. He prevailed over his Prussian enemies too. At the end of February 1866, the Prussian liberals had formed a solid oppositional bloc, welded together by the tyrannical and provocative behavior of the Bismarck administration. By contrast with Austria, where there was considerable enthusiasm for the war, Prussian public opinion was overwhelmingly hostile. An anti-war rally held in the industrial city of Zollingen in the Rhineland on the 25th of March inaugurated a wave of oppositional meetings across the monarchy. There was a flood of petitions and anti-war manifestos. It looked very much as if the liberals had succeeded in mobilizing a genuine mass movement. The news of Prussia's mobilization and victory transformed the situation utterly. The Prussian occupation of Hanover Dresden and Kassel, were greeted with a wave of jubilation. Cheering crowds mobbed Bismarck whenever he appeared in public. The political consequences made themselves felt in the first round of the land tag elections on the 25th of June, when voting for the Electoral College revealed a sharp turn towards the Conservatives. On the 3rd of July, 
as Prussian troops charged the Austrian positions near Kunigrets. The second round of voting returned a chamber with 142 conservative mandates, as opposed to 28 in the previous chamber. Bismarck had foreseen this. At the moment of decision, he told Count von der Goltz, the Prussian ambassador in Paris, the masses will stand by the monarchy. The news of the victory at Kunigretz and the subsequent capitulation left the old liberal parliamentary bloc in an impossible position. They could no longer dispute the legitimacy of the military reforms. An Austrian indemnity of 40 million florins restored the government's liquidity and underscored its independence from the parliament. Moreover, many of the leading figures in the liberal camp were themselves profoundly moved by the scope of Prussia's success. A characteristic example was Gustav Mieversen, the former revolutionary minister of 1848, who watched the victory parade down Unter den Linden in a state of near intoxication. I cannot shake off the impression of this hour. I am no devotee of Mars. I feel more attached to the goddess of beauty and the mother of graces than to the mighty god of war. But the trophies of war exercise a magic charm upon the child of peace. One's eyes are involuntarily riveted on the unending rows of men who acclaim the god of the moment, success. Another such case was the industrialist Werner Siemens, for whom the news of the victory over Austria was a transformative moment. Within the space of a few months, he broke with his left liberal friends and campaigned for a reconciliation with Bismarck, before withdrawing entirely from politics in order to focus on building his firms. To many liberals, it seemed obvious that the events of 1866 had created an entirely new point of departure. The defeat of neo-absolutist Austria and the implicit defeat of Catholicism as a force in German affairs appeared in the eyes of many to be an intrinsically liberal achievement. Bismarck's promise of a closer national union on a constitutional basis spoke to deeply ingrained liberal aspirations. The liberals saw national unity on the terms proposed by Bismarck as the basis for a more rational political order that would open the door to further political and constitutional progress. Underlying this sanguine vision was a belief in the essentially progressive character of the Prussian state, which in turn legitimated Prussia's dominant role in the new Germany. There was common ground here with elements of the military leadership. Moltke, too, a sometimes student of Hegel, viewed Prussia as the model for a progressive, prejudice-free, rational state, to which political leadership must necessarily fall, because it stood at the forefront of historical development. This consensus about the fundamentally progressive and virtuous quality of the state, whatever the designs of the current government, played a crucial role in healing the breach created by the constitutional crisis. Bismarck recognized that the time had come to knit the Prussian political system back together. Liberalism was too important and potentially fruitful a political force to be marginalized forever. In conceding this, Bismarck revealed himself a true executor of the post-revolutionary settlement of the 1850s. There was, much to the chagrin of the backwoods conservatives who wishfully claimed Bismarck as one of their own, no coup against the constitution. An indemnity bill was offered to the parliament. This amounted to an open acknowledgement that the government had acted illegally during the crisis years. It also provided a means of reaffirming the authority of parliament and getting the boat of the constitution back onto an even keel. These and other shrewdly devised concessions sufficed to dissolve the already fragile unity of the liberal opposition. There was a growing stream of defections from the ranks of parliamentary progressives still holding out against Bismarck. Defectors such as Karl Tvesten, he who had been shot in the arm only four years before by the chief of the military cabinet, were warmly welcomed by Bismarck, who disarmed any residual doubters by drawing them respectfully into consultations over further concessions to the liberal interest. Under pressure of this accommodation between Bismarck and the moderate opposition, the liberal front that had coalesced during the constitutional crisis finally came undone. A cleavage opened between those national liberals who saw in national unity the promise of a more rational political order, and those progressives who focused instead on the issues of liberty and parliamentary powers that had been at the heart of the constitutional conflict. Interestingly enough, new Prussians soon came to dominate the nascent national liberal movement. Its two most distinguished leaders, Rudolf von Benningsen and Johannes Michel, were both Hanoverians elected after the annexations of 1866. 
Many of the old Prussian liberals found it hard to shake off the antipathies of the crisis years. A complementary rift opened up within the conservative ranks. Many of the conservatives had been hoping that the victory over Austria would usher in a final reckoning with a parliamentary constitutional system, and they were bitterly disappointed by Bismarck's decision to propose an indemnity bill. The result was a schism between those free conservatives who were willing to support the adventurous minister-president and those old conservatives who deeply resented any attempt to conciliate the liberals through political concessions. At the centre of the political spectrum, there now emerged that hybrid block of moderate liberals and flexible Bismarckian conservatives, who would play a crucial role in providing a stable platform for government in the Prussian parliament and the new Reichstag of the North German Confederation. This was not just a consequence of Bismarck's statementship, it was a return to the post-revolutionary political settlement of the 1850s. It was the constitutional crisis that had forged the liberals into a unified bloc. Once the pressure eased, they fell apart into fundamentalist and realist wings. On the conservative side, too, the schism of 1866-7 ran along a well-established cleavage between those who had accepted the constitutional order of 1848-9 and those who had not. This was overlaid after Kunigretz by the divide between those, including a substantial contingent of pietist East Albion landowners, who remained attached to a specifically Prussian state identity, and those who were willing to embrace the broader cause of the German nation. With the victory of 1866, the long history of Prussia's contest with Austria for hegemony over the German states came to an end. A solid block of Prussian territory now stretched between France and Belgium in the west and the flatlands of Russian Lithuania in the east. Prussia encompassed over four-fifths of the population of the new North German Confederation, a federal entity comprising the 23 northern states and centred on Berlin. The southern states of Hesse-Darmstadt, Baden, Württemberg and Bavaria escaped annexation, but were made to sign alliances that placed them within Prussia's sphere of influence. The North German Confederation may have looked a little like a continuation of the old Deutsche Bund, whose diet had obligingly voted itself out of existence on the 28th of July in the dining room of the Three Moors Hotel in Augsburg. But in reality, the name was little more than a fig leaf for Prussian dominance. Prussia exercised exclusive control over military and foreign affairs. In this sense, the North German Confederation was, as King William himself put it, the extended arm of Prussia. At the same time, however, the new confederation bestowed a certain semi-democratic legitimacy upon the power political settlement of 1866. In constitutional terms, it was an experimental entity without precedent in Prussian or German history. It had a parliament representing the male populations of all the member states, whose deputies were elected on the basis of the Reich electoral law, drawn up by the revolutionaries in 1849. No attempt was made to impose the Prussian three-class franchise. Instead, all members of the age of 25 years and over acquired the right to a free, equal and secret ballot. The North German Confederation was thus one of the late fruits of the post-revolutionary synthesis. It blended elements of the old politics of princely cabinets with the new and unpredictable logic of national parliamentary representation. War with France as early as August 1866, Bismarck confided to a close associate of the Grand Duke of Baden that he believed a union between the north and south of Germany was only a matter of time. Yet in many respects, the conditions for such a union remained inauspicious after the Austrian War. France, which stood to lose most from a further extension of Prussian influence, would obviously oppose it. The Austrians still hoped to overturn the verdict of 1866. The new Austrian foreign minister, Friedrich Ferdinand von Beust was a Prussophobe Saxon who hoped that the German southern states might serve, in collusion perhaps with France, as a lever to unsettle Prussian hegemony. In the southern German states, and especially in Württemberg and Bavaria, public opinion was still vehemently opposed to a closer union. There was outrage in March 1867 when it was revealed that the South German governments had signed away their autonomy after the Austrian war, in eternal offensive-defensive treaties with the North German Confederation. In Bavaria and Württemberg, the parliamentary elections of 1869 produced anti-liberal majorities opposed to a small German union. 
In Bavaria, in particular, the Catholic clergy agitated from the pulpits against a closer union with the Prussian-dominated North German Confederation, circulating petitions that attracted hundreds of thousands of signatures. An anti-Prussian front began to crystallize, composed of particularist patriots, pro-Austrian Catholics, and southern German Democrats. Political Catholicism emerged as a formidable domestic obstacle to Unionist objectives. Anti-Unionist agitation depicted Prussia as anti-Catholic, authoritarian, repressive, militaristic, and a threat to southern economic interests. Bismarck remained flexible, as always, on the question of how and when German unification would be achieved. He soon abandoned his early hope that it would come about through a process of peaceful coalescence. For a time, he took an interest in plans to create a southern confederation, Zudbund, linking Baden, Württemberg, and Bavaria. But mutual distrust among the southern states, especially of Bavaria, made such an agreement impossible. Then there was a plan to integrate the southern states gradually through a creation of a customs parliament, Zoll Parliament, to which members of the Zoll Verein outside the North German Confederation would be entitled to send deputies. But the South German elections for this body in March 1868 merely revealed the depth of opposition to closer union. The notion that unification might be expediated by a security threat from France was another theme in Bismarck's thinking. In the summer of 1866, he'd observed that, in the event of war with France, the barrier of the river Main would be broken and the whole of Germany would be drawn into the struggle. This comment referred specifically to contemporary apprehensions that France might decide to use force to reverse Prussia's gains after Kunigratz. But it was also in line with Prussian policy since the 1820s, which had always tended to see French security threats as facilitating Prussian designs. There was certainly abundant potential for friction between the two powerful neighbours. Emperor Napoleon III was shocked at the scale of Prussia's success in 1866 and convinced that it posed a threat to French interests. He also resented the fact that France had received no compensation in the traditional manner, despite the generous, if vague, undertakings given by Bismarck before the war. In the spring of 1867, Bismarck exploited these tensions in the set-piece known as the Luxembourg Crisis. Having covertly encouraged Napoleon III to satisfy his expectations through the annexation of Luxembourg, Bismarck first leaked news of the Emperor's designs to the German press, knowing that these would prompt a wave of nationalist outrage, and then posed publicly as the German statesman bound by honour and conviction to execute the will of his people. The crisis was resolved by an international conference that guaranteed Luxembourg's status as an independent principality, but it could easily have led to a French declaration of war, as Bismarck himself was aware. Here again, Bismarck showed himself to be the master of mixed registers, who could blend covert manoeuvre and public posturing, high diplomacy and popular politics with consummate skill. A further opportunity to exploit friction with France arose over the question of the Hohenzollern candidacy for the Spanish throne. After the deposition of Queen Isabella in the Spanish Revolution of 1868, the new government in Madrid identified Prince Leopold of Hohenzollern Zygmaringen a Catholic South German relative of the Prussian reigning family who had a Portuguese wife as an appropriate figure to take her place. Bismarck recognised that this issue could be used to generate friction with France and became an ardent supporter of Prince Leopold's succession. Pressing the case for the prince was an uphill battle, since both William I and Leopold's father were at first strongly opposed. By the summer of 1870, however, he had managed, through patient persuasion and intriguing, to secure the consent of both men. In July, the news that the candidature had been formalised prompted a wave of nationalist outrage in France. In a bellicose speech to the French Parliament, the inexperienced new foreign minister, Antoine Agenor, Duc de Grammont, promised the French nation that Leopold would never be permitted to ascend the throne of Charles V. A reference to the 16th century, when the German dynasty of the Habsburgs had threatened to encircle France. The French ambassador to Berlin, Vincent de Benedetti, was dispatched to Bad Ems, where William I was on summer vacation, taking the waters, to sort the matter out with the Prussian king. 
Since William I responded in a conciliatory manner to Benedetti's representations, and eventually accepted that Leopold must renounce his claim to the Spanish throne, the matter might simply have ended there, with a diplomatic victory for Paris. But Grammont made a serious tactical error. Benedetti was sent back to the emperor to demand a further and more far-reaching assurance that the Prussian king would never again support the candidacy. Demanding that the Prussian monarch tie his hands in perpetuity was a step too far, and William responded with a polite refusal. When Bismarck received the king's telegram, immortalized as the M's telegram, summarizing the substance of the meeting with Benedetti, he saw immediately that an opportunity had arisen to slap down the French without surrendering the moral high ground. On the 13th of July, he released a lightly edited version of the text. A few words were removed, but none was added, in which the refusal was made to appear as a brusque rebuff and the ambassador as an impertinent petitioner. French translations of the edited version were also leaked to the press. The French government, enraged and anticipating an explosion of national outrage, responded with mobilization orders on the following day. Here, as in 1864 and 1867, was a political crisis made to measure for Bismarck, who understood better than anyone how to exploit the unstable relationship between dynastic mechanisms and the forces of mass nationalism. Yet Bismarck's skill and cunning, remarkable as they were, can also be deceptive. He was not in control of events. He had not planned the Hohenzollern candidacy. And although he pressed hard for it during the spring and summer of 1870, he was also prepared to step back when it looked as if the Prussian king had agreed to withdraw and was willing to accept a French diplomatic victory. Even to say that the French played into his hands partly misrepresents the situation, for France's readiness to risk war was not the outcome of Bismarck's actions as such, but expressed a principled refusal to countenance any diminution of its privileged place within the European international system. The French went to war in 1870 because they believed, reasonably enough, that they could win. It would thus be an exaggeration to say that Bismarck planned the war with France. Bismarck was not an exponent of preventive war. It was, as he once remarked, equivalent to shooting yourself in the head because you are afraid to die. On the other hand, war with France was certainly on his menu of political options, provided that the French took the initiative and acted first. Throughout the Luxembourg and Spanish crises, Bismarck operated in open-ended policy that incorporated the possibility of war but also served other objectives, such as accelerating the integration of the South German states and challenging French pretensions. Had the Ems dispatch merely generated friction and threats from Paris, this too would have served Bismarck's objectives, by reminding the South Germans that they would remain vulnerable until they entered into a union with the North. The news of mobilization and the subsequent French declaration of war set off a wave of patriotic emotion in Prussia, and the other German states. As he returned by train from Bad Ems, William I was mobbed at every station by cheering crowds. Even the South Germans were outraged by the bellicosity and arrogance of Grammont's speech to the French Parliament, and indignant over his insolent treatment of the Prussian king. The mood in the Foreign Office and the Ministry of War was one of confidence, and with good reason. Plans were already in place to coordinate military operations with the South German states, under the terms set out in their alliances with the North German Confederation. The diplomatic setting was also auspicious. Vienna was still struggling with the consequences of far-reaching domestic reforms, and was reluctant to risk any joint action. A draft treaty of 1869 thus remained unsigned. As for the Italians, they were unlikely to help Paris, while French troops continued to occupy what remained of the Papal States, thereby preventing the absorption of Rome and its hinterland into the Kingdom of Italy. Britain had already made its peace with the idea of a unified Germany, dominated by Prussia, and the Russians were easily won over by Bismarck's promise that Prussia would support St. Petersburg in revising the most burdensome stipulations of the Crimean peace settlement. There was thus little reason to fear that Russia would intervene in support of France. The window of opportunity created by the Crimean conflict was still open. In military terms, the Prussians were well placed, better indeed than most contemporaries were aware, to win. They had, at full force, a larger, fitter and more disciplined army than the French. They also outperformed them in tactics and infrastructure. As in the Austrian war, 
the superiority of Prussian military organization was crucial. By contrast with the Prussian German general staff, which reported directly to the king, the French general staff was a mere department of the Ministry of War. In matters of strategy, tactics, and discipline, it was always subject to political pressure from the left-leaning National Assembly. The Prussian general staff, its reputation sealed by the victory of 1866, had continued in the aftermath of the Bohemian War to introduce improvements to transport and supply, with the result that Prussia mobilized much more swiftly than her adversary, transporting over half a million men to the frontier with France, while the French army on the Rhine still numbered only 250,000. The antique smooth bore field guns that had performed so lamentably against the Austrian artillery in 1866 were phased out and replaced by rifled cannon incorporating the latest technology. Enormous effort was expended on improving the tactical deployment of artillery in support of infantry, an area where the Prussians had fallen down in 1866. None of this made a Prussian victory inevitable. For all the efforts of the general staff, the weaponry of the two sides was more closely matched in 1870 than in the previous conflict. The decisive advantage bestowed by the needle gun in Austria was cancelled out in 1870 by the excellent infantry rifle, known as the chasse of the French, not to mention the mitrailleurs, an early machine gun that sowed havoc wherever it came into action against Prussian troops. The Prussians were dogged by the usual misunderstandings and false steps. General Steinmetz once again distinguished himself with his blithe disregard of instructions from the general staff, and the August engagements at Spiekeren, Wiesenburg, and Fruschwiller were stumbled into rather than planned. Even Moltke made some serious errors, most notably at the outset of the campaign, when he rout marched more than 200,000 men across the French front, exposing his forces to a devastating flanking attack. Fortunately for the Prussians, the French commander, General Bazen failed to seize the opportunity. The Prussians also exploited their marginal superiority in artillery with increasing skill, using their field guns to draw French fire away from advancing Prussian infantry. Most importantly, perhaps, the Prussians made fewer mistakes than their opponents. At Maslatour, Bazen, commander of the French Army of the Rhine, failed to mount an offensive, transforming a potential French victory into a disaster that left the strategic strongpoint at Verdun exposed to a German advance. By early September 1870, barely six weeks into the war, the French had lost a series of decisive battles, and with them an irreplaceable reservoir of weaponry, officers, and experienced carders. After the crushing defeat and capitulation of the French forces under General Patrice de Macmau on the 1st and 2nd of September at Sudan, Napoleon III himself was taken prisoner, along with 104,000 men. The war dragged on for many more weeks, as the Germans took Strasbourg and Metz and dug in for a protracted siege of Paris, while Franck Stureur took a rising toll in casualties behind the lines. After arduous negotiations with the new Republican Prime Minister, Adolphe Thiers, the very man whose loose talk of French annexations in 1840 had triggered the Rhine crisis, a provisional peace was signed at the end of February. It was not until the 10th of May, 1871, after French government forces had crushed the uprising of the Commune in Paris, that a final treaty was agreed at Frankfurt. In the meanwhile, Bismarck had overcome the objections of the southern states and secured their agreement to a union. On the 18th of January, 1871, a new German empire was proclaimed in the Hall of Mirrors at the Palace of Versailles. Exactly 170 years to the day, after the coronation of Friedrich I as Prussian king, King William I accepted the title of German Emperor. A New Europe For centuries, Europe's German centre had been politically fragmented and weak. The continent was dominated by the states on its periphery, whose interest was to maintain the power vacuum at the centre. Now, however, for the first time, the centre was united and strong. Relations among the European states would henceforth be driven by a new and unfamiliar dynamic. Benjamin Disraeli, leader of the Conservative opposition in the House of Commons, saw this more clearly than most. This war represents the German Revolution, a greater political event than the French, he declared before the House. There is not a single diplomatic tradition that has not been swept away. 
how true these observations were would only gradually become clear. The era of Austro-Prussian dualism, once the struggling principle of political life among the German states, was over. As early as May 1871, the Austrian foreign minister, Count Friedrich Ferdinand von Beust, recognised the futility of a policy of containment and advised Emperor Francis Josef that Vienna should henceforth seek an agreement between Austria-Hungary and Prussia-Germany, embracing all current affairs. Boist himself did not survive to oversee the new orientation. He was dismissed in November 1871, but his successor, Count Eula Andrassy, pursued the same general line. Its first fruit was the Three Emperors League of October 1873 between Austria-Hungary, Russia and Germany. Six years later, Bismarck negotiated the more comprehensive dual alliance of 1879 that transformed Austria-Hungary into Germany's junior ally. Henceforth, Austrian policy would aim to engage Berlin as deeply as possible in the security interests of Austria-Hungary. Even if this meant accepting subordinate status within the relationship, the two states would remain bound to each other until 1918. The War of 1870 also placed the relationship with France on an entirely new footing. The annexation of Alsace-Lorraine, strongly advocated by Bismarck, traumatized the French political elite and imposed a lasting burden on Franco-German relations. Alsace-Lorraine became the holy grail of the French cult of revanche, providing the focus for successive waves of chauvinistic agitation. Pressing for it may well have been the worst mistake of Bismarck's political career. Even without the annexation, however, the very existence of the new German Empire would have transformed the relationship with France. German weakness had been one of the traditional mainstays of French security policy. It is easy to see, French Foreign Minister Charles Gravier, Count Vergen, wrote in 1779, what advantage Germany would have over us if this formidable power were not limited by the form of its constitution. We thus owe our superiority and our security to the forces of German disunity. After 1871, France was bound to seek every possible opportunity to contain the new power on its eastern border. A lasting enmity between France and Germany despite intermittent efforts on both sides to achieve a rapprochement, was thus to an extent pre-programmed into the European international system after the wars of unification. If we consider these two factors, the close bond with Austria-Hungary and the lasting enmity with France, as fixtures of the European scene in the post-unification decades, then it becomes easier to see why Prussia-Germany found it so difficult to avoid the drift into isolation there was such a striking feature of the decades before 1914. From Paris's perspective, the chief objective had to be to contain Germany by forming an anti-German alliance. The most attractive candidate for such a partnership was Russia. Berlin could prevent this only by attaching Russia to an alliance system of its own. But any alliance system incorporating both Russia and Austria-Hungary was bound to be unstable. Having been shut out of Germany and Italy, Austro-Hungarian foreign policy focused increasingly on the Balkans, a region where Vienna's interests conflicted directly with those of Russia. It was tension over the Balkans that broke the Three Emperors League in 1885. Bismarck managed to patch up German relations with Russia by negotiating the Reinsurance Treaty of 1887, but by 1889 it had become increasingly difficult to reconcile Berlin's commitments to Austria-Hungary with its obligations to Russia. In 1890, Bismarck's successor, Leo von Caprivi, allowed the reinsurance treaty to lapse. France promptly leapt in, offering St. Petersburg generous loans and armament subsidies. The result was the Franco-Russian Military Convention of the 17th of August, 1892, and the fully-fledged alliance of 1894, both of which clearly envisaged Germany as the future enemy. It was to compensate for this adverse development that Germany in turn moved closer to Turkey in the 1890s. Freeing Britain from its traditional role as guardian of the Dardanelles and Bosporus Straits, and allowing it, after 1905, to pursue a policy of appeasement vis-à-vis -vis Russia. The bipolar Europe that would go to war in 1914 was now in place. This does not mean that the statesmen of United Germany should be cleared of blame for the epic blunders and omissions that did so much to undermine Germany's international standing during the last decade and a half before 1914. 
but it does suggest that the momentous drift into isolation can only partly be explained in terms of political provocation and response. It represents, at a deeper level, the unfolding of the structural transformation wrought by Prussia's German Revolution of 1866-71. to 71. Chapter 16. Merged into Germany In the spring of 1848, as crowds thronged through the streets of revolutionary Berlin, King Friedrich William IV declared that Prussia would henceforth be merged into Germany. Preussen geht fortan in Deutschland auf. His words were premature, but prescient nevertheless. They hinted at the ambivalent portent of national unification for the Prussian state. Germany was unified under Prussian leadership, but the long-awaited consummation inaugurated a process of dissolution. With the formation of a German national state, the Prussia, whose history we have traced in this book, came to an end. Prussia was no longer an autonomous actor on the international stage. It had to learn to inhibit the large and ponderous body of the new Germany. The demands of German nationhood complicated the inner life of the Prussian state, amplifying its dissonances, disturbing its political equilibrium, loosening some bonds while reinforcing others, bringing at once a diffusion and a narrowing of identities. Prussia in the German Constitution In formal terms, Prussia's place within the new Germany was defined by the Imperial Constitution of the 16th of April, 1871. This remarkable document was the fruit of a complex historical compromise. A balance had to be struck between the ambitions of the sovereign entities that had come together to form the German Reich. Bismarck himself was mainly concerned with consolidating and extending Prussian power, but this was not a program that held much appeal for the governments of Baden, Württemberg, or Bavaria. The constitution that resulted was emphatically devolved in character. Indeed, it was not so much a constitution in the traditional sense as a treaty among the sovereign territories that had agreed to form the German Empire. This was made abundantly clear in the preamble, which opened with the words, His Majesty the King of Prussia, in the name of the North German Confederation, His Majesty the King of Bavaria, his Majesty the King of Württemberg, His Royal Highness the Grand Duke of Baden, His Royal Highness the Grand Duke of Hesse, for those parts of the Duchy of Hesse that are south of the River Main, conclude an everlasting federation, Bund, for the protection of the territory of the federation and the rights thereof, as well as to care for the welfare of the German people. In accordance with the notion that the new empire was a confederation of sovereign principalities, Fürstenbund, the member states continued to operate their own parliamentary legislatures and constitutions. The power to set and raise direct taxes rested exclusively with the member states, not with the Reich, whose revenues derived chiefly from indirect levies. There remained a plurality of German crowns and courts, all of which still enjoyed various privileges and traditional dignities. The larger German states even continued to exchange ambassadors with one another, as they had within the old German confederation. Foreign powers, by the same logic, sent envoys not only to Berlin, but also to Dresden and Munich. There was no reference to the German nation, and as yet no official German nationality, though the Constitution also obliged the federal states to concede equal citizenship rights to all members of the new empire. Perhaps the most striking aspect of the new political order, as the Constitution defined it, was the weakness of the central authority. This aspect is cast more sharply into relief if we compare it with the abortive imperial constitution drawn up by the liberal lawyers of the Frankfurt Parliament in 1848-9. Whereas the Frankfurt Constitution set down uniform political principles for the governments of all the individual states, the later document did not. Whereas the Frankfurt Constitution envisaged the formation of a Reich authority distinct from those of the member states, the Constitution of the 16th of April, 1871, stated that the sovereign German authority was the Federal Council, consisting of representatives of the members of the Federation. The Council determined what bills were to be brought before the Reichstag, its assent was required before bills could become law, and it was responsible for overseeing the execution of Reich legislation. Every member of the Federation had the right to propose bills and to have them debated in the Council. The Constitution of 1871 even announced, Article 8, 
that the Federal Council would form from its own members a range of permanent committees, with responsibility for a variety of spheres, including foreign affairs, the army and fortresses, and naval matters. An uninitiated reader of the Constitution could thus be forgiven for drawing the conclusion that the Federal Council was the true seat, not only of sovereignty, but of political power in the German Empire. This fastidious accommodation of federal rights appeared to leave little room for the exercise of Prussian hegemony. But constitutions are often unreliable guides to political reality. One thinks of the constitution of the Soviet bloc states after 1945, with their pious allusions to freedom of the press and opinion. The Reichsverfassung of 1871 was no exception. The practical evolution of German politics over the following decades undermined the authority vested in the Federal Council. Although Chancellor Bismarck always insisted that Germany was, and remained, a confederation of principalities, Fürstenbund, the constitutional promise of the Council was never fulfilled. The most important reason for this was simply the overwhelming primacy, in military and territorial terms, of Prussia. Within the Federation, the state of Prussia, with 65% of the surface area and 62% of the population, enjoyed de facto hegemony. The Prussian army dwarfed the South German military establishments. The King of Prussia was also, as German Emperor, under Article 63 of the Constitution, the supreme commander of the Imperial Armed Forces, and Article 61 stipulated that the whole Prussian military code was to be introduced through the Reich without delay. This made a nonsense of any federal pretensions to regulate military affairs through a permanent committee. Prussia's dominance also made itself felt within the Federal Council. With the exception of the Hanseatic city-states of Hamburg, Lübeck and Bremen, the lesser principalities in central and northern Germany formed a Prussian clientele, upon whom pressure could always be applied if necessary. Prussia, in its own right, possessed only 17 of the 58 votes on the Council, a smaller portion than its size justified. But since only 14 votes were needed to veto draft laws, Prussia was in a position to block unwelcome initiatives from other states. As Prussian Minister-President, Prussian Foreign Minister and Imperial Chancellor, Bismarck ensured that the Federal Committee for Foreign Affairs remained a dead letter, despite the provisions of the Constitution under Article 8. As a result, the Prussian Foreign Ministry became, in effect, the Foreign Ministry of the German Empire. In the sphere of domestic politics, the Federal Council lacked the bureaucratic machinery necessary for the drafting of laws. This left it dependent upon the large and well-trained Prussian bureaucracy, with the result that the Council came increasingly to function as a body of review for bills, which had been formulated and debated by the Prussian Ministry of State. The subordinate role of the Federal Council was reflected even in the political architecture of Berlin. Lacking a building of its own, it was housed in the Imperial Chancellery. The primacy of Prussia was further assured by the relative weakness of imperial administrative institutions. A Reich administration of sorts did emerge during the 1870s, as new departments were established to deal with the growing pressure of Reich business, but it remained dependent upon the Prussian administrative structure. The heads of the Reich offices, foreign affairs, interior, justice, postal services, railways, treasury, were not ministers, properly speaking, but state secretaries of subordinate rank, who answered directly to the imperial chancellor. The Prussian bureaucracy was larger than the Reichs, and remained so until the outbreak of the First World War. Most of the officials employed in the imperial administration were Prussians, but this was not a one-way process, in which Prussians swarmed on to the commanding heights of the new German state. It would be truer to say Prussian and German national institutions grew together, intertwining their branches. It became increasingly common, for example, for non-Prussians to serve as imperial officials and even as Prussian ministers. The personnel of the Prussian ministries and the imperial secretariats grew ever more enmeshed. By 1914, some 25% of Prussian army officers did not possess Prussian citizenship. Yet even as the membranes between Prussia and the other German states became more permeable, the residual federalism of the German system ensured that Prussia retained its distinctive political institutions. Of these, the most important in constitutional terms was Prussia's bicameral legislature. The German Reichstag was elected on the basis of universal manhood suffrage. 
By contrast, the lower house of the Prussian Landtag, as we have seen, was saddled with a three-class franchise, whose powerful inbuilt bias in favour of property owners ensured the predominance of conservative and right liberal forces. Whereas elections to the national parliament were based on direct and secret ballots, the Prussian Landtag was constituted using a system of public ballots and an indirect franchise. Voters elected a college of representatives, who in turn chose deputies. This system had seemed a reasonable enough answer to the problems facing the administration in the aftermath of the revolutions of 1848, but it did not prevent the Liberals from mounting a formidable campaign against Bismarck during the constitutional crisis of the early 1860s. But in the decades following unification, it began to look increasingly problematic. The three-class system was, above all, notoriously open to manipulation, because the colleges of representatives with their public ballots were much more transparent and manageable than the general public. In the 1870s, liberal grandees in the provinces exploited this system to great effect, using their control over local patronage to ensure that rural constituencies returned liberal deputies. But things changed from the late 1870s, when the Bismarck administration began systematically manipulating the electoral process in favour of conservative candidates. Local bureaucracies were purged of politically unreliable elements and open to conservative aspirants who were encouraged to play an active role in pro-government agitation. Electoral boundaries were gerrymandered to safeguard conservative majorities. Polling places were moved to conservative areas within swinging rural constituencies so that voters from opposition strongholds had to trudge across kilometres of open country to place their votes. The conservatives also benefited from a sea change in political attitudes as country voters, unnerved by the economic slump of the mid-70s, abandoned liberalism to embrace protectionist, pro-agrarian sectoral politics. In rural areas, the result was an almost seamless continuity between conservative landed elites, Prussian officialdom, and the conservative contingent in the Landtag. The cohesion of this network was further reinforced by the Prussian upper house, an even more conservative body than the Landtag, in which hereditary peers and representatives of the landed estate sat beside ex officio delegates from the cities, the clergy, and universities. Established in 1854 by Friedrich William IV, on the model of the British House of Lords, with a view to strengthening the corporate element in the new constitution, the upper house had helped to block liberals' bills during the new era, and remained thereafter until its dissolution in 1918, a weighty conservative ballast within the system. The effects of this partial merging of the conservative rural interest with the organs of government and representation were far-reaching. The Prussian electoral system favoured the consolidation of a powerful agrarian lobby. This in turn meant that a substantial part of the rural population, which accounted for the great majority of mandates, came to see the three-class system as the best guarantor of agrarian interests. It was reasonable to assume that the introduction of a direct, secret and equal franchise in Prussia would undermine the conservative and national liberal factions, and thereby jeopardise the fiscal privileges of the agrarian sector, which benefited from preferential tax rates and protectionist tariffs on imported foodstuffs. After 1890, when the Social Democrats emerged as the largest polling party in the German national Reichstag elections, it became possible to argue that the three-class system was the only bulwark protecting Prussia, its institutions and traditions, against revolutionary socialism. This was an argument that not only conservatives, but also many right-wing liberals and some rural Catholics found persuasive. The three-class franchise thus had the baleful effect of reinforcing the influence of the conservative rural interest, to a point where the far-reaching reform of the system became impossible. Chancellors, or even a Kaiser, who attempted to tamper with the special entitlements of the rural sector, risked vociferous and well-coordinated opposition from the agrarian fronde. Learning this lesson cost two chancellors, Caprivi and Bulow, their posts. The Prussian system thus immobilized itself. It became, in constitutional terms, the conservative anchor within the German system, just as Bismarck had intended. There was nothing especially nefarious about the egotistical sector politics of the agrarians. The left liberals were just as frank about their pro-business, low-tax policies, and the social democrats claimed to speak only for the German proletariat, whose future dictatorship, in the raw Marxist rhetoric still favoured by the party, was assured.
But it was the agrarians and their conservative allies who succeeded in imprinting their interests and, to an extent, their political culture on the system itself, laying claim in the process to ownership of the very idea of a unique and independent Prussia. Between 1899 and 1911, while virtually every other German territory, except the Mecklenburgs and the tiny principality of Valdig, underwent substantial electoral reform, Prussia remained ensnared in its increasingly anomalous electoral arrangements. On the eve of the First World War, Prussian citizens were still being denied an equal, direct and secret ballot. Only in the summer of 1917, under the pressure of war and a growing domestic opposition, did the Prussian administration relinquish its commitment to the old franchise. But before there was a chance to find out how the monarchical system would fare under more progressive electoral arrangements, it was swallowed up in the defeat and revolution of 1918. Political and Cultural Change While the Prussian constitution remained frozen in time, Prussian political culture did not. The hegemony of the conservatives was impressive, but it was also limited in important ways. There was a fraught polarity between the Prussia whose deputies, many of them socialists and left liberals, sat in the Reichstag, and the rural Prussia whose representatives dominated the Landtag. Reichstag elections enjoyed remarkably high rates of voter participation, from 67.7% in 1898 to a staggering 84.5% in 1912. The last election before the end of the war, when the Social Democrats captured more than a third of all German votes. By contrast, Prussian voters in the poorer income brackets showed their contempt for the three-class system by simply staying away from the polls during Prussian state elections. In the elections of 1893, only 15.2% of the third class of voters, encompassing the overwhelming majority of the population, actually bothered to cast their votes. The extreme regional diversity of the Prussian lands also limited the scope of conservative politics. On the eve of the First World War, Prussian conservatism was almost exclusively an East Elbian phenomenon. Of 147 conservative deputies in the Prussian Landtag of 1913, 124 were from the old provinces of Prussia. Only one conservative deputy was returned from the Prussian Rhineland. In this sense, the three-class system accentuated the divide between East and West, widening the emotional distance between the politically progressive, industrial, commercialized, urban and substantially Catholic West and the Asiatic steppe of Prussian East Elbia. And this socio-geographical separateness in turn hindered the emergence of the kind of bourgeois noble composite elite that set the tone in the South German states ensuring that the politics of the Junker milieu acquired a flavor of intransigence and extremism that set it apart. Outside the conservative heartlands, however, and especially in the western provinces and the major cities, there flourished a robust and predominantly middle-class political culture. In many large towns, liberal oligarchies, sustained by limited urban franchises, oversaw progressive programs of infrastructural rationalization and social provision. Especially in the years after 1890, this dramatic expansion in the variety and mass consumption of newspapers across the Prussian cities released formidable critical energies, confronting successive administrations with any image problem they found impossible to resolve. This was, as one senior political figure observed in 1893, an era of limitless publicity, where countless threads run here and there, and no bell can be rung without everyone forming a judgment about its tone. The 1890s were a turning point for the socialists too, whose most important strongholds lay in the industrial zone around Berlin and the growing conurbations of the Ruhr area. In the elections of 1890, the socialists emerged from a period of draconian repression as the largest polling German party. A socialist subculture evolved, with specialist clubs and venues catering to an emergent constituency of industrial workers, laborers, tradesmen, and low-wage employees. By the turn of the century, Prussia was the stamping ground of Europe's largest and best-organized socialist movement, a fitting tribute to its two Prussian grandfathers, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. The strife and polarization so characteristic of European cultural life in the fin de siècle also left their mark on Prussia. 
Here was another world that quickly slipped beyond the control of the conservative elites. The biggest theatrical sensation of the early 1890s in Berlin was Gerhard Hauptmann's D. Weber, a sympathetic dramatization of the Silesian Weavers' Revolt of 1844. Conservatives denounced the play on political grounds as a socialist manifesto, but they were also appalled by the harsh naturalism of his idiom, which was seen as negating the essential values of theatre. The Interior Ministry in Berlin imposed a ban on public performances of the play, but could not prevent it from appearing before enthusiastic audiences in large private venues, such as the Freie Bühne and the Neue Freie Volksbühne, a theatre with links to the Social Democrats. Further bans in the Prussian provinces failed to prevent D. Weber from becoming a huge public success. Even more worrying from the government standpoint was the fact that a debate over the bans in the lower house of the Prussian Landtag revealed deep divisions around the question of whether the tradition of state theatre censorship was still legitimate in an era of artistic freedom. Even within the ministry itself, there were doubts about the wisdom of the interior minister's heavy-handed approach. A gap opened up between the official culture of the court and the experimentation and anti-traditionalism of an increasingly fragmented cultural sphere. It can be seen, for example, in the divergence of courtly and popular dance cultures. Around the turn of the century, new North American and Argentinian steps flooded into the dance locales of the larger cities. The fashionable shelf life of individual styles grew shorter and shorter, as the Jeunesse Dorée welcomed the cakewalk, the two-step, the bunny hug, the Judy walk, the turkey, and the grizzly bear. But while an increasingly broad public consumed these transatlantic imports, the court of William II saw a revival of pomp and old-world ceremony. All court balls were organised so as not to upstage members of the royal family. If a princess is participating in the dance, the General de Bazaar noted in 1900, only two other pairs apart from the one in which the princess finds herself may dance at the same time. William II explicitly forbade members of the armed forces to perform the new steps in public. The gentlemen of the army and the navy are hereby requested to dance neither tango nor one-step or two-step in uniform, and to avoid families in which these dances are performed. The same widening cultural gap could be seen in architecture and the visual arts. Consider, for example, the contrast between the heavy neo-baroque megalomania of the new Berlin Cathedral completed in 1905 after ten years of construction works, and the graceful, austere proto-modernism of the new architects, such as Alfred Messel, Hans Pelzig, and Peter Behrens, among others, whose works between 1896 and 1912 were emphatic rejections of the eclectic historical style favoured by official Prussia. The arbiters of public taste, from Emperor William II to the rectors and professors of the state-funded academies, held that art should edify by drawing its subject matter from medieval legend, mythology, or stirring historical episodes, while remaining true to the eternal canons of the ancients. But in 1892, there was bitter controversy in Berlin over an exhibition staged by 11 artists who wanted to free themselves from the strictures of the official salon. The bleak and wild naturalism, thus the words of one outraged critic, of Max Liebermann, Walter Leisterko and their associates ran directly against the grain of official sanctioned art practice. By 1898, the rebellion had broadened and diversified into the Berlin Secession, whose first exhibition, held in 1898, showcased the wide range of styles and perspectives taking shape within the non-official art world and was a huge public success. What was interesting about the secessionists was not simply their oppositional relationship to the prevailing cultural authorities, but the specifically Prussian and local content of much of their work. Walter Leistiku, who hailed from Bromberg in West Prussia, was well known for his haunting images of the Mark Brandenburg, trees brooding in shadow beside lakes, flat landscapes pocked with still luminous water. His painting, Der Grunewald Sie, a dark atmospheric view of a lake on the leafy southwestern outskirts of Berlin, was rejected for exhibition by the official Berlin Salon in 1898. Indeed, it was the controversy over this decision that prompted the cessationists to create their own forum in the following year. Leistaku's paintings and etchings disturbed contemporary sensibilities, in part because they took possession of the Brandenburg landscape in the name of a new and potentially subversive sensibility. William II, who loathed Leistaku's work, 
registered his sense of displacement when he complained that the artist had ruined the entire Grunewald for him. Er hat mir den ganzen Grunewald versaut. Käthe Korwitz laid claim to a specifically Prussian tradition in a different sense. In a widely praised circle of etchings inspired by Hauptmann's play, she invoked the Silesian Weaver's Revolt of 1844. These were scenes of bitter conflict and suffering, in which the epic canvas of history painting was subverted to serve a socialist vision of the past. Even the proto-modernist architects Messel, Perzig, and Behrens were engaged in a dialogue with the specificity of the Prussian setting. Their airy and technically innovative architectural designs responded at many levels to the spare neoclassicism of the Prussian style, associated with Gilly and Schinkel. The last decades before the war witnessed a dramatic proliferation in the erection of public monuments and statues. In Prussia, as across much of Europe, the public statuary of this era tended towards weightiness and magniloquence. Patriotic themes loomed large. A study published in 1904 found that in recent years, 372 monuments had been erected to Emperor William I alone, most of them in the Prussian provinces. Some of these were financed from state funds, but local monument committees also played a role in many areas, securing the necessary permissions and raising donations. By the turn of the century, however, the public echo of such objects was ambivalent. A telling moment was the opening in 1901 of the Ziegers Ali, Avenue of Victory, a chain of monumental statues extending for 750 meters along one of the axial roads of the capital. Set into long sequence of spacious alcoves lined with stone balustrades were freestanding figures on lofty pedestals, representing the rulers of the House of Brandenburg, flanked by busts of generals and senior statesmen from the reign. Already at the time of its opening, this gargantuan project appeared out of touch with the times. In his hurry to complete the avenue on schedule, Emperor William II had commissioned sculptors of varied distinction to execute the statues. All were conventional and bombastic. Many were clumsy and lifeless as well. The result was an expensive exercise in pomposity and monotony. With their usual irreverence, the Berliners dubbed the avenue the Puppen Alley, or Puppet Alley, and numerous contemporary visual satires mocked the project as the Emperor's megalomaniacal folly. The coup de grace was administered in 1903, when a famous advertisement for a brand of mouthwash featured the Avenue of Victory lined with gigantic bottles of Oudoul. The increasingly polarized relationship between official and dissenting political cultures was, even in the German context, a specifically Prussian phenomenon. It was far less marked in the southern German states, where progressive coalitions succeeded in pushing through programs of constitutional reform. The relationship between the governmental parties and the social democrats were also less fraught in the South, partly because the established partisan groups were more open to collaboration with the left, and partly because South German socialists were more moderate and less confrontational than their Prussian counterparts. In high cultural terms, too, the polarization was less pronounced. By contrast with Kaiser Wilhelm II, who publicly denounced cultural modernism of all kinds, Grand Duke Ernst Ludwig of Hesse-Darmstadt was a well-known connoisseur and sponsor of modern art and sculpture. In this small federal state, the court was still an important center of cultural innovation. Culture War By the end of 1878, more than half of Prussia's Catholic bishops were in exile or in prison. More than 1,800 priests had been incarcerated or exiled and over 16 million marks worth of ecclesiastical property seized. In the first four months of 1875 alone, 241 priests, 136 Catholic newspaper editors, and 210 Catholic laymen were fined or imprisoned. 20 newspapers were confiscated, 74 Catholic houses were searched, 103 Catholic political activists were expelled or interned, and 55 Catholic associations or clubs were closed down. As late as 1881, a quarter of all Prussian parishes remained without priests. This was Prussia at the height of the Kulturkampf, a struggle of cultures that would shape German politics and public life for generations. Prussia was not the only European state to see tension over confessional questions in this era. In the 1870s and 1880s, there was heightened conflict between Catholics and secular liberal movements across the European continent 
but the Prussian case stands out. Nowhere else did the state proceed so systematically against Catholic institutions and personnel. Administrative reform and law were the two main instruments of discrimination. In 1871, the government abolished the Catholic section in the Prussian ministry for church affairs, thereby depriving the Catholics of a separate representation within the senior echelons of the bureaucracy. The criminal code was amended to enable the authorities to prosecute priests who used the pulpit for political ends. In 1872, further state measures eliminated the influence of ecclesiastical personnel over the planning and implementation of school curricula and the supervision of schools. Members of religious orders were prohibited from teaching in the state school system and the Jesuits were expelled from the German Empire. Under the May Laws of 1873, the training and appointment of clergy in Prussia were placed under state supervision. In 1874, the Prussian government introduced compulsory civil marriage, a step extended to the entire German Empire a year later. Additional legislation in 1875 abolished various allegedly suspect religious orders, choked off state subsidies to the church, and delegated religious guarantees from the Prussian constitution. As Catholic religious personnel were expelled, jailed and forced into hiding, the authorities imposed statutes permitting state-authorized agents to take charge of vacated bishoprics. Bismarck was the driving force behind this unprecedented campaign. Why did he undertake it? The answer lies partly in his highly confessionalized understanding of the German national question. In the 1850s, during his posting to the German Confederal Authority in Frankfurt, he had come to believe that political Catholicism was the chief enemy of Prussia in southern Germany. The spectacle of Catholic revivalist piety, with its demonstrative pilgrimages and public festivities, filled him with disgust, as did the increasingly Roman orientation of mid-century Catholicism. At times, indeed, he doubted whether this hypocritical, idolatrous papism full of hate and cunning, whose presumptuous dogma falsified God's revelation and nurtured idolatry as a basis for worldly domination, was a religion at all. A variety of themes were bundled together here. A fastidious Protestant contempt, accentuated by Bismarck's pietist spirituality, for the outward display so characteristic of the Catholic revival, blended with a strain of half-submerged German idealism and political apprehensions, shading into paranoia, about the Church's capacity to manipulate minds and mobilize masses. These antipathies deepened during the conflicts that brought about the unification of Germany. The German Catholics had traditionally looked to Austria for leadership in German affairs, and they were unenthusiastic about the prospect of a Prussian-dominated small Germany, excluding the six million, mainly Catholic, Austrian Germans. In 1866, the news of Prussian victory triggered Catholic riots in the South, while the Catholic caucus in the Prussian Landtag opposed the government on a number of key symbolic initiatives, including the Indemnity Bill, the Prussian Annexation Programme, and the proposal to reward Bismarck and the Prussian generals financially for the recent victory. In 1867-8, the Prussian minister-president, now Chancellor of the North German Confederation, was infuriated by the strength of Catholic resistance in the South to a closer union with the North. Particularly alarming was the Bavarian Campaign of 1869 against the pro-Prussian policies of the liberal government in Munich. The clergy played a crucial role in mobilizing support for the Catholic particularist program of the opposition, agitating from pulpits and collecting petitions bearing hundreds of thousands of signatures. After 1871, doubts about the political reliability of the Catholics were further reinforced by the fact that, of the three main ethnic minorities, Poles, Alsatians and Danes, whose representatives formed opposition parties to the Reichstag, two were emphatically Catholic. Bismarck was utterly persuaded of the political disloyalty of the 2.5 million Catholic Poles in the Prussian East, and he suspected that the Church and its networks were deeply implicated in the Polish nationalist movement. These concerns resonated more destructively within the new nation-state than they had before. The new Bismarckian Reich was not in any sense an organic or historically evolved entity. It was the highly artificial product of four years of diplomacy and war. In the 1870s, as so often in the history of the Prussian state, the successes of the monarchy seemed as fragile as they were impressive. 
there was an unsettling sense that what had so swiftly been put together could also be undone, that the empire might never acquire the political or cultural cohesion to safeguard itself against fragmentation from within. These anxieties may appear absurd to us, but they felt real to many contemporaries. In this climate of uncertainty, it seemed plausible to view the Catholics as the most formidable domestic hindrance to national consolidation. In lashing out against the Catholics, Bismarck knew that he could count on the enthusiastic support of the national liberals, whose powerful positions in the new Reichstag and the Prussian Chamber of Deputies made them indispensable political allies. In Prussia, as in much of Germany and Europe, anti-Catholicism was one of the defining strands of late 19th century liberalism. Liberals held up Catholicism as the diametrical negation of their own world view. They denounced the absolutism and slavery of the doctrine of papal infallibility, adopted by the Vatican Council in 1870, according to which the authority of the Pope is unchallengeable when he speaks ex cathedra on matters of faith or morals. Liberal journalism depicted the Catholic faithful as a servile and manipulated mass, by implied contrast with a liberal social universe centered on male tax-paying worthies with unbound consciences. A bestiary of anti-clerical stereotypes emerged. The satires of liberal journals thronged with wily, thin Jesuits, with lecherous, fat priests, amenable subjects because the cartoonist's pen could make such artful play with a solid black of their garb. By vilifying the parish priest in this confessorial role, or impugning the sexual propriety of nuns, they articulated through a double negative the liberal faith in the sanctity of the patriarchal nuclear family. Through their nervousness about the prominent place of women within many of the new Catholic orders, and their prurient fascination with the celibacy or not of the priest, liberals revealed a deep-seated preoccupation with manliness that was crucial, though not always explicitly, to the self-understanding of the movement. For the liberals, therefore, the campaign against the church was nothing less than a struggle of cultures. The term was coined by the liberal Protestant pathologist Rudolf Virchow in a speech of February 1872 to the Prussian Chamber of Deputies. Bismarck's campaign against the Prussian Catholics was a failure. He had hoped that an anti-Catholic crusade would help to create a broad Protestant liberal conservative lobby that would help him to pass legislation consolidating the new empire but the integrating effect of the campaign was more fleeting and fragile than he had anticipated. Anti-Catholicism could not sustain a durable platform for government action, either in Prussia or in the Empire. There were many facets to this problem. Bismarck himself was less an extremist than many of those whose passions were aroused by his policy. He was a religious man who sought the guidance of God in his administration of state affairs and usually, as the left liberal Ludwig Bamberger sardonically noted, found the deity agreeing with him. His religion was, in the pietist tradition, non-sectarian and ecumenical. He was opposed to the complete separation of church and state sought by the liberals, and he did not believe that religion was a purely private affair. Bismarck did not share the left liberal hope that religion would ultimately wither away as a social force. He was thus unnerved by the anti-clerical and secularizing energies released by the Kulturkampf. The anti-Catholic campaign also failed because the confessional divide was cross-cut by the other fault lines in the Prussian political landscape. As the Kulturkampf wore on, the rift between left liberals and right liberals proved in some respects even deeper than that between the liberals and the Catholics. By the mid-1870s, the left liberals had begun to oppose the campaign on the grounds that it infringed fundamental rights. The increasing radicalism of anti-church measures also prompted misgivings in many Protestants on the clerical wing of German conservatism. The view gained ground that the real victim of the Kulturkampf was not the Catholic Church or Catholic politics as such, but religion itself. The most prominent examples of such conservative scruples were Ernst Ludwig von Gerlach, and Hans von Kleist, both men formed by the pietist milieu of old Prussia. Even if the support for Bismarck's policy had been more secure, it is highly doubtful that he could have ever succeeded in neutralizing Catholic dissent by any of the means available to a constitutional and law-abiding state. Bismarck himself had been in his twenties when the fight over mixed marriages broke out in the Prussian Rhineland in 1837, 
a struggle that mobilized the Catholic population in the province and enhanced the moral authority of the episcopate. He must also have remembered the vain efforts of the Prussian government to impose the Prussian Union on the old Lutherans of Silesia. Here again was a clear illustration of the futility of applying legal coercion to a confessional minority. And yet Bismarck and his partisans made the old mistake of overrating the power of the state and underestimating the determination of their opponents. In many areas, Catholic clerical personnel simply failed to respond in any way at all to the new laws. The new state cultural examinations for young priests approaching ordination were not attended. The state endorsements required for new ecclesiastical appointments were not sought. The Prussian authorities, who had rushed these laws through and had not thought very deeply about how to ensure compliance, responded to this civil disobedience, as had their predecessors in the 1830s, by imposing improvised sanctions ranging from fines of varying severity to terms of imprisonment and exile. But these measures had virtually no detectable effect. The church continued to make illegal appointments, and the fines levied by the government authorities continued to accumulate. By early 1874, the Archbishop of Gnesen Posen alone had incurred fines totaling 29,700 thalers, more than twice his annual stipend. The figure for his colleague in Colonia was 29,500. When fines remained unpaid, the local authorities confiscated the property of bishops and offered it up at public auction. But this too was counterproductive because loyal Catholics would rally to manage the auction in such a way as to ensure that the goods were sold at the lowest possible prices and returned to the expropriated clergyman. Imprisonment was equally futile, as senior ecclesiastical dignitaries, bishops and archbishops were treated with such leniency during their incarceration that they might as well have been in their homes. They were allowed to occupy suites of rooms, furnished from the episcopal palace, and they dined on food prepared by the palace kitchens. In the case of Johannes von der Marwitz, the elderly bishop of Köln, West Prussia, the option of imprisonment was even vetoed by the local judiciary on the grounds that the stairs of the local penitentiary were too steep for him to ascend. The authorities treated common parish priests far more harshly, but this too was ineffective, since it merely intensified the solidarity of the faithful with their beleaguered priests and hardened the determination of the latter to resist. Even after brief jail terms, priests returned as heroes to their parishes. The government attempted to resolve this problem in May 1874 by introducing a new batch of regulations, known collectively as the Expulsion Law, and providing for the exile of insurgent bishops and clergy to remote locations. A favourite was the Baltic island of Rügen. Several hundred priests were rounded up and exiled under these regulations in the four years between 1875 and 1879, but this measure created more problems than it solved. Who was to police the enforcement of the expulsion orders? In theory, this responsibility fell to the district commissioners, land rata, but an official overseeing a population of 50,000, scattered over 200 square kilometers, could hardly be expected to keep abreast of developments in every parish. It was not unknown for priests simply to return unnoticed after their expulsions and resume their clerical duties. In one such case, an expelled priest worked in his parish for two years before the authorities became aware of his existence. By this time, the expulsion order against him had elapsed. It also proved extremely difficult to replace the displaced priests with politically reliable successors. The individuals appointed by the state to replace dismissed clergymen were an abject failure, since they were despised and vilified by the Catholic populace. In a number of cases, the local authorities found the only way to ensure compliance was to organize compulsory church parades in army encampments. Far from neutralizing Catholicism as a political and social force, then, Bismarck's campaign enhanced it. Bismarck had reckoned that the Catholic camp would split under the pressure of the new laws, marginalizing the ultramontanes, exponents of papal authority, and transforming the remainder of the church into a compliant partner of the state. But in fact, the opposite happened. The effect of state action was to drive back and marginalize liberal and statist elements within Catholicism. The controversies provoked in many Catholic communities by the Declaration of Papal Infallibility in 1870 were put aside as critics of the doctrine acknowledged that papal absolutism was a lesser evil than the secularizing state. 
A small contingent of liberal anti-infallibilists, most of them academics, did split from Rome to form old Catholic congregations, a distant echo of the radical German Catholics who had congregated under the motto Away from Rome in the 1840s, but they never acquired a significant social base. Perhaps the most conspicuous evidence of Bismarck's failure is simply the spectacular growth of the Centre Party, the party of the Prussian and many German Catholics. Although Bismarck did succeed in isolating the Centre Party within the Prussian Parliament, at least for a time, he could do nothing to prevent it from increasing its share of German votes in the national elections. Whereas only 23% of Prussian Catholics had voted Centre in 1871, 45% did so in 1874. Thanks in large part to the ravages of Bismarck's Kulturkampf, the Centre Party peaked early, efficiently colonising its social milieu, mobilising Catholics who had hitherto been politically inactive, expanding the frontiers of partisan politics. The other parties would gradually follow suit by mobilising their own voters from the new Catholic parts of the population. But it was not until 1912 that the Centre Party's great leap forward was evened out by improvements in the performance of other parties. Even then, the Centre remained the strongest Reichstag party after the Social Democrats. Since most Liberals and Conservatives were still wary of dealing with the Socialists, this made the Centre the most powerful player on the parliamentary scene, hardly the outcome Bismarck had in mind when he opened hostilities in 1871. Prussia was no stranger to confessional tensions, but the scope and brutality of Bismarck's anti-Catholic campaign was unprecedented in the history of the state. The controversy over mixed marriages in the later 1830s had been dramatic, partly because of the emotive character of the issue, but it was essentially an institutional conflict between church and state, within an administrative grey zone. By contrast, the Kulturkampf was a culture war, a struggle in which it seemed that the very identity of the new nation was at stake. That the conflict between state and church should have expanded in this way to embrace the totality of public life was a consequence of the unstable interaction between Prussia's confessional tensions, Bismarck's ruthlessness, and the challenges posed by German nationhood. In seeking to drive the Catholic Church out of politics, Bismarck had used Prussian instruments to achieve German objectives. You may perhaps prove that I erred, he told the Reichstag in a speech of 1881, but never that I lost sight for one moment of the national goal. Few political conflicts illustrate more clearly than the Kulturkampf, the volatilizing effect of German unification on Prussian politics. Poles, Jews and other Prussians During the proceedings in this house, a Polish deputy told the Reichstag of the North German Confederation in February 1870, We find ourselves in a curious position when words ring in our ears about the German past, about German mores and customs, about the welfare of the German people. Not that we begrudge the German people their welfare or want to impede their future, but what for you may be a common bond, this past, these mores and customs, this future, is for us more an element of separation vis-à-vis -vis yourselves. The Poles of the Prussian East responded to the political unification of the German states with a sense of foreboding. To be a Polish subject of the Prussian crown might be a difficult predicament, but to be a Polish German was a contradiction in terms. Subjecthood and nationality were complementary concepts. The Poles might learn to live, at least outwardly, in peace with the Prussian state. They might even come to prize its virtues, but how could they subsist as Poles within a German nation? The ascendancy of the nation as a focal point for identity and a rationale for political action was bound to have far-reaching consequences for the Poles of the Prussian lands. Of the 18.5 million inhabitants of Prussia in 1861, 2.25 million were Poles, concentrated mainly in the provinces of Posen and West Prussia. 55 and 32 percent Polish, respectively, and the southeastern districts of Silesia. Prussian policy regarding this minority, the largest in the Hohenzollern lands, had always been ambivalent, oscillating between tolerance and repression. After 1815, the government accepted the existence of a distinctive Polish nationality and fatherland under the Hohenzollern scepter, 
though only on the condition, of course, that the Poles remained loyal Prussian subjects. When the Polish uprising of 1830 raised concerns about the dangers posed by Polish nationalism, the administration switched to cultural repression, centered on the imposition of German as the language of education and public communication. But this policy was abandoned in 1840, after the accession of Friedrich William IV. The wind changed again in 1846, after an abortive Polish insurrection in the Grand Duchy of Posen. The group behind the uprising was the Posen city-based Union of the Working Classes, whose objective was to break the power of both the Prussian administration and the Polish landed nobility. Before the insurrection could get going, however, its prospective leaders were betrayed by anxious Polish noblemen to the Prussian police. A crackdown followed, in the course of which 254 Poles were tried in Berlin for involvement in the conspiracy. Provincial towns were combed by police units, and the suspect press organs gagged or closed down. This zigzag course was essentially pragmatic and reactive. The goal was to ensure the political stability of the Polish areas. The cultivation of a distinctively Polish cultural milieu was acceptable, as long as this did not feed into nationalist or secessionist aspirations. However, the situation changed somewhat after the revolutions of 1848. These seemed, at first, to bring good news for the Poles. Prussian liberal opinion was overwhelmingly pro-Polish. In March 1848, the imprisoned radicals of the 1846 uprising were liberated and paraded through the streets of Berlin to wild cheering. The new March ministry favoured the restoration of Poland as a buffer against potential Russian aggression. And on the 2nd of April, the reconvened Prussian United Diet also passed a motion in favour of Polish restoration. Not for the first time, or the last time, it seemed that the hour of Polish liberty was at hand. Ludwig Miroslavski, a military strategist and one of the leaders of the 1846 uprising, hurried to Posen to assemble a Polish army. In the mainly Polish areas of the duchy, the authority of the Prussian administration faded away as the local nobility took matters into their own hands, recruiting fighters and raising funds for Miroslavski. It was an alarming demonstration of the fragility of Prussian governance on the eastern margins of the kingdom. At the same time, however, the revolution triggered a process of ethnic polarization in the Grand Duchy of Posen. When the Polish National Committee in Posen refused to admit German members, the latter formed their own German committee, which soon fell under the influence of nationalists. Many Germans in predominantly Polish areas fled to solidly German districts, where the Prussian local administration was still functioning. On the 9th of April, activists in Bromberg founded the Netzer District Central Citizens Committee for the promotion of Prussian and German interests in the Grand Duchy of Posen. The juxtaposition of Prussian and German was telling, to say the least. In May, after various efforts at compromise had collapsed, the Prussian army entered the duchy and crushed Miroslavsky's army in a series of bloody military engagements. Prussian officials returned to their posts. The Revolutionary National Assembly in Berlin continued to argue for a policy of Polish national equality under Prussian rule, but it was dissolved in the coup d'etat of November 1848. The new Prussian constitution of 1848-50 contained no references to the idea of Polish minority rights, and no indication that Posen or any other Polish district enjoyed special status. To senior administrators, the idea that the Prussian crown might secure Polish loyalties by a policy of leniency now seemed passé. The Poles, it was argued, were beyond such appeals. They cannot be won over by any concessions, an interior ministry report observed in November 1849. Since the conciliation of the Polish national movement in Posen was an impossibility, the Prussian government was left with no option but to confine it energetically to the subordinate position it deserves. The term Germanization, Germanisierung, began to appear with increased frequency in official documents. Yet the Prussian government showed little interest in adopting the idea of Germanization as the basis for concrete policy measures. Calls from Poznanian Germans for government assistance to the German minority went unanswered. Minister-President Otto von Manteuffel took the view that if the German element was unable to subsist without state intervention, then it had no future. The authorities kept a close watch on nationalist activity, but the Poles continued to enjoy these civil liberties vouchsafed under the Prussian constitution 
including the right to mount election campaigns on behalf of Polish deputies to the Landtag. Moreover, the Prussian judiciary in Posen was scrupulous in defending the status of Polish as the language of internal administration and elementary schooling. In the 1860s, there were periodic calls for government Germanization measures, but the government remained reluctant to act, partly because it believed that market forces would ultimately favor German settlement, and partly in the years 1866-9, because Bismarck was keen to appease the Polish clergy in order not to alienate the German Catholics of the southern states and jeopardize unification. So determined was Bismarck to maintain good relations with the Polish hierarchy during these years that he sacked the provincial president, Karl von Horn, in 1869, after a dispute between the latter and Archbishop Lerachowski of Posen-Gnesen. The accomplishment of German political unification brought a paradigm shift in the government's handling of the Polish question. The Prussian authorities in the East were deeply alarmed during the summer of 1870 by the wave of undisguised partisanship for France. Polish recruits were urged to desert their Prussian regiments, a call that virtually none of them followed, and there were angry demonstrations at the news of Prussian-German victories. The situation in Posen appeared so volatile during the hostilities with France that reserve troop contingents were quartered in the province to keep order. This rebellious behavior triggered outbursts of vengeful fury from Bismarck, from the Russian border to the Adriatic Sea, he told a Prussian cabinet meeting in the autumn of 1871. We are confronted with a combined propaganda of Slavs, ultramontanes and reactionaries, and it is necessary openly to defend our national interests and our language against such hostile activities. Hyperbolic to the point of paranoia, this imagined scenario of Slavic Roman encirclement revealed the depth of Bismarck's anxieties for the new Prussian-German nation-state. Here again was that paradoxical sense of fragility and beleagueredness that had dogged the Prussian state at every phase of its aggrandizement. Bismarck's first target was the Polish clergy, whose interests he had earlier so assiduously defended. The chief objective of the School's Inspection Act of the 11th of March, 1872, was to replace the ecclesiastical dignitaries who had traditionally overseen the inspection of the 2,480 Catholic schools in the province with professional full-time inspectors in the pay of the state. Poland thus became the launching pad for Prussia's Kulturkampf against the Catholic Church, and the old Prussian policy of pragmatic collaboration with the hierarchy was cast aside. The effect, predictably enough, was to reinforce the clergy's leadership in the Polish national struggle. In many areas, the efforts of the Prussian authorities to enforce Karl Turkamp legislation against local Polish clergy resulted in direct action. Communities gathered to defend their priests physically against arrest. The state priests sent to replace imprisoned or deported clergymen were shunned or even beaten by their congregations. Father Morker, a German priest assigned by the authorities to the parish of Povich in 1877, found his church silent and empty. His parishioners preferred to attend the masses of a Polish priest in a nearby village. Even Morka's death in 1882 did not dispel the stigma. The villagers dug up his coffin and plunged it into a lake. In 1872-3, a volley of royal instructions issued from Berlin restricting the use of languages other than German in the schools of the eastern provinces. Among the collateral victims of this policy were the Prussian Lithuanians, who had never given any cause for offence and the Polish-speaking East Prussian Masurians, who were neither Catholics nor enthusiasts of Polish restoration. A statute of 1876 established German as the sole language of official business for all Prussian government agencies and political bodies. Other vernaculars could still be used in a range of parochial institutions, but this was to be phased out over a maximum of 20 years. Across the Polish areas, the lower clergy played a crucial role in coordinating protests against the new language policy. Parish priests assisted in the posting and collection of petitions, some bearing as many as 300,000 signatures, denouncing the Prussian authorities. From this point onwards, Germanization would remain the principle underpinning the rhetoric and much of the action of successive Prussian administrations in the Polish areas. In one of the most notorious manifestations of the new hardline approach, the Prussian government expelled 32,000 non-naturalized Poles and Jews from Berlin and the eastern provinces in 1885, though they had done nothing to breach German or Prussian law. 
In 1886, alarmed by the increasing emigration of Germans from the depressed agrarian East to the rapidly industrializing Western regions, the conservative national liberal majority in the Prussian Landtag approved the foundation of a Royal Prussian Colonization Commission. With its headquarters in Posen City and a capital of a hundred million marks, the Commission's purpose was to purchase failing Polish estates, subdivide them and hand them out to incoming German farmers. Bismarck, along with many of the Conservatives, had initially been opposed to subdivision because he deemed it inimical to the interests of the Juncker class. But the colonization program could succeed only with the backing of the National Liberals, who insisted on parcellation. As Bismarck's compromise over colonization policy revealed, Prussian policy in the Polish regions in the late 1880s had to take account of a wide spectrum of domestic political pressures. This trend deepened during the 1890s, when a number of powerful lobby groups emerged with a special interest in the Polish question. Of these, the most important were the Pan-German League, Aldeutsche Verband, founded in 1891 as the voice of German ultra-nationalist opinion and the Society for the Support of the Germans in the Eastern Marches, known from 1899 as the Ostmarkenverein, whose very name was a mission statement. These organizations soon made their presence felt in the sphere of Polish policy. The Pan-Germans cut their teeth in 1894 with a vociferous public campaign against Bismarck's successor, Chancellor Leo von Caprivi, who was criticized for slackening the pace of Germanization in the Polish areas. The Eastern Marches Society also propagandized energetically through its journal Die Ostmark, organizing public meetings and lobbying friendly parliamentarians. Such organizations occupied a curious place between the state and civil society. They were, in one sense, independent entities funded by donations, membership fees, and the sale of publications. But there were also links to government agencies. The founder of the Pan-Germans, Alfred Hugenberg, had come to Posen as a local official with the Royal Colonization Commission. The membership of the Eastern Marches Society, numbering some 20,000 by 1900, included a substantial contingent of minor state officials and school teachers. These people would have left any organization whose objectives conflicted with the interests of the state. But any doubts on this score were laid to rest in 1895, when the Prussian Minister for the Interior publicly endorsed the defensive work of the Eastern Marches Society during a political debate in the Landtag. Despite differences within the agrarian, conservative, nationalist milieu of individual issues, such as the increasing use of Polish seasonal labor on the Great Estates. Germanization remained the operative principle in government policy. In 1900, new measures were introduced under Chancellor Bernhard von Bülow to further prune back the use of Polish. Religious instruction, the traditional safe haven for Polish language schooling, was henceforth to be administered in German at all levels above elementary. In 1904, the Prussian Land Tag passed a law permitting county officials to withhold building permits in situations where granting them would obstruct the colonization program. The idea was to prevent Poles from buying and subdividing German farms and selling them on to Polish smallholders. There was also state financial aid for the Mittelstandskasse, a bank that specialized in easing the debt burden of German farmers. These actions were flanked by discriminatory recruitment practices in the local and provincial administration. Of 3,995 new personnel hired by the Poznan Post and Railway Authority during the years 1907 to 9, only 795 were Poles. The rest were Germans. Polish place names began to be erased from the maps, though they remained vivid in Polish popular memory. The high point, or low point, of the Germanization program was the anti Polish expropriation law of the 20th of March, 1908 which permitted the forcible removal of Polish landowners, with financial compensation, for the purposes of German colonization. The conservatives agonized over expropriation, and one can readily see why. But in the end, they supported it, having decided that the ethnic struggle between Germans and Slavs overrode the sanctity of legitimate property title. The Germanization program was an exercise in futility. It failed to prevent Polish population growth in the eastern areas from outstripping the German. The parcellation of German farms continued, financed in part by energetic Polish banks 
that skillfully exploited loopholes in the Prussian regulations. The attempt to convert schools to the exclusive use of German had to be abandoned after repeated school strikes and sustained civil disobedience. The expropriation law never fulfilled its fearsome promise. No sooner was it enshrined in law, but its teeth were filed down by the internal guidelines exempting vast areas of Polish land, for pragmatic and political reasons, from expropriation. Not until October 1912. Did the Prussian government announce its intention to execute any actual expropriation? But even then, the area involved was small. Only 1,700 hectares encompassing four economically insignificant landholdings. And the public backlash in the Polish areas so intense that the administration resolved to avoid any further expropriations. The real significance of the Germanization program thus lies less in its negligible impact on the ethnic boundaries in East Elbia than in what it tells us about the changing political climate in Prussia. The traditional view of the Prussian monarchy had been that the Poles were, like the German-speaking Brandenburgers and Pomeranians and the Lithuanians in East Prussia, Christian subjects of the Prussian crown. But from the 1870s onwards, Prussian administrators departed from this standpoint. In doing so, they followed the promptings of organizations outside the state, whose arguments and propaganda were saturated with the rhetoric of German ultra-nationalism. There was a negative circularity in this relationship. Ever uncertain of the depth of its public support, the state endorsed the work of the nationalist lobbies, who in turn derived much of their authority from the endorsement, implicit or explicit, of the state. In the process, the state placed at risk the principle of its historical existence namely the presumption that the identity of Prussia proceeded from the dominion of a dynasty whose sun shone, albeit with varying warmth, on all subjects. Throughout the early to mid-nineteenth century, Prussian administrations had recognized in German nationalism a powerful solvent to the dynastic principle. Yet by the turn of the century, the ascendancy of the national paradigm was incontestable. Nationalist historians busied themselves rewriting the history of Prussia as the eastward expansion of Germanic dominion. And Chancellor Bernhard von Bülow, a Mecklenburger, not a native Prussian, did not scruple to stand before the Prussian Landtag and justify anti-Polish measures on the grounds that Prussia was, and always would be, a German national state. The Prussian Jews also felt the impact of these developments. There was, of course, no question in the Jewish case of forcing the pace of cultural assimilation, a goal the great majority of Prussian Jews had already enthusiastically embraced, or of repressing ambitions for secession or political independence. What mattered most to the Jewish communities of 19th century Germany was the removal of their ancient legal disabilities. This had already been achieved on the eve of political unification. The confederal law, valid throughout the North German Confederation of the 3rd of July, 1869, explicitly stated that all curtailments of civil and citizenship rights that derived from differences of creed were henceforth abolished. It seemed that the long journey to legal emancipation that had begun with the Hardenberg Edict of March 1812 was at last complete. One important doubt remained. The Prussian government continued to discriminate against Jewish applicants to public office. Jews found it extremely difficult to achieve promotion into the upper ranks of the judiciary, for example, despite the disproportionate presence of Jews among lawyers, court clerks, and assistant judges, and the strong performance of Jewish candidates in the key state examinations. The same applied to most branches of the senior civil service, as well as other important state-funded institutions of cultural significance such as primary schools and secondary gymnasium and the universities. Between 1885 and the outbreak of the First World War, moreover, no Jew was promoted to reserve officer status in Prussia, nor in the other German states whose military contingents were subordinate to the Prussian army. Bavaria retained a measure of military autonomy and operated a more open promotions policy. This discrimination by the state authority was all the more conspicuous for the fact that it represented something of an anomaly within the Prussian political landscape. Jews had no difficulty in being elected to important political and administrative posts in many large Prussian cities, where, as high taxpayers, 
they benefited from restrictive franchises. Jews held a substantial proportion, as many as a quarter, of council seats in the city of Breslau, and could hold any position in the city administration except those of mayor and deputy, which were in the gift of the central state authorities in Berlin. In Königsberg, Jewish residents flourished in an urban environment, marked by easy intercommunal relations and cultural pluralism. In many of the larger Prussian cities, Jews became core constituents of the urban burgertum, participating fully in its political and cultural life. The inequitable handling of appointments in the state sector generated a deep sense of grievance among politically aware and active Jews in Prussia. The process of emancipation had always been intimately bound up with the state. To be emancipated was to enter into the life of the state, as Christian Wilhelm von Dohm had put it in his influential tract of 1781. Moreover, the constitutional position was clear. Imperial law stipulated that any discrimination on faith grounds was illegal. The Prussian constitution stated, Article 12, that all Prussians were equal before the law and Article 4, the public offices were equally accessible to all equally qualified persons. Only in the case of public offices involving religious observance was it admissible to favor Christian candidates. The surest way for the Christian minority to safeguard its rights was thus to hold the state authority to the letter and spirit of its own law. Pressed by left liberal parliamentary deputies to give an account of themselves, Prussian ministers either denied that any such discrimination took place or sought to justify it. They argued, for example, that the government must take into account the mood of the population when making sensitive public appointments. In a land tag debate over judicial appointments in 1901, the Prussian Minister of Justice, Karl Heinrich von Schoenstedt, declared that he could not, when appointing notaries, simply treat Jewish advocates on the same basis as Christian ones, since the broader strata of the population are not willing to have their own affairs managed by Jewish notaries. The Prussian Minister of War, von Heeringen, made a veiled appeal to the same logic when he replied to a Reichstag inquiry of February 1910 concerning the exclusion of Jewish volunteers from reserve officer promotions. In appointing a commanding officer, he declared, the army must look to more than simply ability, knowledge, and character. Other imponderable factors were also in play. The entire personality of the man concerned, the way he stands in front of the troops, must inspire respect. Now be it far from me to claim that this is missing in our Jewish fellow citizens. But on the other hand, we cannot deny that a different view prevails among the lower orders. The readiness to accommodate public opinion also left its mark in other areas. In the early 1880s, for example, the Prussian Ministry of the Interior intervened in support of anti-Semitic student associations, undercutting the predominantly liberal university administrations that were trying to suppress them. At around the same time, the Prussian administration also began to tighten its policy on the naturalization of foreign Jews. This was the background to the extraordinary expulsion of over 30,000 non-naturalized Poles and Jews in 1885. Under pressure from anti-Semitic agitation and petitions, the Prussian government even began during the 1890s to prevent Jewish citizens from adopting Christian family names. Anti-Semites objected to Jewish name-changing on the racist grounds that it created confusion about who was Jewish and who was not. The Prussian state authorities, especially the conservative minister of the interior, Borto von Eulenborg, adopted the anti-Semitic viewpoint, departing from established policy to discriminate specifically against Jewish applicants. The same logic was at work in the Jew Count, Juden Salem, ordered by the Prussian Ministry of War in October 1916, with a view to establishing how many Jews were in active service on the front line. National anti-Semitic organizations such as the Reichshammerbund, founded in 1912, had long been propagating the claim that the German Jews were war profiters who were not pulling their weight in the defense of the fatherland. From the outbreak of the war, and particularly from the end of 1915, they bombarded the Prussian Ministry of War with anonymous denunciations and complaints. Having for some time disregarded these protests, the Prussian Minister of War, Wild von Hohenborn, decided to mount a statistical survey of Jews in the armed forces. In a decree of the 11th of October, 1916, announcing the survey, the minister referred to allegations that the majority of Jewish servicemen had managed to avoid combat by securing posts well behind the front line. 
Although the results confirmed that Jews were in fact well represented in frontline units, the decree dismayed Jewish contemporaries, especially those whose relatives or comrades were at that moment fighting in the German trenches. It was, as one Jewish writer recalled at the end of the war, the most indelibly shameful insult that has dishonored our community since its emancipation. There were, of course, limits to the state's tolerance of anti-Semitism. In 1900, an anti-Jewish riot broke out in the West Prussian town of Kunitz, after the discovery of a macabrely dismembered corpse near the house of a Jewish butcher. Anti-Semitic journalists, mainly from Berlin, lost no time in leveling charges of ritual murder against the butcher, and they were followed in this by a number of credulous townsfolk, most of them Poles. However, none of the Prussian judges or investigating police involved in the case ever placed any credence in the allegation and the authorities lost no time in suppressing the unrest and punishing the main offenders. Emancipation was treated as an accomplished fact by official Prussia, and no serious attention was ever given to the idea, much urged by the anti-Semites, of returning to the era of legal discrimination. Jews continued to play prominent roles in Prussian public life, as parliamentarians, journalists, entrepreneurs, theatre directors, municipal officials, as personal associates of the emperor and even as ministers and members of the upper house of the Prussian land tag. Yet the Jews were surely right to view with alarm the state's reluctance to enforce more energetically the letter of the constitution. It was one thing for the traditional Protestant agrarian oligarchies to cling to their accustomed share of governmental patronage, which of course they did. It was another, somewhat more ominous thing for the state authorities to invoke the mood of the population as grounds for departing from constitutional practice, or the principle of equitable administration. In doing so, they allowed the anti-Semites to set the terms of the debate. There was irony here, because whereas the Jews were among the foremost friends of the state, the anti-Semites were without question among its most implacable enemies. For them, the very word state possessed connotations of artificiality, a machine-like impersonality in contrast to the organic, natural attributes associated with the folk. The only acceptable form of state organization was that which demoted the apparatus of the state to an instrument for the self-empowerment of the folk, an ethnic, not a political entity. Herein lies the parallel with Polish policy. Poles and Jews were fundamentally different social groups in almost every conceivable way, but they both presented the conservative elites that ran Prussia with policy domains in which the political logic of the modern state, conceived as a zone of indifferentiated legal authority, conflicted with the ethnic logic of the nation. In both cases, it was the idea of the Prussian state that gave way and the ideology of the German nation that prevailed. Prussian King and German Kaiser The creation of the German Empire confronted the Hohenzollern dynasty with a complex task of adjustment. The King of Prussia was now also the German Kaiser. What exactly this would mean in practice remained unclear during the early years after unification. The new German constitution had little to say about the role of the Kaiser. The liberal nationalist Frankfurt constitution of 1848 had included a section entitled The Head of the Reich which dealt exclusively with the imperial office. There was no such section in the German constitution of 1871. The powers of the emperor were set out in section 4, under the modest rubric, the presidency of the federal council. These and other passages in the document made it clear that the Kaiser was no more than one German prince among others, a primus inter pares, whose powers derived from his special place within the federal body, rather than from any claim to direct dominion over the territory of the Reich. It followed that his official designation was not Emperor of Germany, as Kaiser Wilhelm I would personally have preferred, but German Emperor. There were distant echoes here of the limited sovereignty applied in the 18th century title King in Prussia. Then as now, allowance had to be made for the other sovereigns whose sphere of authority overlapped with that of the new office. In the relationship between Chancellor and Emperor King, it was generally Bismarck who had the upper hand. William I did assert himself on occasions, and he was no shadow figure, but he could generally be pressed, bullied, blackmailed or cajoled into agreement with Bismarck on matters of importance. William I had not wanted the war against Austria, 
and he disapproved of the Chancellor's political campaign against the Catholics. When there were disagreements, Bismarck could unleash the full force of his personality, hammering his arguments home with tears, rages, and threats of resignation. It was these scenes, which the Kaiser found almost intolerable, that moved him to make the famous observation, It is hard being emperor under Bismarck. There was no false modesty in the emperor's observation, on another occasion, that he is more important than I. The effect of Bismarck's dominance, both as a political manager and as a national figurehead, was to retard the expansion of the Prussian throne into his imperial role. William I was a hugely respectable and widely revered man, a figure with the gravitas and whiskers of a biblical patriarch. But he was in his seventies when the Reich was proclaimed and essentially remained a Prussian king until his death at the age of ninety in 1888. He rarely spoke in public, and seldom journeyed outside the territory of his kingdom. He retained the thrifty habits of an East Elbian Junker. He resisted the installation of hot water baths in the Berlin Palace, on the grounds of cost, for example, preferring to bathe once a week in a watertight leather bag, slung from a frame that had to be carted over from a nearby hotel. He marked the labels on liquor bottles to prevent tippling on the slide by the servants at court. Old uniforms were made to do long service. After signing state papers, William would wipe the wet nib of his pen on the dark blue sleeve of his jacket. He made a point of his chewing carriages with rubber tyres on the grounds that they were an unnecessary luxury. There was an element of self-conscious performance in all of this. The king aspired to be the personification of Prussian simplicity, self-discipline and thrift. Every day he would appear punctually at the corner window of his study to oversee the changing of the guard. This reinvention of an old Prussian tradition became one of the great tourist attractions of Berlin. William I's son and successor, Friedrich III, was a charismatic man, with strong ties to the German liberal movement. He was also respected for the important command role he had played in the wars of unification. Given the chance, he might well have become a genuinely national imperial monarch, but by the time Friedrich came to the throne in March 1888, he was already dying of throat cancer and had only three months to live. He remained bedridden for much of his reign, reduced by his condition to communicating in scribbled notes with his family and staff. In 1888 then, when William II came to the throne, the office of emperor was like a house in which most of the rooms had never been occupied. His arrival inaugurated a style revolution and the management of the German imperial monarchy. From the very beginning, William II saw himself as a public figure. He was fastidiously attentive to his outward appearance, rapidly alternating uniforms and outfits to match specific occasions, training his famous moustaches to trembling stiffness with a special patented wax and affecting a grave official countenance during public ceremonies. The obsession with outward presentation extended to close management of the empress. The former Princess Augusta Victoria of Schleswig-Holstein, Sonderburg, Augustenburg, William not only provided designs for her clothes, her distinctive jewels and extravagant hats, but also pressured her to maintain her hourglass waist by means of dieting, drugs and corsetry. He was the first German monarch to live and work in close proximity, one might say even symbiosis, with photographers and cameramen. They filmed him during public appearances and on family occasions. They filmed him on manoeuvres and riding to the hunt. They even followed him onto the royal yacht. Contemporary films of this Kaiser, of which there are many, show him always surrounded by the winding cranks of the movie cameras. William II was, in other words, a media monarch, perhaps the first European monarch truly to deserve this epithet. More than any of his predecessors, or indeed than any of his contemporary colleagues, he courted the attention of the public. The aim was not simply to draw attention to himself, though there is no doubt that this emperor was a deeply narcissistic individual but to fulfill the national and imperial promise of his office. He promoted the German navy, the genuinely national alternative to the Prussian-dominated army, lending his support to fundraising campaigns and presiding at the massive naval reviews that were held annually at Kiel. He attempted, with mixed results, to establish a national cult around the figure of his grandfather, William the Great, the founder of the empire. He travelled across the empire, opening hospitals, christening ships, visiting factories and observing parades, and most of all, he gave speeches. 
No Hohenzollern monarch had ever spoken as often and as directly to so many large gatherings of his subjects as William II. He treated the Germans to a virtually uninterrupted flow of public utterances. During the six-year period from January 1897 until December 1902, for example, he made at least 233 visits to at least 123 German towns and cities, in most of which he gave addresses that were subsequently published and discussed in the regional and national press. William's speeches, at least until 1908, were not set pieces prepared for him by professional writers. The men of the civil cabinet busied themselves researching and writing up texts for specific places and occasions, sometimes pasting a final printed version to a wooden reading board that was passed to the emperor when the moment arrived, but their work was largely in vain. William preferred to speak without assistance. By contrast with his father, who as crown prince had always written out his texts beforehand and then changed them over and over again, William only rarely prepared his speeches in advance. They were consciously performed as impromptu, unmediated acts of communication. The Kaiser's most flamboyant performances were like 19th century history paintings, charged with heavy-handed symbolic imagery, in which tempests alternated with shafts of redeeming light, where all about was dark and sublime figures, often members of his own dynasty, floated above the petty conflicts of the day. The aim was to charismatize the monarchy and evoke the kind of transcendent sovereign vantage point from which an emperor should reign over his people. A central theme was the historical continuity of the Hohenzollern dynasty and its Prusso-German mission. There was an emphasis on the imperial monarchy as the ultimate guarantor of the unity of the empire, the point at which historical, confessional and economic oppositions may be reconciled. Lastly, the providential dimension of monarchy was a light motif that ran through all the speeches of his reign. God had established him in this exalted office in the order to fulfill God's plan for the German nation. During a very characteristic address delivered in the Rathaus at Mimo in September 1907, he urged his audience to remember that the hand of divine providence was at work in the great historical achievements of the German people and if our Lord God did not have in store for us some great destiny in the world, then he wouldn't have bestowed such magnificent traits and abilities upon our people. The public resonance of William's speeches was mixed. One central difficulty was that the people who heard his words and those who read them were not the same people. Live audiences were easily impressed, but words that seemed appropriate or even rousing before a rustical assembly of Junkers in Brandenburg might appear less so when they appeared in the broadsheets of Munich and Stuttgart. Early in 1891, William told a gathering of Rhenish industrialists in Dusseldorf that the Reich has but one leader, and I am he. The remark was intended as a stab at Bismarck, who had begun after his retirement to snipe at the Kaiser in the press, and was known to be popular among Rhenish industrial circles. But it also caused unintended offence to those in non-Prussian Germany, who saw it as a slight to the federal princes. After all, they too were rulers in the Reich. The fact was that William II's public office was an awkward composite of distinct identities. When he spoke each year to the annual dinner of the Brandenburg Diet, an occasion he was especially fond of, he was in the habit of styling himself Margrave in order to invoke the unique historical ties between his dynasty and its home province. It was a harmless, if somewhat self-dramatizing gesture that went down well with the conservative backwoodsmen of the Brandenburg Diet, but it was a deeply unpalatable fare to the South Germans, who poured over published texts of such speeches in the daily press on the following day. The Emperor's close friend and adviser, Philipp zu Eulenburg, who was posted as the Prussian envoy in Munich, explained the problem in a letter of March 1892. The great eloquence and the manner and style of Your Majesty exert a captivating influence upon listeners and audience as the mood among the Brandenburgers after Your Majesty's speech has once again proven. But in the hands of the German professor, a cool assessment of the content gives a different picture. Here in Bavaria, people are beside themselves when Your Majesty speaks as Margrave, and the Margrave's words are printed in the Reichsanzeiger, Imperial Gazette, as words, so to speak, of the Emperor. In the Imperial Gazette, members of the Empire expect to hear Imperial words. They don't care for Frederick the Great who referred to Bavaria as they know only too well as a paradise uninhabited by animals and so forth. 
and they don't care for Rosbach and Leuten. The relationship between the imperial crown and the Bavarian state was a persistent source of tension. In November 1891, during a visit to Munich, William II was asked to make an entry in the official visitor's book of the city. For reasons that remain unclear, he chose to inscribe the text Suprema Lex Regis Voluntas, the will of the king is the highest law. The choice of citation may well have been linked with a conversation the Kaiser was having at the time when he was asked to sign the book, but it soon acquired an unexpected notoriety. Once again, it was Eulenborg who pointed out the blunder. It is not for me to ask why your majesty wrote these words, but I would be committing a cowardly injustice if I did not write of the ill effects that this text has had in South Germany, where your majesty has stationed me to keep watch. People here discern in it the assertion of a kind of personal imperial will over and above the Bavarian will. All parties, without exception, were offended by the words of your majesty, and the remark seemed perfectly made to be exploited against your majesty in the most disgraceful way. When South German cartoonists sought to disparage the Kaiser's imperial pretensions, they almost invariably did so by drawing him as an emphatically and incorrigibly Prussian figure. A wonderful drawing for Simplicissimus of 1909 by the Munich-based cartoonist Olaf Gulbranson shows William II in conversation with the Bavarian regent at the annual imperial manoeuvres. The setting was in itself charged with significance because the relationship between the Prussian imperial and the Bavarian army was a highly sensitive issue in Munich. The caption reads, His Majesty explains enemy positions to Prince Ludwig of Bavaria. The stereotypical Prusso-Bavarian contrasts are exquisitely captured in the postures and clothing of the two figures. While William stands ramrod straight in his immaculate uniform and spiked helmet, in cavalry boots that gleam like columns of polished ebony, Prince Ludwig resembles a human beanbag. Loose trousers crumple shapelessly down his legs, and a whiskery face peers bewilderedly from behind a pince nez. Everything that is erect and dominant in the Prussian is cosily flaccid in the Bavarian. William II was, it must be said, singularly ill-suited to the communicative tasks of his office. He found it impossible to express himself in the sober, measured diction that the politically informed public clearly expected of him. The texts of his speeches made easy targets for ridicule. They appeared excessive, pompous, megalomaniacal. They overshot the target, as one senior government figure observed. Images and phrases from his speeches were often picked up and turned against him in the satirical press. Neither William I nor Bismarck had ever been ridiculed with such intensity, though closer parallels can be found in contraband depictions of Friedrich William IV around the time of the 1848 revolutions. The legal sanctions against Les Majeste, such as the confiscation of journal numbers or the prosecution and imprisonment of authors and editors, were extensively applied but they were counterproductive, since they generally had the effect of boosting circulation figures and transforming persecuted journalists into national celebrities. Efforts to control the form in which the emperor's remarks reached the broader public proved futile. William II travelled so frequently and spoke in such a great variety of places and contexts that it was virtually impossible to control the diffusion of information about his utterances. The Kaiser's infamous Hun speech in Bremerhaven on the 27th of July, 1900, was a case in point. On this occasion, ugly sound bites from a tasteless, improvised speech to troops preparing to embark for China made it into print despite the best efforts of the officials present, stirring uproar in press and parliament. The Kaiser, like many a modern celebrity, had learned how to court, but not how to control the media. The imperial office lacked, as we have seen, a secure foundation in the German constitution. It also lacked a political tradition. There was, more strikingly, no imperial coronation. William II recognized this deficit. He saw more clearly than his predecessors how completely the Prussian crown had failed to establish itself as a point of reference in the public life of the German Empire. He came to the throne determined to fill out the imperial dimension of his office. He traveled constantly among the German states. He glorified his grandfather as the warrior saint who had built a new dwelling for the German people, 
and he instigated new public holidays and memorial observances to shroud, as it were, the constitutional and cultural nakedness of the Prussian throne in the mantle of a national history. He projected himself to the German public as the personification of the imperial idea. In this unceasing effort to create the imperial crown as a political and symbolic reality in the minds of the Germans, the speeches played a crucial role. They were instruments of rhetorical mobilization that secured for the Kaiser King a unique prominence in the German public life. For William personally, they offered compensation for the situation of political constraint and disempowerment in which he so often found himself. Indeed they were, as Walter Rattenau, author of one of the most insightful reflections on this monarch, observed in 1919, the single most effective instrument of his imperial sovereignty. How successful William was in achieving his objective is another question. On the one hand, the more striking indiscretions provoked ways of hostile published comment, as the most visible or audible signs of the sovereign's independence. They became the primary focal point for the political critique of personal rule. Over the longer term, their effect was a gradual erosion of the political status of pronouncements from the throne. It became increasingly common, especially after 1908, for the government to disassociate itself entirely from unwelcome speeches, on the grounds that these were not binding programmatic utterances, but simply personal expressions of opinion by the monarch. A disclaimer implying that the political views of the emperor were of no wider political consequence. As the Viennese correspondent of the Frankfurter Zeitung observed in 1910, a comparison between William II and Emperor Francis Josef of Austria-Hungary revealed how counterproductive was William's overuse of the public word. The Habsburg dynast, it was noted, was a silent emperor, who always distinguished between his private person and his public office, and never used the public forum to make personal utterances of any kind. And yet, anyone who tries in Austria to talk about their emperor, as we hear ours, discussed at every table in Germany, will soon be in serious trouble. It is, on the other hand, notoriously difficult to get the measure of public opinion, and we should be wary of any judgment that relies exclusively on newspaper commentaries. Published opinion and public opinion are not the same thing. The emperor may have lost the aura of the sovereign who is above criticism, wrote one foreign observer in the autumn of 1908, when William II was engulfed in a scandal over tactless utterances published in the London Daily Telegraph. But with all the personal magnetism that he possesses, he will always retain an immense ascendancy in the eyes of the mass of his subjects. William's invocations of divine providence were the laughing stock of the quality papers, but they struck a sympathetic chord with the more plebeian theological tastes of many humbler Germans. By the same token, his outspoken denunciations of avant-garde art appeared ludicrous and retrograde to the cultural intelligentsia, but made more sense to those more numerous cultural consumers who believe that art ought to provide escapism and edification. In Bavaria, the ceremonies of the imperial cult, parades, unveilings, and the jubilee celebrations of 1913, attracted the mass attendance not only of the middle classes, but also of peasants and tradesmen. Even within the social democratic milieu of the industrial regions, there appears to have been a gulf between the critical perspective of the SPD elite and that of the mass of SPD supporters, among whom the emperor was perceived as the embodiment of a patriarchal, providential principle. The conversations recorded by police informers in the taverns of Hamburg's working-class districts registered some disparaging, but also many supportive and even affectionate comments about our William. Substantial, if not precisely quantifiable, reserves of imperial royalist capital did accumulate in German society. It would take the social transformation and political upheavals of a world war to consume them. Soldiers and Civilians On the 16th of October, 1906, a down-and-out drifter by the name of Friedrich Wilhelm Fucht pulled off an extraordinary heist in Berlin. Fucht had spent much of his life in prison. Having left school at the age of 14 following a conviction for theft, he had taken an apprenticeship with his father, a cobbler in Tilsit, on the eastern margins of the Prussian state. Between 1864 and 1891, he was convicted on six occasions for theft, robbery and forgery, for which he spent a total of 29 years behind bars. In February 1906, 
after serving a 15-year sentence for robbery, he was a free man once again. Having been refused a residence permit by the Berlin police authorities, he settled illegally in a tenement near the Schlesische Bahnhof railway station, where he found a place as a night lodger, sleeping in a bed that was occupied during the daylight hours by a factory worker on night shift. During the second week of October 1906, Fuchs assembled the uniform of a captain of the 1st Foot Guards Regiment from garments and equipment purchased in second-hand shops across Potsdam and Berlin. On the morning of the 16th of October, he collected his uniform from where he had deposited it in the left luggage store at Boiselstrasse Station and walked to the Jungfernheide Park to change clothes. Attired as a Prussian captain, he headed downtown by S-Bahn. At around midday, when the guards were changing across the city, Fucht stopped a detachment of four soldiers and a non-commissioned officer, who were on their way back to barracks from doing guard duty at the military swimming baths on Plutzensee. The NCO ordered his men to stand to attention, while Fucht informed them that he was taking command under the authority of a cabinet order from the king. Having dismissed the NCO, Fucht collected a further six guardsmen returning from duty at a nearby rifle range, and led his troops to Putlistrasse Station, where they all caught a train to Kupernik. On the way, he treated them to beer from a station kiosk. Arriving at the council chambers, Fucht placed guards at the main entrances and made his way with some troops to a suite of administrative offices, where he ordered the arrest of the senior city secretary, Rosenkrantz, and the mayor, Dr. Georg Langerhans. Langerhans, who was himself a lieutenant in the reserve, leapt to his feet at the sight of Fucht's epaulets and made no attempt to resist when he was told he was to be escorted under guard to Berlin. The council police inspector was found snoring in his office. It was a warm autumn afternoon in this quiet suburban district, and Fucht treated him to a stern reprimand. The municipal cashier, von Wildberg, was ordered to open the cash boxes and transfer the entire contents, 4,000 marks and 70 fennec, to Fucht, who presented him with a receipt for the sequestered sum. Fucht ordered a detachment of his guards to escort the arrested officials to Berlin by rail and report to the military post at Neue Wacke in Unter den Linden. Minutes later, he was seen leaving the building in the direction of Kopernik Station, where he disappeared from view. He later revealed that he spent the next hour getting back to Berlin, shedding his military clothes and settling himself in a city cafe with a view of the Neue Wacke. From here, he was able to watch the confusion unfold as the guards arrived with their bewildered prisoners. On the 1st of December, 1906, after spending six weeks at large, he was arrested and sentenced to four years of imprisonment. Fuchs' exploit generated huge contemporary interest. Within days, it was being lampooned on the stage of the Metropole Theater. There was extensive international press coverage. The story of the conman in captain's uniform, who walked away with the Kupernik Council cash box under his arm, soon established itself as one of the most beloved and enduring fables of modern Prussia. It was dramatized for the stage in numerous versions, the most famous being Karl Zuckermeyer's wonderful Hauptmann von Köpenick of 1931, and later adapted for the screen in a sparkling and atmospheric film starring the amiable Heinz Ruhmann in the eponymous role. Among those who profited from the story's popularity was the perpetrator himself. Fucht was freed from Tegel prison after serving less than half of his sentence, thanks to a royal pardon from William II. Within four days of his release, he was making public appearances in the Passagen Panopticum, a gallery of urban amusements on the corner of Friedrich and Bierenstrasse, in the center of Berlin. Having been forbidden to make further such appearances by the Prussian authorities, he mounted a highly successful tour to Dresden, Vienna, and Budapest, where he was already a celebrity. Over the next two years, Fucht appeared in nightclubs and restaurants and at fairs, where he retold his story and signed postcards bearing his photograph as the captain of Kupernik. In 1910, there were further tours in Germany, Britain, America, and Canada. Such was his notoriety that he was modelled in wax for Madame Tussauds Gallery in London. From the sales of his memoirs, How I Became the Captain of Kupernik, published in Leipzig in 1909, Fucht acquired sufficient means to purchase a house in Luxembourg, where he settled permanently in 1910. He remained in Luxembourg throughout the First World War and died in 1922. At one level, of course, this was a parable about the power of a Prussian uniform. Fucht himself was an unimpressive figure, 
whose appearance bore all the marks of a life spent in poverty and confinement. A police report based on witness accounts described the hoaxer as thin, pale, elderly, stooped, bent sideways, and bow-legged. It was, as one journalist remarked, the uniform, rather than its weather-beaten inhabitant, that carried off the crime. Seen in this light, Fuchs' tale evokes a social setting marked by a servile respect for military authority. This message was not lost on contemporaries. French journalists saw in it further evidence of the blind and mechanical obedience for which the Prussians were famed. The Times commented smugly that this was the kind of thing that could happen only in Germany. By this reading, the captain's story was a concentrated expose of Prussia's militarism. But the fascination of the episode surely lies in its ambivalence. Fuchs's exploit began with obedience, but it ended with laughter. No sooner had he walked off with the cash, but his crime was a media event. The papers in and around Berlin described it as an unheard-of trickster's exploit, a robber's tale as adventurous and romantic as any novel, and conceded that it was impossible to reflect on it without smiling. Fucht was described as cheeky, brazen, clever, and ingenious. The Social Democrat newspaper, Vorwärts, reported that the hero's deed was the talk of the town. In restaurants, in the streetcars and trains, the heroic exploit was discussed. It's not that one expresses indignation over the robbery of the Kubernik municipal treasury. Instead, the tone is mocking, sarcastic. Everywhere, a certain gleefulness over the ingenious prank at Kubernik refuses to be suppressed. Quick-witted entrepreneurs published mass-produced sympathy postcards with before and after descriptions of Fucht as cobbler and captain. Purchasers were informed that a portion of the income generated by their sale would go to a local society for the care of prisoners, or even to Fucht himself. It was precisely the comedic, subversive element of the story that Fucht so skillfully exploited in his memoirs and theatrical performances. As a media event, the captain's exploit was nothing short of a disaster for the Prussian military. It was, as the socialist journalist and historian Franz Mehring put it, a second Jena. The roots of this laughter are not difficult to discern. The bus of the joke was Prussian militarism. But what exactly did this term mean? The word first passed into general circulation as a liberal anti-absolutist slogan during the constitutional struggle of the early 1860s and it never lost these liberal connotations. In the South German states, the term militarism was widely used in the late 1860s, almost always with an anti-Prussian charge. Militarism meant the Prussian system of universal conscription, as opposed to the arrangements still operating in the South, where wealthy subjects could purchase exemption from service, or the payment of matricular contributions for the upkeep of the National Army or the assertion, more generally, of Prussian hegemony over the southern states. For left liberals, militarism could mean high taxes and potentially unchecked state expenditure. For some national liberals, anti-militarism captured echoes of the militia's romanticism that had driven the reforms of the Napoleonic era. For the Marxist analysts of the social democratic movement, militarism was an expression of the violence and repression latent in capitalism. Precisely because it channeled and focused multiple preoccupations in changing combinations, militarism became one of the foremost semantic rallying points in modern German political culture. In whatever sense it was used, it drew attention to the structural connections between the military and the wider social and political system in which it was embedded. The army was without a doubt one of the central institutions of Prussian life after 1871. Its presence was felt in everyday life to an extent that would be unimaginable today. The army, whose public standing had been low for much of the 19th century, emerged from the wars of unification in a nimbus of glory. Its role in the foundation of the new Germany was commemorated throughout the imperial era in the annual Sedan Day festivals that recalled the victory over France. The military establishment acquired a new kind of public resonance. Its prestige found expression in the imposing buildings that sprang up in garrison towns to accommodate serving troops and regimental administrations. There was an elaborate culture of military display in the form of parades, marching bands and maneuvers. 
military men took pride of place in virtually every official public festivity. And the proliferation of military imagery and symbols infiltrated the sphere of private life. The photographs in uniform was a prized possession, especially for recruits from poor rural families, where photographs were still a costly rarity. The uniform was worn with pride, even on holiday. Military insignia and medals were treasured as mementos of deceased male relatives. The Prussian Reserve Officer Commissions, there were some 120,000 by 1914, were a hotly sought-after status symbol in bourgeois society, hence the efforts of former Jewish volunteers to secure access to the corps. Schoolchildren in garrison towns sang martial songs and marched in their playgrounds, Huge numbers of former servicemen joined the rapidly growing veterans' associations and military clubs. By 1913, the Kufhäuser League, the central organization of veterans' clubs in Germany, counted some 2.9 million members. In other words, the military wove itself more deeply into the fabric of everyday life after 1871. Assessing the precise significance of this fact is far from straightforward. According to one influential view, the militarization of Prussian imperial society widened the gap between Germany and the Western European states, stifling the critical and liberal energies of civil society, perpetuating a hierarchical approach to social relations, and inculcating millions of Germans with political views that were reactionary, chauvinistic, and ultra-nationalistic. But was the Prussian experience really so unusual? Prussia was not alone in seeing an expansion of military cultures during the last four decades before the First World War. In France, too, veterans and servicemen flocked to join military clubs and associations, in numbers comparable with Prussia, Germany. A comparison of the militarization of national commemorations in France and Prussia, Germany, after 1871, reveals close parallels. Even in Britain, a predominantly naval power that prided itself on the emphatically civilian quality of its political culture, the National Service League attracted some 100,000 members, including 177 members of the House of Commons. The League's propaganda combined a paranoid perspective on questions of national security with racist presumptions about the superiority of the British race. In Britain, as in Germany, the late Victorian era saw a massive unfolding of imperial ceremonial. The civility and anti-militarism of British society were perhaps more a matter of self-perception than a faithful representation of reality. It is also worth noting that the German peace movement developed on a scale unparalleled elsewhere. On Sunday the 20th of August 1911, 100,000 people gathered at a peace rally in Berlin to protest against the brinkmanship of the great powers over the Moroccan crisis. There was a wave of similar protests in Halle, Elberfeld, Barmen, Jena, Essen, and other German towns throughout the late summer, culminating in a mammoth peace rally in Berlin on the 3rd of September, when 250,000 people thronged to the Treptow Park. The movement subsided somewhat in 1912-13, to but at the end of July 1914, when war was clearly imminent, there were once again large peace rallies in Dusseldorf and Berlin. The response of the German public to the news of war was not, as used to be claimed, one of universal enthusiasm. On the contrary, the mood in the early days of August 1914 was muted, ambivalent, and in some places, fearful. Militarism was, moreover, a diffuse and internally fissured phenomenon. A distinction has to be drawn between the essentially aristocratic and conservative ethos of the Prussian officer corps, and the very different identities and attachments involved in the militarism of the little people. The legendary corporate arrogance of the Prussian officer caste and its disdain for civilian values and norms were essentially a distillation of the old spirit of East Elbian noble corporate exclusiveness, admixed with the defensiveness and paranoia of a social group determined not to relinquish its traditional preeminence. By contrast, the ethos of many veterans' clubs was plebeian and egalitarian. A study of soldiers from the annexed Prussian provinces of Hessen-Nassau, who joined military clubs over the period 1871 to 1914, has shown that many of these were landless rural laborers, craftsmen, and poor smallholders. They did not join out of enthusiasm for military service, but because membership provided a way of asserting their value, status, and entitlements vis-a-vis -vis the self-sufficient large-holding peasants who dominated their communities. 
Membership of the Veterans Club was thus a vehicle of participation. Viewed from below, what mattered about the military was not the imposition of deference between ranks, but the equality among men who served together. It was, in any case, the German Navy, rather than the Prussian Army, that captured popular enthusiasm for German national aggrandizement. Through his promotion of a massive naval construction program from the late 1890s, Kaiser Wilhelm II made his bid to establish himself as a genuinely national and German imperial ruler. The German naval program soon attracted huge public support. By 1914, the German fleet association, Deutsche Flottenverein, counted over one million members, the great majority of the middle and lower middle class. The navy was perceived as a genuinely national service, free of particularist territorial ties, with a relatively meritocratic approach to recruitment and promotions. The wave of technological innovations that transformed fleet building around the turn of the century also attracted interest. Ships were exciting because they were the cutting edge of what German science and industry could achieve. The fleet also carried the promise of a more expansive German global policy under the banner of Weltpolitik. The army, by contrast, bore the burden of its association with the particularist power structure of Prussia. The most radical, popular militarist organization of the pre-war years, the Defense Club, Wehrverein, whose membership numbered around 100,000 by the summer of 1914, was actually highly critical of the conservative militarism of the Prussian elite, which they saw as reactionary, lethargic, narrow-minded, and crippled by otiose class distinctions. They had a point. Until 1913, parts of the Prussian military command opposed army expansion on the grounds that this would dilute the aristocratic esprit de corps of the officer caste by flooding the upper ranks with middle-class aspirants. Army and State The failure to integrate authority over civilian and military affairs had been one of the defining flaws of the Prussian constitution of 1848-50. The 1848 revolutions, as we have seen, constitutionalized Prussian politics without demilitarizing the Prussian monarchy. This was a flaw that the new German Empire inherited from the old Prussian state. The question of control over military spending remained unresolved. The Constitution of 1871 stipulated on one hand, Article 63, that the Emperor determines the effective strength, the division and the arrangement of the contingents of the Reich army and on the other, Article 60, that the effective strength of the army in peace will be determined by legislation of the Reichstag. The indeterminacy of these arrangements gave rise to periodic conflicts between the executive and the legislature. Of the four Reichstag dissolutions decreed during the life of the empire, 1878, 1887, 1893, 1907, three occurred for reasons related to the control of military expenditure. The Prussian army remained a Praetorian guard under the personal command of the king, largely shielded from parliamentary scrutiny. The executive organs of the German military in turn remained embedded in the sovereign institutes of the old Prussian state. There was, for example, no imperial minister of war, just a Prussian one with responsibility for imperial military affairs. The Prussian minister of war was appointed by the emperor, in his capacity as king of Prussia, and swore an oath of loyalty to the Prussian, but not the imperial, constitution. He was responsible to the Kaiser in most matters, but answerable in budgetary questions to the Reichstag. Yet he appeared before this body not as a Prussian minister of war, for this post was formerly quite unconnected with the imperial legislature, but in his complementary role as a Prussian plenipotentiary to the Federal Council. As for the organs that administered the army in peacetime and at war, these were completely independent from the structures of civil authority. The military cabinet, the body responsible for personal decisions, appointments and promotions, formally separated itself from the Prussian Ministry of War in 1883, as did the great general staff, which was entrusted in the event of war with overall control of the operations of the field army. Both henceforth reported directly to the monarch himself. Rather than establishing authoritative organs of central military governance, William II further fragmented the command structure by creating, just a few weeks after his accession, a new military establishment known by the grand delinquent title Headquarters of His Majesty the Kaiser and King. 
He also stepped up the number of military and naval command posts that reported directly to the emperor. This was all part of a conscious strategy to create an environment that would permit the untrammeled exercise of the monarchical command function. The Prussian-German military system thus remained a foreign body within the German constitution, institutionally sealed off from the organs of civil governance, and ultimately responsible only to the emperor himself who came to be known from around 1900 in general parlance as the Supreme Warlord. The result was a perennial uncertainty about the demarcation between civil and military authority. This was Prussia's most fateful legacy to the new Germany. Nowhere before 1914 were the potentialities of this avoided decision at the heart of the empire's political fabric more disturbingly revealed than in the war of 1904-7. The German South West Africa, modern Namibia, where an insurrection broke out in January 1904. By the middle of the month, groups of armed Herero had encircled Okahanja, a township in the centre west of the colony, plundering farms and police stations, killing a number of settlers, and cutting the telegraph and railway links to Windhoek, the administrative capital. The man charged with maintaining order in the colony was Governor Theodor Gotthilf von Leutwein, a native of Strumpfelbronn in the Grand Duchy of Baden, who had been a serving soldier in the colony since 1893 and had held the post of governor since 1898. Finding himself unable to contain the uprising with a small local militia, there were fewer than 800 troops in a colony one and a half times the size of the German Empire. Leutwein requested that reinforcements be sent urgently from Berlin and that an experienced commander be dispatched to take control of military operations. The Kaiser responded by sending Lieutenant General Luther von Truter, descendant of a Prussian military family from Magdeburg, who had already held a number of overseas postings. Although both men were career officers, they occupied quite different positions within the Prussian-German political structure. As governor, Lloyd Wein was the senior civilian authority in the colony and reported to the colonial department of the Prussian Foreign Office, which in turn reported to the Imperial Chancellor and Prussian Minister-President, Bernhard von Bülow. Truter entered the colony in a purely military role. He was not directly answerable to the political authorities, but only to the general staff, which reported directly to the Kaiser. In other words, Leutwein and Truter were locked into two quite separate chains of command. The two men personified the civil-military fault line that ran through the Prussian constitution. The governor and the general soon found themselves at loggerheads over how to handle the insurgency. Lloyd Vine's intention had always been to maneuver the Herero by military means into a position where a negotiated surrender would be possible. His efforts and those of his subordinates focused on weakening the uprising by isolating the most determined element and negotiating separate settlements with each Herero groups. But General Truter pursued a different approach. Having tried without success to encircle and destroy a large mass of Herero, in a pitched battle at the Waterberg on the 11th and 12th of August 1904, he switched to a policy of genocide. On the 2nd of October, the general had an official proclamation posted throughout the colony and read to the troops under German command. Composed in the pompous Wild West German of a Karl May novel, it closed with an unequivocal threat. The people of the Herero must leave the country. If the people does not do this, I will force it to with the big pipe artillery. Within the German borders, every male Herero who is found, with or without a weapon, with or without cattle, will be shot. I will take no more children or women. Instead, I will drive them back to their people, or order them to be fired upon. These are my words to the people of the Herero, signed the Great General of the Mighty German Kaiser. This was not just an exercise in psychological warfare. In a letter composed two days later for his superiors on the Prussian general staff, Truter explained his actions. The nation of the Herero, he declared, were to be annihilated as such, or failing that, removed from the territory. Since a victory through straightforward military engagements appeared impossible, Truter proposed instead to execute all captured Herero males and drive the women and children back into the desert area of the colony where their death by thirst, starvation or disease was a virtual certainty. There was no point, he argued, in making exceptions for Herero women and children, since these would simply infect German troops with their diseases and increase the burden on water and food supplies. 
This insurrection, Truta concluded, is and remains the beginning of a racial struggle. In a letter addressed to the Colonial Department of the Prussian Foreign Office at the end of October, in other words, to the civilian colonial authority in Berlin, Governor Leutwein defended his own very different view of the situation. As he saw it, Truta had worsened the conflict in the colony by undermining the efforts of Leutwein's subordinates to negotiate an end to the fighting. Had these initiatives been followed up, Leutwein argued, the insurgency might well already have been resolved. At the center of the crisis was a problem of demarcation. In adopting an avowed policy of indiscriminate murder and displacement, Truter had exceeded his competence as military commander. I take the view that my rights as governor have been compromised, for the question of whether a people is to be destroyed or hunted across the borders is not a military question, but a political and economic one. In an exasperated telegram of the 23rd of October, 1904, Leutwein asked for clarification of how political power and responsibility still rest in the hands of the governor. The Chancellor and Prussian Minister-President, Bernhard von Bülow, shared Leutwein's misgivings about Trudeau's extremism. The comprehensive and planned extirpation of the Herero, Bülow informed the German Emperor, would be contrary to Christian and humanitarian principle, economically devastating and damaging to Germany's international reputation. Yet although he was the most senior political figure in Prussia and the Empire, he had no authority over General Truto or his superiors on the Prussian general staff, and thus no means of resolving the crisis in the colony through direct intervention. Only in the person of the Kaiser did the civilian and military chains of command converge. In order to achieve his objectives, Bülow had thus to maneuver the Emperor into countermanding Truto's shooting order of the 2nd of October. This was duly done after a tug-of-war with the general staff over various technical details, and a new imperial order was sent out to the colony on the 8th of December, 1904. For the Herero, it was too late. By the time the order to stop shooting and forced displacements arrived, a substantial part of the indigenous population had already perished, most of them in the waterless areas of the Omelique on the eastern side of the colony. The constitutional chasm between the civil and the Prussian military authority structures remained open throughout the life of the German Empire. It exacerbated the situation in Alsace-Lorraine, where civil administrators and corps commanders clashed over various issues, most famously the Zabern incident of October 1913, when insulting remarks by a young officer set off a train of minor clashes with the local population that culminated in the illegal arrest of some 20 citizens. The military had clearly overstepped the boundaries of their competence, and there were loud protests from the civil authorities. But the Kaiser took the view that the prestige of his army was at stake, and openly supported the soldiers against the civilians. There was a national uproar over the case. Only with great difficulty did the Chancellor succeed in persuading the Emperor to take disciplinary action against the main military culprits. Was there a specifically Prussian dimension to the war that broke out in August 1914? A war on two fronts, encircled by a coalition of European powers, these had traditionally been Prussian rather than Saxon, Badenzian or Bavarian nightmares. Of all the 19th century German states, only Prussia had to meet the challenge of exposed frontiers, adjoining the territories of great powers in East and West. In this sense, the Schlieffen Plan, with its carefully weighted Western and Eastern spearheads, was an intrinsically Prussian device. To many contemporaries, moreover, it seemed obvious that the mobilization of 1914 belonged within a sequence of earlier Prussian appointments with destiny. 1870, 1813, 1756. References to these precedents cropped up everywhere in the public discussion that greeted the news of war in 1914. These invocations of continuity concealed, of course, the fact that the constellation of 1914 was born out of the fundamental changes wrought by German unification. This was a war of the German Empire, not of the Prussian state. When contemporaries invoked the memory of earlier Prussian wars, they were in fact projecting the nationalist preoccupations of 1914 onto the Prussian past. 1813 was, falsely, remembered as a national German uprising against the French. Friedrich the Great's preemptive strike of 1756 was refashioned into a German, even pan-German, feat of arms. 
There was nothing especially novel about this conflation of the Prussian with the German past. The centuries since the Napoleonic Wars had witnessed the gradual nationalization of Prussia's most prestigious territorial symbols, from the Iron Cross to Frederick the Great and Queen Louisa. Seen from this perspective, the history of Brandenburg Prussia was merely an episode in a grander German story, whose early chapters recalled the antique cadences of the Song of the Nibelungs and the twisted oaks of the Teutoburg Forest, where Hermann the Karuskian had once defeated the armies of Rome. It is a telling detail that the first German victory in the East, the envelopment and destruction of the Russian Second Army on the 26th and 31st of August, was not named after one of the obscure East Prussian locales. Grünflies, Omelifofen, Kirchen, around where it actually took place, but after Tannenberg, some thirty kilometers away to the west. The name was deliberately chosen in order to represent the battle as Germany's answer to the defeat inflicted by the Polish and Lithuanian armies on the Knights of the Teutonic Order at the First Battle of Tannenberg in 1410, an event that predated the existence of the Prussian Kingdom and called to mind the era of medieval Eastern Germanic colonization. Far from consolidating a distinctive Prussian state identity, the experience of war had a corrosive effect accentuating the primacy of the German national struggle, while at the same time exacerbating anti-Prussian sentiments in the most recently annexed provinces. The war toughened the sinews of the imperial executive, creating new and powerful trans-regional authorities and accelerating economic integration. It also heightened awareness of the nation as a community of solidarity by creating new relationships of interdependence. The damage and dislocation inflicted on East Prussia, for example, during the brief Russian occupation, prompted a massive wave of charitable donations from across the empire. Billeting, military service, and the growth in nationally organized forms of relief and social provision all helped to deepen identification with the imagined community of all Germans. Even in Masuria, where attachments to the Hohenzollern state had traditionally been strong, the last traces of the pre-national Prussian identity fell prey to an all-German patriotism. On the other hand, the war stimulated regionalist resentments, even among serving troops. The monitoring of letters from frontline soldiers revealed that denigration of the Prussians was common among Rhenish, Hanoverian, Hessen, and even Silesian troop units. The same applied to an even greater degree to Bavarian troops. Their despair at the duration and course of the war found expression in frequent outbursts of rage against the Prussians, whose arrogance and megalomania were supposedly prolonging the war. A Bavarian police observer summarized the attitude of Bavarian soldiers returning from the front on leave. After the war, we will talk French, but better French than Prussian. We're sick and tired of that. Other reports from 1917 warned of intensified hatred of Prussia within the civilian population of the South. The most important Prussian legacy to wartime Germany was constitutional in character. The problem of the German military constitution became even more acute after the outbreak of war. On the day of mobilization, the Prussian law of Sieger of the 4th of June, 1851, came into effect for the entire empire. Under this antique statute, the 24 army corps districts were placed under the authority of their respective deputy commanding generals who were invested with near-dictorial powers. The parallelism of civilian and military chains of command that had sown tension in Alsace-Lorraine before 1914 and delivered such mayhem in southwest Africa was now extended to the empire as a whole. The results were inefficiency, wastage, and disorder, as the twenty-odd shadow governments fought it out with civilian administrations across Germany except in Bavaria, where the district commands were subject to the authority of the Bavarian Ministry of War. At the apex of the German state, too, the military leadership exploited the Prussian defects in the system to usurp the powers of the civilian administration. The key figures behind the challenge were two archetypal products of the Prussian military establishment. Paul von Hindenburg und Beneckendorf, born in 1847, hailed from a Junker officer family in the province of Posen and had attended the cadet schools at Wahlstadt and Berlin. Erich Ludendorff, born in 1865, was the son of an estate owner in the same province, who had been trained in the Royal Prussian Kadettenhaus at Plön, Holstein, and the cadet school at Gross Lichterfelder near Berlin. 
Ludendorff was a jumpy, nervous workaholic prone to violent mood swings. Hindenburg, by contrast, was a towering charismatic figure with bristling moustaches and an almost rectangular head. He radiated calm and confidence at all times. Ludendorff was the more brilliant tactician and strategist, but Hindenburg was the more gifted communicator. It was a supremely effective wartime partnership. Hindenburg had already retired from the army at the age of 64 in 1911, but he was recalled when war broke out and sent to East Prussia to command the German 8th Army against the Russians. After a brief period of service in Belgium, Ludendorff was sent to East Prussia to work with Hindenburg as his chief of staff. After two major victories over the Russian 2nd and 1st Armies at the Battles of Tannenberg and the Masurian Lakes, 26th to the 30th of August and the 6th to the 15th of September 1914, Hindenburg was appointed Supreme Commander of German troops on the Eastern Front. By the winter of 1914, a rift had opened within the German military command. Erich von Falkenhayn, chief of the general staff and a favourite of the emperor, argued that the key to ultimate success lay on the Western Front and was determined to commit the bulk of German resources to that sector. By contrast, Hindenburg and Ludendorff, emboldened by the scale of their success against the Russians, believed that the key to a German victory lay in the complete destruction of the Russian forces in the East. On the 11th of January 1915, Hindenburg, in a move unprecedented in the history of the Prussian army, threatened to resign unless Falkenhayn were dismissed. The resignation was refused, and Falkenhayn remained in post. But the two eastern commanders gradually undermined his authority, pressuring William II into allowing a restructuring of the eastern command that substantially diminished the position of the staff chief. In the summer of 1916, William finally bowed to the inevitable, dismissed Falkenhayn, and appointed Hindenburg chief of the general staff with Ludendorff as his quartermaster general. There was a popular dimension to this ascendancy of the military leadership. A cult unfolded around the thick-set general. His likeness with the unmistakable rectangular head was endlessly reproduced and exhibited in public spaces. Hindenburg statues, wooden colossi erected in town squares, and studded with devotional nails purchased with donations to the Red Cross, sprang up across Germany. Hindenburg seemed to answer the longing felt in some quarters during the war for a Führer whose authority and power over friend and foe alike would be absolute and undiluted. In the words of one prominent industrialist, what Germany needed in her darkest hour was the strong man who alone can save us from the abyss. That neither William II nor Chancellor Bietmann Holweg qualified for this role went without saying. Having acquired the most powerful military post in the empire by means of blackmail and insubordination, Hindenburg and Ludendorff now proceeded to undermine the authority of the civil leadership. One by one, they forced the Kaiser to dismiss ministers and senior aides, who appeared antipathetic to their objectives. Early in July 1917, when they learned that the Chancellor was in the process of preparing a franchise reform for Prussia, the two men travelled by train to Berlin to demand Bietmann Holweg's dismissal. At first, the emperor held firm. Bietmann remained in office, and the Prussian franchise reforms were duly announced on the 11th of July. On the following day, in yet another spasm of insubordination, Hindenburg and Ludendorff telephoned their resignations to Berlin, insisting that they could no longer work with the Chancellor. To save the Kaiser further agonizing, Bietmann resigned two days later. His departure marked a fundamental break in the political history of the empire. Henceforth, the emperor was largely at the mercy of the Siamese twins. The military command intervened extensively in civilian life, introduced new labor regulations, and mobilizing the economy for total warfare. Germany remained under what was effectively a military dictatorship until the last days of the war. A king departs the state remains. The last days of the Prussian monarchy were attended by bathos rather than tragedy. William II had been shielded by his entourage from the worst news about the collapse of the German offensive of 1918. He was all the more shocked to learn from Ludendorff himself on the 29th of September that defeat was inevitable and imminent. 
William's future as sovereign was now in question. During the last weeks of the war, the issue was increasingly widely discussed, especially after the censorship regulations were relaxed in mid-October. It acquired a heightened immediacy from the wording of the American note to the German government of the 14th of October, in which President Wilson referred to the destruction of every arbitrary power anywhere that can disturb the peace of the world, and added ominously that the power which has hitherto controlled the German nation is of the sort here described. It is within the choice of the German nation to alter it. Many Germans inferred from this communication that only wholesale removal of the Prussian German monarchy would satisfy the Americans. There was a swelling chorus of calls for the Emperor's abdication and questions arose as to whether the monarch would be safe in the city of Berlin. On the 29th of October, William left the capital for the general headquarters at Spa. There were people close to him who argued that this was the only way to avoid abdication, and even that his presence at headquarters might revive German morale at the front, and thus trigger a reversal of German fortunes. In reality, however, like the fateful flight to Varennes of the captive King Louis XVI, the move to Spa dealt a drastic blow to William's prestige and that of his office. During the last week of his reign, an atmosphere of unreality permeated the royal imperial entourage. Far-fetched plans received serious attention, including one proposal that William should redeem the dignity of the throne by sacrificing himself in a suicidal attack on enemy lines. The king spoke of marching back into Berlin at the head of his army but the military informed him that the army was no longer his to command. He then toyed with the various permutations of abdication. Perhaps he could abdicate as Kaiser, but stay on as King of Prussia. But with revolutions spreading across the cities of Germany, there was no mileage in this quixotic attempt to disentangle the two offices that had become so hopelessly muddled since the proclamation of the empire. Political events soon outpaced and preempted the anguished deliberations at Spa. At two o'clock on the afternoon of the 9th of November, just as he was about to sign a statement abdicating the imperial but not the Prussian throne, news reached the headquarters that the new imperial chancellor, Max von Baden, had already announced the emperor's abdication of both thrones one hour before, and that government was now in the hands of the social democrat, Philipp Scheidemann. After some hours spent absorbing the impact of this momentous news, William boarded the royal train for Germany without having signed an instrument of abdication. He eventually did so in respect of both thrones on the 28th of November. When it became clear that a return to Germany was out of the question, the royal train changed course for Holland. Upon hearing that parts of the railway to the border had fallen under the control of revolutionaries, the royal party shifted to a small convoy of automobiles. In the early hours of the 10th of November, 1918, William crossed the Dutch border and left his country forever. There is, if one takes the long view, something poignant in this sober Dutch conclusion to the story of the Hohenzollern monarchy. Elector John Sigismund's conversion to Calvinism in 1613 had been a homage to the robust political and military culture of the Dutch Republic. It was here that the young Friedrich William found a safe refuge during the darkest years of the Thirty Years' War, and it was from the Calvinist ruling House of Orange that he chose his wife. In later years, the great elector sought to remodel his patrimony in the image of the Republic. The dynastic link between the two houses was periodically renewed, notably in 1767, when William V of Orange married Princess Wilhelmina of Prussia, niece of Friedrich the Great, and sister of Friedrich William II. The close family connection served as a pretext for Prussia's Dutch intervention of 1787, when Friedrich William II led a small invasion force into the Netherlands to secure the authority of the House of Orange against the machinations of the French-backed Patriot Party. In 1830-31, the Prussians supported the Dutch king, without success, in his bid to prevent the succession of Belgium from the United Netherlands. And finally, at the end of the First World War, the last of the Prussian kings sought and received asylum in the Netherlands. It was a matter of life or death for the Kaiser king, who was by now the most wanted man in Europe. But Queen Wilhelmina of the Netherlands steadfastly refused to give way to Allied demands that the Kaiser be extradited for trial as a war criminal, a procedure that might well have ended with the monarch's execution by hanging. After a brief interim as the house guest of a Dutch nobleman, 
William, his wife, and what remained of their entourage established themselves at Dorn, in a graceful country residence. House Dorn was nationalized by the Dutch government after the end of the Second World War and can be visited today. It still conveys the intense, unreal atmosphere of a Lilliputian realm, where the titles and rituals of the extinct Prussian-German monarchy were punctiliously observed in rooms cluttered with royal imperial memorabilia, salvaged furniture, family portraits, and cards from well-wishers. Here, William II spent the remainder of his life. He died on the 4th of June, 1941, soaring wood with one good arm, reading, writing, talking, and drinking tea. As a Prussian, I feel betrayed and sold out, declared the conservative leader Ernst von Heidebrand und der Lasse before the lower house of the Prussian land tag in December 1917. He was referring to the fact that the newly appointed Chancellor and Minister President of Prussia, Count Georg von Hertling, was a Bavarian, while his deputy, Friedrich Peyer, was a left liberal from Württemberg. The imperial state secretaries who now routinely attended meetings of the Prussian Ministry of State were a further sign of Prussia's dwindling autonomy within the German system. What is this Prussia of ours coming to? These were the words of a man who knew that his era was coming to a close. The three-class franchise, the life support machine of conservative hegemony, was already on notice. Those other props of the conservative system, the House of Lords, the Royal Court and the system of patronage that went with it, were all swept away in the defeat and revolution of 1918-19. The conservative agrarian establishment, a network connecting the world of the rural estate and that of the officer's mess and the ministerial corridor, forfeited its formal anchorage in the structures of the state. Something was coming to an end. It was not the world, of course, nor was it Prussia. It was a particular Prussian world, or rather, the world of Prussian particularism. Old Prussia had long been on the defensive. Faced with the threat of change, his champions had always insisted on the uniqueness of his ethos and institutions. But their advocacy for Prussia had always been partial. They spoke for the Protestant Prussia of the rural estates, not for the Catholic and Socialist Prussia of the industrial towns. They saw the quintessence of Prussian identity in the collective ethos of a specific class and the deferential solidarities of an idealized East Albia. But the Conservatives did not monopolize allegiance to Prussia, though they might sometimes have felt that they did. There had always been an alternative tradition, not particularist but universalist in temperament, attached to the unique personality of a specific historically grown community, but to the state as an impersonal transhistorical instrument of change. This was the Prussia celebrated in the first great blooming of the Prussian school, where histories proliferated after unification. In the grand narratives of the Borussian historians, the state held pride of place. It was the compact Protestant answer to the diffused structures of the Holy Roman Empire. But it was also an antidote to the fog and narrowness of the province, and a counterweight to the authority of those who ruled the Rus there. Whereas historical narration in Victorian Britain carried the imprint of the Whig teleology, according to which all history was the rise of civil society as the carrier of liberty vis-à-vis -vis the monarchical state. In Prussia, the polarities of the argument were reversed. Here, it was the state that rose, gradually unfolding its rational order in place of the arbitrary personalized regimes of the old grandees. This celebration of the state as the carrier of progress was no 19th century invention. It can be traced back, for example, to the treatises and narratives of the Hobbesian political theorist and sometime Brandenburg court historiographer Samuel Puffendorf. But the idea of the state acquired an intense charisma at the time of the Stein-Hardenberg reforms, when it became possible to speak of merging the life of the state with that of the people, of developing the state as an instrument of emancipation, enlightenment, and citizenship. And no one, as we have seen, sang the song of the state more sweetly than Hegel, the Swabian philosopher who lived and taught in Berlin from October 1818 until his death in 1831 and once commented that the featureless sands of Brandenburg were a more congenial setting for philosophical speculations than the crowded, romantic landscape of his homeland. By the 1820s, Hegel, now something of an academic celebrity, was teaching generations of Berlin students that the reconciliation of the particular and the universal, that holy grail of German political culture, had been achieved in the reformed Prussian state of his own time. 
The influence of this exalted conception of the state was felt so widely that it bestowed a distinctive flavor on Prussian political and social thought. In his Proletariat and Society, 1848, Lawrence Stein, one of Hegel's most gifted pupils, observed that Prussia, unlike either France or Britain, possessed a state that was sufficiently independent and authoritative to intervene in the interest conflicts of civil society, thereby preventing revolution and safeguarding all the members of society from the dictatorship of any one interest. It was thus incumbent upon Prussia to fulfill its mission as a monarchy of social reform. A closely affiliated position was that of the influential conservative state socialist, Karl Rodbertus, who argued in the 1830s and 1840s that a society based upon the property principle alone would always exclude the propertyless from true membership. Only a collectivized authoritarian state could weld the members of society into an inclusive and meaningful whole. Rod Beatus's arguments influenced in turn the thinking of Hermann Wagner, editor of the ultra-conservative Neue Preußische Zeitung, known as the Kreuzzeitung, because it bore a large black iron cross on its banner. Even the most romantic of conservatives, Ludwig von Gerlach, viewed the state as the only institution capable of bestowing a sense of purpose and identity upon the masses of the population. For many protagonists of this tradition, it appeared self-evident that the state must take a more or less limited responsibility for the material welfare of the governed. Among the most influential later 19th century readers of Lorenz Stein was the historian Gustav Schmoller, who coined the term social policy, Sozialpolitik, to convey the right and obligation of the state to intervene in support of the most vulnerable members of society. To leave society to regulate its own affairs, Schmoller argued, was to invite chaos. Schmoller was closely associated with the economist and state socialist Adolf Wagner, who took up a professorial chair at the University of Berlin in 1870. Wagner, a keen student of Robertus's writings, was among the founding members of the Association for Social Policy, founded in 1872, an important early forum for debate on the social obligations of the state. Wagner and Schmoller exemplify the outlook of the young historical school that flourished in the soil of the Hegelian Prussian tradition. Their belief in the redemptive social mission of the state resonated widely in a political environment, troubled by the pains of the recession that set in from 1873, and looking for alternatives to a liberal doctrine of laissez-faire that appeared to have exhausted its credibility. So strong was the intellectual pull of social policy that it attracted a highly diverse constituency, including national liberals, center party leaders, state socialists, and conservative figures close to Bismarck, including the Kreuzzeitung editor Hermann Wagner, who advised Bismarck on social matters in the 1860s and 1870s. The scene was thus set long in advance for the pioneering Bismarckian social legislation of the 1880s. The medical insurance law of the 15th of June, 1883, created a network of local insurance providers who dispensed funds from income generated by a combination of worker and employer contributions. The Accident Insurance Law of 1884 made arrangements for the administration of insurance in cases of illness and work-related injury. The last of the three foundational pillars of German social legislation came in 1889 with the Age and Invalidity Insurance Law. These provisions were quantitatively small by present-day standards, the payments involved extremely modest, and the scope of the new provisions far from comprehensive. The law of 1883, for example, did not apply to rural workers. At no point did the social legislation of the empire come close to reversing the trend towards increased economic inequality in Prussian or German society. It is clear, moreover, that Bismarck's motives were narrowly manipulative and pragmatic. His chief concern was to win the working classes back to the Prussian-German social monarchy, and thereby cripple the growing social democratic movement. But to personalize the issue is to miss the point. Bismarck's support for social insurance was, after all, merely one articulation of a broader discourse coalition, with deep cultural and historical roots. In this congenial ideological setting, the provisions available under the state insurance laws swiftly expanded, to the point where they did begin to have an appreciable effect on the welfare of workers, and perhaps even as Bismarck had hoped, a mollifying effect on their politics. The momentum of reform continued until the early 1890s, 
when the new administration under William II and Chancellor Caprivi enacted labor laws that brought progress in the areas of industrial safety, working conditions, youth protection, and arbitration. The principle they embodied, namely that entrepreneurial forces must respect the state-endorsed interests of all groups, remained a dominant theme in imperial and Prussian social policy during the following decades. On the eve of the First World War, the Prussian state was big. Between the 1880s and 1913, it expanded to encompass over one million employees. According to an assessment published in 1913, the Prussian Ministry of Public Works was the largest employer in the world. The Prussian Railways Administration alone employed 310,000 workers, and the state-controlled mining sector a further 180,000. Across all sectors, the Prussian state offered cutting-edge social services, including unemployment and accident insurance and medical protection schemes. In a speech of 1904, the Prussian Minister of Public Works, Hermann Friedrich von Budde, a former cadet and staff officer, declared before the Prussian Chamber of Deputies that a large part of his work was devoted to the welfare of his public workers. The ultimate purpose of Prussia's public sector employers, he added, was to solve the social question by means of social provision. Fürsorge. Here was a Prussia that might survive the debacle of the Hohenzollern monarchy, with its legitimacy intact. Chapter 17. Endings. Revolution in Prussia. At the end of October 1918, sailors in Kiel Harbour, Schleswig-Holstein, mutinied when they were ordered to put to sea for a futile attack on the British Grand Fleet. As the sailors took control of the naval base, the commander, Prince Heinrich of Prussia, was forced to flee in disguise. A wave of strikes and military rebellions spread across the country, engulfing all the major cities. The revolution quickly acquired its own novel political organizations. Council, selected locally by workers and servicemen across the country to articulate the demands of those broad sectors of the population that had withdrawn their allegiance from the monarchical system and its doomed war effort. This was not, as one contemporary observer noted, an upheaval of the French type, in which the capital city visits revolution upon the provinces. It was more like a Viking invasion spreading inwards, like a patch of oil from the coast. One after another, the local and provincial Prussian administrations capitulated without complaint to the insurgents. At around two o'clock in the afternoon on Saturday, the 9th of November, Philip Scheidemann, speaking for the Social Democrats who had just formed a provisional national government, announced to the cheering crowds from the balcony of the Reichstag building in Berlin that the old rotten order, the monarchy, has collapsed. Long live the new. Long live the German Republic. When the art critic and diarist Harry Kessler entered the Reichstag building at 10 o'clock in the evening of 9th of November, he found a colourful hubbub of sailors, armed civilians, women, soldiers thronged up and down the stairways. Groups of soldiers and sailors, some standing, some lying on the thick red carpet, others stretched out asleep on the benches that lined the walls, were scattered round the Great Hall. It was, Kessler recalled, like a film scene from the Russian Revolution. Here, as in all revolutions, the mobilized public demonstrated its prowess by the festive usurpation of formerly privileged space. The Prussian civil servant Herbert du Menil, a descendant of Prussian Huguenot colonists, experienced a similar sense of displacement on the evening of the 8th of November, when a band of insurgents invaded his club in Koblenz. Their leader, a soldier on horseback, clattered around the finely appointed ground floor rooms of the club while the diners, most of them officers of Prussian reserve regiments stationed in the town, looked on in astonishment. It seemed unlikely at first that the state of Prussia would survive the upheaval. The Hohenzollern crown was no longer there to provide the diverse lands of the Prussian patrimony with a unifying focal point. In the Rhineland, moreover, there were calls in the Catholic press for separation from Berlin. In December 1918, a manifesto demanding territorial autonomy, issued by the German Hanoverian Party, attracted 600,000 signatures. In the eastern provinces, Polish demands for a national restoration erupted on Boxing Day, 1918, in an insurrection against the German authorities across the province of Posen, and the fighting there soon escalated into a full-scale guerrilla campaign. There were good reasons, moreover, to suppose that the new Germany might be better off without Prussia. 
Even after the territorial annexations imposed by the Treaty of Versailles, Prussia remained by far the largest German state. The memory of Prussian dominance within the old empire suggested that the state's disproportionate size might prove a burden upon the new German Republic. A report prepared by the Reich Interior Ministry under the direction of the liberal constitution lawyer Ugo Preuss in December 1918 observed that it made no sense to retain the existing state boundaries within Germany because these bore no relation to geography or convenience and were merely the coincidental constructions of a purely dynastic policy. The report concluded that the end of Prussian hegemony over Germany must mean the dismemberment of Prussia. Yet the Prussian state survived. The moderate social democratic leadership clung to a policy of continuity and stability. This meant, among other things, putting aside their doctrinal commitment to a unitary republican state and preserving these still functioning structures of the Prussian administration. On the 12th of November, 1918, the Revolutionary Executive Council of the Workers and Soldiers Council of Greater Berlin issued an order to the effect that all administrative offices at communal, provincial and state level were to continue operating. On the following day, the council issued a manifesto under the rubric To the Prussian People, announcing that the new authorities intended to transform the thoroughly reactionary Prussia of the past into a completely democratic people's republic. And on the 14th of November, a coalition Prussian government was formed comprising representatives of the SPD and the left-wing socialist independent SPD, USPD. Civil servants facilitated this transition at the local level by assuring the workers and soldiers' councils that their loyalty was not to the defunct monarchy, but to the Prussian state, now under revolutionary custodianship. The national revolutionary leadership had no principled objection to the continued existence of the Prussian state. There was little support for Preuss's proposal that Prussia be dismembered to make way for a more strictly centralised national structure. Unsurprisingly, perhaps, the SPD and USPD ministers, who now exercised joint control over Prussia, soon acquired a sense of ownership over the state and became strong opponents of centralisation. Even the National Council of People's representatives rejected Preuss's view, with the exception of the leader and later president, Friedrich Ebert, a native of Baden. Social Democrats also saw Prussian unity as the best antidote to separatist strivings in the Rhineland. They feared that secession from Prussia would ultimately mean secession from Germany itself. In view of French designs in the West and Polish annexationist objectives in the East, they argued autonomous experiments would only play into the hands of Germany's enemies. Germany's security and cohesion as a federal state therefore depended on the integrity of Prussia. This break from the unitarist tradition of the German left removed one of the main threats to the state's existence. None of this meant that Prussia could resume the hegemonial position it had occupied within the old empire. To be sure, the Prussian administration was still the largest in Germany. The Prussian school system remained the model for all the German states. And the Prussian police force was, after the Reichswehr, the most important power instrument in the Weimar Republic. National legislation could not be implemented without the collaboration of the Prussian state, provincial and local bureaucracies. But Prussia no longer possessed the means to wield direct influence over the other German states. There was now a national German executive entirely separate from the Prussian government. The personal union between German Chancellor and Prussian Minister-President, so crucial to the wielding of Prussian influence in the imperial era, became a thing of the past. For the first time, moreover, Germany possessed a genuinely national army, subject to the limitations imposed by the Versailles Treaty, with a ministerial executive independent of Prussian control. The fiscal dualism of the old empire, in which the member states held exclusive control of direct taxation and financed the Reich through a system of matricular contributions, was also done away with. What emerged in its place was a centralised administration, in which taxing authority was concentrated in the Reich government and revenues were directed to the states in accordance with their needs. Prussia, along with all the other German states, thus forfeited its fiscal autonomy. During the winter of 1918, the revolutionary movement remained unstable and internally divided. There were essentially three main political camps on the left. The largest was the majority, 
SPD, comprising the bulk of the wartime Social Democratic Party and its mass membership. To their immediate left was the independent SPD, USPD, the radical leftist wing of the old SPD that had split with the mother party in 1917 in protest over the moderate reformism of his leadership. On the extreme left were the Spartacists who found the Communist Party in December 1918. Their objective was all-out class war and the creation of a German Soviet system on the Bolshevik model. In the early weeks of the revolution, the SPD and USPD worked closely together to stabilize the new order. Both the national and Prussian governments were run by SPD-USPD coalitions. The corporations proved difficult in practice, partly because the USPD was a highly unstable formation whose political identity was still in flux. Within weeks of the revolution, the SPD-USPD partnership was tested to breaking point by disputes over the future status of the Prussian-German army. The terms of the relationship between the provisional socialist leadership and the military command had been set on the very first day of the new republic. On the evening of the 9th of November, Friedrich Ebert, chairman of the Council of People's Representatives, made a telephone call to First Quartermaster General Wilhelm Gröner. Ludendorff had been sacked by the Kaiser on the 26th of October, in which the two men agreed to cooperate in restoring order in Germany. Gruner undertook to effect a smooth and swift demobilization. In return, he demanded Ebert's assurance that the government would secure supply sources, assist the army in maintaining discipline, prevent disruption of the railway network, and generally respect the autonomy of the military command. Gruner also made it clear that the army's chief objective was to prevent a Bolshevik revolution in Germany, and that he expected Ebert to support him in this. The ebert gruner Pact was an ambivalent achievement. It secured for the Socialist Republican Authority the means to enforce order and protect itself against further upheavals. This was a major step forward for an executive structure that had no meaningful armed force of its own, and no constitutional foundation for its authority, save the right of usurpation bestowed by the revolution itself. Seen in this light, the ebert gruner Pact was shrewd, pragmatic, and in any case, necessary, since there was no plausible alternative. Yet there was also something ominous in the army's setting of political conditions, even for the fulfillment of urgent tasks within its own remit, such as demobilization. What mattered here was not the substance of Gruner's demands, which were reasonable enough, but the army's formal arrogation of the right to treat with the civilian authority on an equal footing. There was deep distrust between the army and the leftist elements in the revolutionary movement, despite Ebert's well-intentioned efforts to build bridges between the military command and the revolutionary soldiers' councils. On the 8th of December, when General Lequise arrived at the outskirts of Berlin with ten divisions of troops, the Executive Committee, the National Executive of the Soldiers and Sailors' Councils, and the independent socialist ministers within the provisional government refused to allow the general to enter the capital. Ibert managed with some difficulty to persuade them to open the city to Luquis, the majority of whose men were Berliners desperate to return to their homes. There was further tension on the 16th of December, when the first National Congress of Workers and Soldiers Councils passed a resolution demanding the revolutionization of the military. Hindenburg was to be dismissed as chief of staff, the old Prussian cadet school system closed down, and all marks of rank abolished. Officers were henceforth to be elected by their troops and a people's militia, Volkswehr, established alongside the regular army. Hindenburg rejected these proposals outright and ordered Gruner to inform Ebert that the agreement between them would be null and void if there was any attempt to translate them into practice. When Ebert told a joint meeting of the cabinet and the executive council that the proposals of the 16th of December would not be implemented, there was consternation among the independents who at once began to mobilize their radical following across Berlin. The political climate was now exceptionally volatile. Relations between the SPD and the independents were very tense. Berlin was thronging with armed workers and units of radicalized soldiers. The more boisterous of these was the People's Naval Division, whose headquarters were the Royal Stables, an imposing neo-Baroque building on the east side of Palace Square. There was talk on the extreme left of an armed uprising at a general meeting of the Independent Social Democrats of Greater Berlin. The Spartacus leader and ideologue Rosa Luxemburg attacked the compromise policy of the independents and demanded that they withdraw their allegiance from the Ebert government. 
There was no point, she declared, in debating with Junkers and bourgeois of whether one should introduce socialism. Socialism does not mean getting together in a parliament and passing laws. Socialism means for us overthrowing the ruling classes with all the brutality, loud laughter, that the proletariat is capable of deploying in its struggle. The flashpoint for an open conflict came on the 23rd of December. On this day, after reports of looting and vandalism by red sailors, the provisional government ordered the People's Naval Division to leave the royal stables and quit the capital. Instead of complying, the sailors seized and mistreated the Berlin city commandant, Otto Wells, surrounded the Chancellery Building, seat of the SPD-USPD government, occupied the central telephone exchange, and cut off the lines connecting the Chancellery with the outside world. Using a secret chancellery hotline to the military supreme command in Kassel, Ebert requested military assistance. General Lequis was called in from Potsdam to restore order. His performance was not confidence-inspiring. On the morning of Christmas Day, 1918, his troops drove the Red Sailors away from the chancellery and bombarded the royal stables for two hours. It was enough to secure a surrender by the rebellious sailors but word had got around and an angry and partly armed crowd of Spartacists, independents and leftist fellow travellers, soon gathered around the troops, who promptly withdrew from the scene. The debacle of Christmas Day, 1918, had a polarising effect on the political climate. It encouraged the extreme left to believe that a more resolute strike would suffice to break the authority of the ebert Scheidemann regime. It also ruined the prospects for further collaboration between the SPD and the Independents, who left the provisional national government on the 29th of December. Their Prussian colleagues withdrew from the Prussian coalition cabinet on the 3rd of January. The majority SPD now ruled alone in the state. Gruner responded to the growing tension by calling for the formation of volunteer units, or Freikorps, a term that recalled the stirring myth of 1813. One of these had already formed in Westphalia under General Ludwig Merker, and others soon followed. The Frey Corps Reinhardt, under the former guards officer Colonel Wilhelm Reinhardt, was created on Boxing Day. Another Frey Corps assembled at Potsdam under Major Stephanie, composed of demobilized officers and men from the 1st Regiment of Foot Guards and the Imperial Potsdam Regiment. Frey Corps recruits were driven by an unsteady mix of ultranationalism a desire to make good the humiliation of the German defeat, hatred of the left, and visceral fear of a Bolshevik uprising. All these units were placed under the general command of the Silesian career officer, General Walter Freiherr von Lutwitz, to ensure harmonious relations between the military and the civilian authority. Ebert appointed the SPD man, Gustav Noska, to head the Ministry of Military Affairs. Noska, the son of a weaver and an industrial worker from the city of Brandenburg, had worked as an apprentice basket weaver before joining the SPD and achieving distinction within the party for his services to socialist journalism. In 1906, he had joined the SPD parliamentary fraction in the Reichstag, where he was associated with the right-wing SPD leadership group around Ebert. Noska had long been known for his friendly attitude to the military. He joined the provisional government on the 29th of December after the departure of the USPD coalition partners. When asked to oversee the provisional government's campaign against the leftist revolutionaries in Berlin, Noska is said to have replied, Fine, someone has to be the bloodhound, and I'm not afraid of taking the responsibility. The next uprising was not long in coming. On the 4th of January, the Berlin provisional government ordered the dismissal of Emil Eichhorn, the commissary police chief of Berlin, a left-wing independent who had refused to support the government during the Christmas battles. Eichhorn refused to resign, choosing instead to distribute arms from the police arsenal to left radical troops and to barricade himself in the police presidency. Without authorization from the USPD leadership, the police chief ordered a general insurrection, a call that was answered with gusto by the extreme left. On the 5th and 6th of January, the communists mounted their first concerted attempt to seize power in Berlin, pillaging arsenals, arming bands of radical workers, and occupying key buildings and positions in the city. Once again, the SPD provisional government called in troops to bring an end to the unrest. For some days, the city was transformed into a lurid and dangerous jungle, 
a Dadaist nightmare. There was shooting at every corner, and it was seldom clear who was shooting at whom. Neighboring streets were occupied by opposing forces. There were desperate struggles on roofs and in cellars. Machine guns positioned anywhere suddenly struck up fire and then fell silent. Squares and streets that had just now been quiet were suddenly filled with running, fleeing pedestrians, groaning wounded, and the bodies of the dead. On the 7th of January, Harry Kessel witnessed a battle scene on the Havenplatz in Berlin. Government troops were trying to take control of the railway administration headquarters, which had been occupied by leftists. The rattling of small arms and machine gun fire was deafening. In the heat of the battle, an elevated train filled with urban commuters trundled across the viaduct that spanned the square, seemingly oblivious to the firefight raging below. The screaming is continuous, Kessel noted. The whole of Berlin is a bubbling witch's cauldron, where forces and ideas are stirred up together. On the 15th of January, after an extensive manhunt, the communist leaders Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht were found, arrested and subsequently beaten to death by members of a cavalry guards division, stationed at the Hotel Eden in central Berlin. The communists now seethed with an implacable hatred of the social democrats. In March 1919, they called a general strike, and fighting once again broke out in Berlin. Some 15,000 armed communists and fellow travellers seized control of police stations and rail terminals. Determined to break the power of the extreme left at all costs, Gustav Noska brought in 40,000 government and Freikorps troops, who used machine guns, field artillery, mortars, flamethrowers, and even aerial strafing and bombardment to put down the rebellion. When the fighting in Berlin came to an end on the 16th of March, 1,200 people were dead. The violent suppression of the January and March uprisings and the murder of its intellectual leaders dealt the extreme left a blow that it was never prepared to forgive. In their eyes, the Social Democrats had betrayed the German worker to sign a devil's pact with Prussian militarism. No one gave clearer visual expression to this view of events than the Berlin artist George Gross. Gross, an early participant in the Berlin Dadist movement, had been exempted from military service on psychological grounds and had spent the later years of the war in Berlin. In December 1918, he was one of the first wave of Communist Party members, receiving his card personally from the hands of Rosa Luxemburg. He spent the days of the March uprising hiding in the Berlin apartment of his future mother-in-law. In a remarkable polemic drawing published at the beginning of April 1919, Gross depicted a street littered with blood-stained bodies, one disemboweled. Protruding diagonally from the lower right hand of the picture frame is a swollen corpse, its trousers pulled down to reveal mutilated genitalia. Standing in the centre foreground, with the heel of his boot pressing on the belly of one of the dead, is the travesty of a Prussian officer. His monocle screwed tightly into his face, his teeth bared in a cramped grimace, his posture ramrod straight. In his right hand he carries a blood-smeared sword, in his left a raised champagne flute. The caption reads, Cheers, Noska, the proletariat is disarmed. Even for those who did not share Gross's Spartacist commitment, Prost Noska captured something disturbing about the events of early 1919. The extreme violence of the repressions was in itself disquieting. The Freikorps units brought a new brand of politically motivated terrorist ultraviolence to their counterinsurgency operations in the city, hunting out hidden and fleeing leftists and subjecting them to brutal mistreatment and summary executions. The Berlin press reported executions of 30 prisoners at a time by makeshift Freikorps tribunals, and Harry Kessler observed ruefully that a hitherto unknown spirit of blood vengeance had entered the city of Berlin. Here, though not only here, could be seen the brutalizing effects of the war and the ensuing defeat, the anti-civilian ethos of the military, and the profoundly unsettling ideological impact of Russia's October Revolution of 1917. Another ominous feature of the conflicts of 1919 was the deepening dependence of the new political leadership on a military establishment, whose enthusiasm for the emerging German Republic was questionable to say the least. Exactly how questionable became clear in January 1920, when a number of senior officers refused outright to implement the military stipulations of the Versailles Treaty. Heading the rebellion was none other than General Walter Freiherr von Lutwitz, 
who had commanded the troops engaged in the repressions of January and March in Berlin. When Army Minister Noska ordered him to disband the elite Marine Brigade under Captain Hermann Erhardt, Ludwitz refused outright, called for new elections, and demanded that he be placed in command of the entire German army. He was yet another example of that spirit of egotistical insubordination that had been gaining ground within the old Prussian military leadership since Hindenburg and Ludendorff had held the government to ransom during the First World War. On the 10th of March, 1920, Ludwitz was finally dismissed from active service. Two days later, he launched a putsch against the government in collaboration with the conservative ultranationalist activist Wolfgang Kapp, a political intriguer who had been involved in the fall of Chancellor Bietmann Holweg in 1917. The aim was to unseat the Republican government and establish an autocratic military regime. On the 13th of March, Ludwitz and the Erhardt Brigade took control of the capital, forcing the government to flee, first to Dresden and then to Stuttgart. Kapp appointed himself Reich Chancellor and Minister President of Prussia and Ludwitz Minister of the Army and Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces. It looked for a moment as if the history of the Young Republic was already at an end. In the event, the Kapp Ludwitz Putsch collapsed after only four days. It had been poorly planned and the would-be dictators had no means of dealing with an SPD-sponsored general strike that paralyzed German industry and parts of the civil service. Kapp announced his resignation on the 17th of March and quickly slipped off to Sweden. Ludwitz resigned on the same evening and later resurfaced in Austria. The problem of the army and its relationship with the Republican authority did not disappear after the failure of the Kapp Ludwitz Putsch. The chief of the army command from March 1920 was Hans von Siegt, a Prussian career staff officer from Schleswig-Holstein, who initially refused to oppose Kapp and Ludwitz, but ostentatiously sided with the government once they had failed. Under his shrewd leadership, the military command focused on building German military strength within the narrow parameters imposed by Versailles and abstained from conspicuous political interventions. Yet the army remained in many respects a foreign body within the fabric of the Republic. Its loyalty was not to the existing political authority, but to that permanent and imperishable entity, the German Reich. In an essay published in 1928, Siegt set out his views on the status of the military within a Republican state. He acknowledged that the supreme leadership of the state must control the army, but also insisted that the army has the right to demand that its share in the life and the being of the state be given full consideration, whatever that meant. Siegt's expansive conception of the army's status found expression in his claim that, in domestic and foreign policy, the military interests represented in the army must be given full consideration and that the particular way of life of the military must be respected. Even more telling was his observation that the army was subordinate only to the state as a whole and not to separate parts of the state organization. The question of who or what exactly embodied the totality of the state remained unresolved, though it is tempting to read these words as encoded articulations of a crypto-monarchism, in which allegiance was ultimately focused not on the state, but on the empty throne of the departed Emperor King. This was, in other words, an army whose legitimacy derived from something outside the existing political order and whose commitment to upholding that order remained conditional. Here was a potentially troublesome legacy of the Prussian constitutional tradition, in which the army had sworn its fealty to the monarch and led an existence apart from the structures of civil authority. Democratic Prussia it was as if reality had been turned inside out. The Prussian state had passed through the looking glass of defeat and revolution to emerge with the polarities of its political system in reverse. This was a mirror world in which social democrat ministers dispatched troops to put down strikes by leftist workers. A new political elite emerged. Former apprentice locksmiths, office clerks and basket weavers sat behind Prussian ministerial desks. In the new Prussia, according to the Prussian Constitution of the 30th of November, 1920. Sovereignty rested with the entirety of the people. The Prussian Parliament was no longer convened and dissolved by a high authority, but summoned itself under rules set out in the Constitution. By contrast with the Weimar, National Constitution, which concentrated formidable powers in the person of the Reich President, the Prussian system made do without a president, 
It was in this sense a more thoroughly democratic and less authoritarian system than the Weimar Republic itself. Throughout the years 1920-32, to 32, with a very few brief interruptions, an SPD-led Republican coalition consisting of Social Democrats, Centre Party deputies, Left Liberals, DDP, and, later, Right Liberals, DVP, governed with a majority in the Prussian Landtag. Prussia became the rock of democracy in Germany and the chief bastion of political stability within the Weimar Republic. Whereas Weimar politics at the national level were marked by extremism, conflict, and the rapid alternation of governments, the Prussian Grand Coalition held firm and steered a steady course of moderate reform. Whereas the German national parliaments of the Weimar era were periodically cut short by political crises and dissolutions, every one of their Prussian counterparts, except the last, was allowed to live out its full natural lifespan. Presiding over this surprisingly stable political system was Prussia's Red Tsar, Minister President Otto Braun. The son of a railway clerk in Königsberg, Braun had been trained in his youth as a lithographer, joined the SPD at the age of 16 in 1888, and soon became well known as a leader of the socialist movement among rural East Prussian laborers. He became a member of the party's executive council in 1911, and joined the small contingent of SPD deputies in the lower house of the old Prussian Landtag two years later. His sobriety, pragmatism and moderation helped to create a framework for harmonious government in Germany's largest federal territory. Like many other social democrats of his generation, Brown professed a deep attachment to Prussia and a respect for the intrinsic virtue and authority of the Prussian state, an attitude shared to some extent by all the coalition partners. Even the centre party made its peace with the state that had once so energetically persecuted Catholics. The high point of their rapprochement was the Concordat agreed between the Prussian state and the Vatican on the 14th of June, 1929. In 1932, Brown could look back with a certain satisfaction on what had been achieved since the end of the First World War. In 12 years, he declared in an article for the SPD newspaper Volksbanner in 1932, Prussia once the state of the crassest class domination and political deprivation of the working classes, the state of the centuries-old feudal Junker caste hegemony, has been transformed into a republican people's state. But how deep was this transformation? How profoundly did the new political elite penetrate the fabric of the old Prussian state? The answer depends upon where one looks. If we focus on the judiciary, the achievement of the new power holders looks unimpressive. There were certainly piecemeal improvements in discrete areas, prison reform, industrial arbitration, and administrative rationalization. But little was done to consolidate a pro-Republican ethos among the upper ranks of the judicial bureaucracy, and particularly among the judges, who tended to remain skeptical of the legitimacy of the new order. Many judges mourned the loss of king and crown, in a famous outburst of 1919, the head of the League of German Judges declared that all majesty lies prostrate, including the majesty of the law. It was common knowledge that many judges were biased against left-wing political offenders and prone to look more leniently on the crimes of right-wing extremists. The key impediment to radical action by the state in this area was a deeply embedded respect, especially among the Liberal and Centre Party coalition partners, for the functional and personal independence of the judge. The autonomy of the judge, his freedom from political reprisals and manipulation, was seen as crucial to the integrity of the judicial process. Once this principle was enshrined in the Prussian Constitution of 1920, a thoroughgoing purge of anti-republican elements in the judiciary became impossible. Changes to the appointments procedures for new judges promised future improvement as did the setting of a compulsory retirement age. But the system, inaugurated in 1920, did not last long enough to allow these adjustments to take effect. A senator of the Supreme Court in Berlin estimated in 1932 that perhaps 5% of the judges sitting on the Prussian bench could be described as supporters of the Republic. The SPD-led government also inherited a civil service that had been socialized, schooled, recruited and trained in the imperial era, and whose allegiance to the Republic was correspondingly weak. Just how weak was revealed in March 1920,
when many provincial and district governors continued working in their offices during the Cap Ludwitz Putsch, and thus implicitly accepted the authority of the would-be usurpers. The situation was most acute in the province of East Prussia, where the entire senior bureaucracy recognized the Cap Ludwitz government. The first officeholder to tackle this problem with the required energy was the new Social Democrat interior minister, Karl Sievering, a former locksmith from Bielefeld, who had risen through the ranks of the SPD as a journalist editor and sometime Reichstag deputy. Under the Sievering system, grossly compromised individuals were dismissed, and representatives of the governing parties vetted all new appointees to political, i.e. senior civil service posts. It was not long before this practice had a marked effect on the political complexion of the senior echelons. By 1929, 291 of the 540 political civil servants in Prussia were members of the solidly Republican coalition parties, SPD, Center, and DDP. Nine of the 11 provincial governors and 21 of the 32 district governors belonged to the coalition parties. The social composition of the political elite was transformed in the process. Whereas 11 out of 12 provincial governors had been noblemen in 1918, only two of the men who served in this post over the years 1920 to 32 were of noble descent. That this transition could be effected without disrupting the operations of the state was a remarkable achievement. Policing was another area of crucial importance. The Prussian police force was far and away the largest in the country. Here too, there were nagging doubts about political loyalty, especially after the Cap Ludwitz Putsch when the Prussian police administration failed unequivocally to declare its allegiance to the government. On the 30th of March, 1920, only two weeks after the collapse of the Putsch, Otto Braun announced that he intended to institute a root and branch transformation of the Prussian security organs. Personnel reform in this area was not particularly problematic, since control over appointments lay entirely in the hands of the Interior Ministry, which, with one brief break, remained under SPD control until 1932. Responsibility for overseeing personnel policy fell to the decidedly Republican head of the police department from 1923, Wilhelm Arbeck, who saw to it that adherents of the Republican parties were appointed to all key posts. By the late 1920s, the upper echelons of the police force had been comprehensively republicanized. Of 30 Prussian police presidents on the 1st of January, 1928, Fifteen were Social Democrats, five belonged to the Center, four were German Democrats, DDP, and three were members of the German People's Party. The remaining three declared no political affiliation. It was official policy throughout the police service to base recruitment not only upon mental and physical aptitude, but also upon the candidates having a record of past behavior, guaranteeing that they would work in a positive sense for the state. Yet doubts remained about the political reliability of the police force. The great majority of officers and men were former military men, who brought military manners and attitudes with them into the service. Among senior police cadres, there was still a strong old Prussian reserve officer element with informal links to various right-wing organizations. The mood in most police units was anti-communist and conservative, rather than specifically republican. They saw the enemies of the state on the left, including the left wing of the SPD, the party of the government, rather than among the extremists on the right, whom they viewed with indulgence, if not sympathy. A police officer who openly proclaimed his pro-Republican allegiance was likely to remain an outsider. The center party functionary, Markus Heimansberg, was a man of modest social origin, who rose swiftly through the ranks under the protection of SPD Interior Minister Karl Sievering. But he was widely resented among his fellow senior officers as a political appointment and remained socially isolated. Others who were less protected suffered the discriminations of their colleagues and risked being passed over for promotion. In many locations, policemen of known Republican sentiment were ostracized from the gregarious and professionally important after-hours sociability of the regulars' table at the local pub. Ultimately, the record of the Prussian state government has to be judged in the light of what was realistically possible in the circumstances. A purge of the old judiciary would have run against the ideological grain of the centre and liberal parties, as well as the right wing of the SPD, 
all of whom held dear the principle of the Reichsstaat, in which the judge enjoys immunity from political interference. It is certainly true that some right-wing Prussian judges handed down biased verdicts in political cases, but the importance of these verdicts was diminished by the frequency of amnesties for political offenders and has probably been exaggerated in the literature on political justice in the Weimar Republic. It is clear that in the longer term, the new recruitment age and the new state guidelines for judicial appointments would have facilitated the formation of a comprehensively republic judiciary. As far as the civil service is concerned, an all-out purge of government personnel was out of the question, given the shortage of qualified republican substitutes and the moderate outlook of the Prussian coalition. In the case of the police, installing a pro-republican leadership cadre while retaining the services of the bulk of officers and men from the old regime looked like the best way to ensure the stability and effectiveness of the service, especially in the unstable early years. The coalition governments thus opted to pursue a policy of gradual republicanization. What they could not know was that German Republic would be extinguished before there was time for this program to fulfill its potential. The real threat to Prussia's existence did not in any case stem from the state civil service, but from powerful interests outside the state that remained dedicated to the downfall of the Republic. The threat of a Spartacist uprising was neutralized in 1919-20, but the extreme left continued to attract significant electoral support. Indeed, the Communists were the only party whose tally of votes increased with every single Prussian election, from 7.4% in 1921 to 13.2% in 1933. Less ideologically homogenous but equally radical and determined and far more numerous were the forces mustered on the right. It is one of the salient features of Weimar politics in Prussia, as in Germany more generally, that the conservative interest, for lack of a better term, never accommodated itself to the political culture of the new republic. The post-war years saw the emergence of a large, fragmented and radicalized right-wing opposition that refused to accept the legitimacy of the new order. The most important organizational focal point for right-wing politics in Weimar Prussia before 1930 was the German Nationalist Party, or DNVP. Founded on the 29th of November, 1918, the DNVP was in formal terms a successor organization to the Prussian conservative parties of the pre-war era. The first DNVP program was published on the 24th of November, 1918, in the Kreuzzeitung, the conservative organ founded in Berlin during the 1848 revolutions. Taken as a whole, however, the DNVP represented a new force in Prussian politics. East Elbian agrarians were no longer so dominant within its social constituency, since the party also catered to a large contingent of urban white-collar employees ranging from clerks, secretaries and office assistants to middle and upper management. Of the 49 DNVP deputies elected to the Prussian Constituent Assembly on the 26th of January, 1919, only 14 had served in the Prussian land tag before 1918. The party was a rainbow coalition of interests, ranging from pragmatic moderate conservatives, a minority, to the enthusiasts of a monarchist restoration, ultranationalists, conservative revolutionaries, and exponents of a racist, folkish radicalism. In this sense, the party occupied an uncomfortable position somewhere between the old Prussian conservatism and the extremist organizations of the new German right. The politico-cultural matrix of the old East Elbian provincial conservatism no longer existed. It had been in flux since the 1890s. After 1918, it dissolved entirely. First, there was the damage inflicted on conservative networks by the revolution of 1918-19. to Virtually the entire apparatus of privilege that had sustained the agrarian political lobby was swept away. The abolition of the three-class franchise destroyed at one stroke the electoral basis for conservative political hegemony, while the abdication of the crown and the proclamation of a republic decapitated the old system of privilege and patronage that had secured for the agrarian nobility an unparalleled leverage on public office. Even at regional and local level, the recruitment policies of the new SPD-led government soon began to change the scene, as provincial governors and district commissioners of the old school made way for Republican successors. All this came at a time of unprecedented economic disruption. The removal of restrictions on strikes and collective bargaining by farm labourers 
and the repeal of the old servants' law raised the pressure on wages across the farming sector. Tax reforms dismantled the fiscal exemptions that had always been a structural feature of Prussian agriculture. The new republic was also far less receptive to the protectionist arguments of the farmers than its imperial predecessors. Grain tariffs were lowered to facilitate industrial exports, and there was a dramatic rise in food imports, even after the reintroduction of a reduced tariff in 1925. Under the impact of rising taxes and interest rates, galloping debt, wage pressures, and the misallocation of capital during the inflation, many food producers, especially among the larger estates, went into bankruptcy. These pressures did not let up after the currency stabilization of 1924. On the contrary, the later years of the Weimar Republic were a period of unpredictable price fluctuations, depression, and crisis for the agricultural sector. There was also a religious dimension to the dissolution of what remained of the old conservative milieu. For the Protestants of the Church of the Prussian Union, who comprised the majority of the population in the East Elbian provinces, the loss of the king was a more than merely political event. The Unionist Church had always been a specifically royal institution. The King of Prussia was ex officio, Supreme Bishop of the Union, with extensive patronage powers and a prominent place in the liturgical life of the congregation. William II, in particular, had taken his ecclesiastical executive role very seriously indeed. The termination of the monarchy in an institution thus brought a measure of institutional disorientation to Prussia's Protestants, heightened by the loss, to Prussia and Germany, of substantial Protestant areas in West Prussia and the former province of Posen, and by the openly secular and anti-Christian demeanour of some prominent Republican political figures. That the Catholic Centre Party had managed to secure an influential place at the heart of the new system was a further irritant. Many Prussian Protestants responded to these developments by turning their backs on the Republic and voting in great numbers for the DNVP, which, despite early overtures to the Catholic electorate, remained an overwhelmingly Protestant party. Our special difficulty, one senior clergyman observed in September 1930, lies in the fact that the most loyal members of our church are opposed to the existing form of government. There were signs of an accelerating fragmentation and radicalization of religious rhetoric and belief. It became fashionable after 1918 to rationalize the legitimacy of the evangelical church through an appeal to its national and ethnic German vocation. The Union for German Church, founded in 1921 by Joachim Nielich, a Protestant teacher at the French Gymnasium in Berlin, was one of many folkish religious groups founded in the early years of the Weimar Republic. Nielich became well known as the exponent of a racist Christian creed, rooted in the notion that Jesus had been a heroic fighter and godseeker of Nordic lineage. In 1925, the Union merged with the newly founded German Christians' Union. Their joint program included calls for a German national church, a German Bible reflecting the German moral character, and a promotion of racial hygiene in Germany. The influence of ultra-nationalist and ethnocentric thinking was not confined to the margins of church life. After 1918, the care of the German Protestant communities marooned in territories transferred to the new Polish Republic took on symbolic importance. Protestants, especially in the truncated state of Prussia, equated the predicament of their church with the condition of the German people as a whole. Folk and fatherland was the official theme of the second German Protestant Church Congress held in Königsberg in 1927. Closely linked with this shift in emphasis was an increasingly strident strain of anti-Semitism. A publication of 1927 by the Union for German Church declared that Christ, as the divine transfiguration of Siegfried, would eventually break the neck of the Jewish satanic snake with his iron fist. During the 1920s, there was agitation by a range of Christian groups to end official collections for the mission to the Jews. And in March 1930, the General Synod of the Old Prussian Union voted to cease defining the mission as an official beneficiary of church funding. Dismayed by this decision, the president of the Berlin Mission composed a circular letter to the consistories and provincial church councils of the Prussian State Church, warning against the insidious influence of anti-Semitism and observing that the number of clergymen within the Prussian Union who had succumbed to anti-Semitism was astonishingly and terrifyingly high. High-ranking academics at the Prussian theological faculties were among those who saw in the Jewish minority a menace to German Volkstum, 
and a survey of Protestant Sunday papers in the years from 1918 to 1933 reveals the strength of ultra-nationalist and anti-Jewish sentiment in Protestant circles. It was in part as a consequence of these processes of reorientation and radicalization that the National Socialists found it so easy to establish themselves within the East Elbian Protestant milieu. And what of the old Prussian elite, the Junkers, who had once ruled the roost in East Elbia? This was the social group most exposed to the transformations unleashed by defeat and revolution. For the older generation of the Prussian military nobility, defeat and revolution brought a traumatic sense of loss. On the 21st of December, 1918, General von Tchertschke, commander of the 3rd Guards Regiment of Ulan and a former wing adjutant to the Emperor, ordered his regiment to form up for a final parade in Potsdam. There he stood, the wine-loving old warrior, with his smart Emperor Wilhelm moustaches and a stentorian voice that thundered across the whole of Bornstedt Field, and the tears poured down over his rough cheeks. Ceremonies of this type, and there were many such, were self-consciously historical rituals of renunciation and withdrawal, acknowledgments that the old world was passing. Siegfried Count Eulenborg, the last commander of the first foot guards, gave expression to this sense of closure in a leave-taking ceremony, orchestrated in the winter of 1918 in the deathly stillness of the garrison church in Potsdam. There was a shared awareness, one participant recalled, that the old order had collapsed and no longer had a future. But these elegant performances did not typify the general mood within the Prussian noble families. Although some noblemen, especially of the older generation, accepted the verdict of events in a spirit of fatalism and withdrawal, others, especially of the younger generation, displayed a determination to remain the masters of the moment and to reconquer their ancestral leadership positions. In many areas of East Albia, the nobility, operating through the agencies of the Agrarian League, was astonishingly successful in infiltrating local revolutionary organizations and orienting the politics of rural organizations away from leftist redistributive goals towards the agrarian bloc politics of the old regime. Noblemen dominated the Homeland League East Prussia, for example, an agrarian group that expounded ultra-nationalist and anti-democratic political objectives. Many younger noblemen, especially from the lesser families, played a prominent role in the formation of the Free Corps that crushed the extreme left during the early months of the Republic. These men experienced the ultra-violence of the Free Corps as liberation, an intoxicating release from the sense of loss and precipitous decline that attended the events of 1918-19. The memoirs of noble Free Corps activists published during the early years of the Republic reveal the total abandonment of traditional chivalric codes and the adoption of a brutal, uninhibited, anti-Republican hypermasculine warrior persona, ready to deal out murderous and indiscriminate violence against an ideologically defined enemy. The extinction of the Prussian monarchy was an existential shock for the East Elbian nobility, more perhaps than for any other social group. I feel as if I can no longer live without our Kaiser and King, wrote the magnate Dietloff Count Arnim Boitzenborg, the last president of the Prussian upper house, in January 1919. But the attitude of most nobles to the exiled king and his family, remained ambivalent. For many representatives of the Prussian nobility, the ignominious circumstances of the monarch's departure, and particularly his failure to preserve the prestige of his crown by sacrificing himself in battle, impeded any genuine identification with the last occupant of the Prussian throne. Monarchism thus never developed into an ideological formation capable of providing the conservative nobility as a whole with a coherent and stable political standpoint. Noblemen, especially of the younger generation, drifted away from the personal, flesh-and-blood monarchism of their fathers and forebears, towards the diffuse idea of a leader of the people, whose charisma and natural authority would fill the vacuum created by the departure of the king. We find a characteristic articulation of this longing in the diary jottings of Count Andreas von bernstorff wiedendorf descendant of a line of distinguished servants of the Prussian throne. Only a dictator can help us now one who will sweep an iron broom through this whole international parasitic scum. If only we had, like the Italians, a Mussolini. In short, within the Prussian nobility, as across the East Elbian conservative milieu, the Weimar years witnessed a drastic radicalization of political expectations. By the late 1920s, 
the experience of repeated crises had fragmented the agrarian political landscape, generating a profusion of special interest groups and movements of increasingly radical protest. The chief beneficiaries of this volatility were the Nazis, whose 1930 party program promised to place the entire rural sector on a privileged footing through the regime of tariffs and price controls. Farmers who were disillusioned by the DNVP's failure to secure benefits for the rural sector now deserted the party in search of a more radical alternative. In all, one-third of the voters who had supported the DNVP in the national elections of 1928 switched to the Nazis in the elections of 1930. The efforts of the nationalist leadership to win back the renegades by hardening the party's anti-republican course were in vain. Among those who were drawn to the National Socialist Movement were numerous members of the East Elbian nobility. A particularly striking case was that of the Vidal family, an old Pomeranian military lineage whose forebears had fought with distinction in every Prussian war since the foundation of the kingdom. No fewer than 77 Vidals joined the NSDAP, the largest contingent from any German noble family. Nowhere was popular electoral support for the Nazis greater than in the Masurian areas of southern East Prussia, where the summer election campaign of 1932 brought forth the bizarre spectacle of national socialist political rallies in Polish. In July 1932, 70.6% of voters in the Masurian district of Luk supported the Nazis, a higher figure than anywhere else in the Reich. The percentages for nearby Neidenborg and Johannesburg were only fractionally lower. In the March elections of 1933, Masuria once again led the Reich in its support for the Nazis, with 81% in Neidenborg, 80.38% in Luck, and 76.6% in Ortelsburg, where Friedrich William III had once paused with Queen Louisa during their flight from the French. Prussia dissolved. The German national elections of September 1930 brought the first major electoral breakthrough for the National Socialists. In the previous elections of May 1928, there had been a splinter party with just 2.6% of the votes. Under the current constitution of the Federal Republic of Germany, they would not have qualified for entry into Parliament at all. And had the Reichstag of 1928 been allowed to live out its natural lifetime, this would have remained unchanged until 1932. But in September 1930, thanks to a Reichstag dissolution conducted on the authority of the Reich president, Paul von Hindenburg, the Nazis were returned with 18.3%. The number of Nazi voters rose from 810,000 to 6.4 million. The number of their deputies from 12 to 107. This was the greatest gain ever to be made by any party in German history, from one Reichstag election to the next. It completely transformed the landscape of German politics. The Prussian administration was shielded from this upheaval by the fact that there was no election in the state that year. The Prussian Landtag of 1928 remained in session and was allowed, like all its predecessors, to live out its four-year term. Within the state legislature, the Nazis remained a small splinter party, but there were many auguries of danger. Most importantly, it now became impossible for the Prussian state administration and the German national government to collaborate in addressing the threat posed by the extreme right. Under the SPD-led national government of Hermann Müller, 1928-30, the German and Prussian administrations had agreed on the need to counter the threat posed by the National Socialist Movement. The means of doing so were provided by the Weimar Constitution which expressly forbade public servants to engage in political activity of any kind on behalf of a group deemed to be anti-constitutional. On the 25th of May, 1930, the Prussian government issued an order making it illegal for Prussian civil servants to be members of the NSDAP, or the Communist Party, KPD. Brown urged his colleagues in the national government to follow suit with a federal prohibition. The SPD Reich Interior Minister, Karl Sievering, agreed, and preparations were put in train to have the Nazis banned as an anti-constitutional organization. Had this measure succeeded, it would have enabled the cabinet to prevent the infiltration of government bodies, including the German army, by card-carrying national socialists. Action could also have been taken against the Thuringian state government, where the appointment of the national socialist Heinrich Frick to the Interior Ministry had opened the door to a rapid infiltration of the bureaucracy by Nazis. 
things changed after the September elections. Heinrich Brüning, Mueller's successor as Chancellor, dropped the idea of a ban, stating publicly that it would be fatal to make the mistake of regarding the NSDAP as a threat comparable to the Communist Party. He continued to play down the threat posed by the Nazis, even after the discovery in 1931 of a cache of documents belonging to an SA leader that contained plans for a violent overthrow of the Weimar regime, and lists of death sentences to be carried out thereafter. Brüning's long-term aim was to replace the Weimar constitution with something closer to the old imperial one. This goal could be achieved only if the left were disabled and pushed out of politics. Brüning planned to dislodge the SPD from their Prussian stronghold by merging the office of Prussian minister-president with that of Reich Chancellor, a return to the Bismarckian model of 1871. At the same time, Brüning aimed to exclude the Social Democrats from the exercise of political power altogether through the creation of an integrated right-wing power bloc that would incorporate the Nazis in a subordinate role. In pursuit of this objective, the Brüning administration directly obstructed the efforts of the Prussian government to neutralize the Nazi movement. In December 1931, Albert Chesinski, police president of Berlin, a former interior minister of Prussia and one of the most energetic defenders of democracy against extremism, persuaded Otto Braun to have Adolf Hitler arrested. But Brüning refused to allow the arrest to go ahead. The Prussians were informed that if they attempted to deport Hitler, Reich President Hindenburg would countermand the order, using an emergency decree that had already been drawn up for the purpose. On the 2nd of March, 1932, Prussian Minister-President Otto Braun sent Heinrich Brüning a 200-page dossier, analyzing in detail the activities of the NSDAP and demonstrating that the party was a seditious organization dedicated to undermining the constitution and overthrowing the republic. Accompanying the dossier was a letter informing the Chancellor that a Prussia-wide prohibition of the SA was imminent. Only now, under pressure, did Brüning respond by urging Hindenburg to support nationwide action against the Nazis. The result was the emergency decree of the 13th of April, 1932, banning all national socialist paramilitary organizations throughout the Reich. This was a victory of sorts. In a limited way, the Prussian state was fulfilling its promise as the bulwark of democracy in the Weimar Republic. But the position of the Republican coalition remained extremely fragile. It seemed reasonable to assume that the millions who had voted Nazi in the national elections of September 1930 might well do so again at the next Prussian election of 1932. The size of the problem was made clear in February 1931 when a loose alliance of right-wing parties, including the DNVP and the Nazis, secured the introduction of a plebiscite proposing the dissolution of the Prussian land tag. When the plebiscite went to the polls in August 1931, it received the support of no fewer than 9.8 million Prussians, with a marked concentration in the agrarian eastern provinces. Not enough to secure dissolution, but worrying nonetheless. In many areas, new recruits were still streaming to the Nazi stormtroopers, despite the government ban on their activities in Upper and Lower Silesia. The numbers of now clandestine SA members jumped from 17,500 in December 1931 to 34,500 in July 1932. Street violence remained a problem, as Nazis, communists, police, and men of the Reichsbanner, a Republican militia, slugged it out on the streets with blackjacks, brass knuckles, and firearms. By the spring of 1932, as preparations got underway for the next state elections, it was clear that the result would leave the Prussian government without a democratic majority. The Prussian elections of 24th of April, 1932, confirmed the worst fears of the beleaguered Republicans. In an election marked by an exceptionally high rate of participation, 81%, the Nazis weighed in with 36.3% of the popular vote. The main victim of this success was the DNVP, whose share shrank to 6.9%, and the Liberal DDP and DVP, which collapsed into splinter parties controlling 1.5% each. The Communists registered their best result to date, with 12.8%. A curious interregnum thus ensued. Under the revised procedural regulations of the Prussian Landtag, the right-wing anti-republican opposition could not accede to power because it was incapable of mustering a majority. 
a coalition with the communists was out of the question. So the SPD-led government coalition under Otto Brown remained nominally in office, though it was unable to command a majority and was thus dependent on its emergency powers. On the 14th of July, 1932, the annual state budget had to be passed by emergency decree. Democratic Prussia had lost its mandate. At the national level, too, there were ominous political developments with far-reaching consequences for the state of Prussia. By the spring of 1932, the conservatives in President Hindenburg's entourage and the president himself had lost faith in Brüning. He had made no progress against these social democrats in Prussia. He had also done nothing to integrate the right into a conservative bloc capable of driving the left out of politics. In the presidential elections of the 10th of April, 1932, to Hindenburg's profound consternation, the right-wing parties all put forward their own candidates, leaving the Centre Party and the Social Democrats to vote the 84-year-old incumbent back into office. Hindenburg, once a celebrated figurehead of the nationalist right, had become the candidate of socialists and Catholics. Nothing could better have demonstrated the failure of Brunning's plans to prepare the way for a conservative restoration. Hindenburg was thus in an ill humour when his attention was drawn to legislation under preparation by the Brunning government to partition a number of financially unviable East Elbian estates and parcel them out as small holdings for the unemployed. For Hindenburg, himself a landowner with numerous close connections to the Junker milieu, this amounted to agrarian Bolshevism. Brunning had no majority in the Reichstag and he had forfeited the support of the president. On the 30th of May, 1932, he drew the consequences and resigned. Brunning's departure removed the last semblance of a functioning Weimar democracy. What replaced him was a junta of ultra-conservatives, determined to dismantle the republic system without delay. Hindenburg appointed the new chancellor, Franz von Papen, on the 1st of June, 1932. Papen was a Westphalian nobleman and landowner, an old friend of the president, and a man of truly reactionary instincts. The most influential figure in the cabinet was the Reichswehr minister Kurt von Schleicher, a seasoned intriguer who had persuaded the president to appoint Papen. Another key player was Reich interior minister Wilhelm von Geil. Geil, Papen and Schleicher disagreed on a number of tactical issues, but they were all enthusiastic exponents of a conservative new state that would do away with political parties and cut back the powers of elected assemblies at every level. They also agreed that the time had come to roll back the Republican system. The first step was to appease the Nazis and win them over to collaboration on terms acceptable to the Conservatives. Hitler had long been calling for further Reichstag dissolution, and on the 4th of June, only three days after his appointment, Chancellor von Papen secured a decree of dissolution from the President. Ten days later, he suspended the nationwide ban on the SS and SA in return for a promise from Hitler that the Nazi Reichstag fraction would not oppose his continuation in office or vote down his emergency decrees. The integration of the right had begun. Prussia was next on the list. Kurt von Schleicher, the most influential figure in the Camarilla around Reich President Paul von Hindenburg, had long been in favour of using presidential emergency powers to do away with the Prussian government by transferring its responsibilities to the national executive. In a cabinet meeting of the 11th of July, 1932, the new interior minister, Wilhelm Freiherr von Geil, called for what he described as a final solution of the Prussian problem. The young, ever larger and more inclusive circles of the Adolf Hitler movement must, in order to render the forces of the nation useful to the reconstruction of the people, free itself from the chains that were laid upon it by Brüning and Zievering, and must be supported in this victorious struggle against international communism. In order to free the way for this task, and in order to strike a blow against the socialist Catholic coalition in Prussia, the dualism between the Reich and Prussia must be eliminated once and for all through the removal of the Prussian government. Since Geil had already agreed these points in separate meetings with Papen and Schleicher, his proposals went uncontested. Five days later, on the 16th of July, Papen informed his cabinet colleagues that he had a blank check from the Reich president to proceed against Prussia. While the plans for the presidential clique matured, 
the Nazis were making the fullest use of the opportunities created by Papen's suspension of the ban against the SS and the SA. From the 12th of June, Nazi stormtroopers swarmed back onto the streets in search of a final reckoning with the communists. There was a wave of street violence. The mayhem reached a high point in Altena, a busy harbour and manufacturing town adjoining Hamburg, but situated within the Prussian province of Holstein. Here, on the bloody Sunday of the 17th of July, 1932, the Nazis mounted a provocative procession through the working class and largely communist quarter of the town. In the melee that followed, 18 were killed, most by police gunfire, and over 100 wounded. Papen and his colleagues saw their moment. Arguing that the Prussian government had failed in its duty to impose law and order within its territory, a fantastically cynical charge, given that it was Papen himself who had suspended the ban on the paramilitary organizations, the Chancellor secured from Hindenburg an emergency decree on the 20th of July, 1932, deposing the government of Minister-President Otto Braun and replacing the Prussian ministers with commissary agents of the national executive. Albert Chesinski, his deputy president of police in Berlin, Bernhard Weiss, and Marcus Heimansburg, the center party man who had risen through the ranks to a senior post in the service, were all imprisoned and then released when they undertook to withdraw peacefully from their official duties. A state of emergency was declared in Berlin. The SPD leadership responded with profound passivity and resignation to this utterly illegal maneuver. It had been known for some weeks that an action of this kind was being prepared, but no attempt was made to plan or organize resistance. In December 1931, the Social Democrats had formed a defense organization called the Iron Front, consisting of a militia called the Reichsbanner, various union organizations, and a network of workers' sporting clubs. But it was not mobilized or even placed on alert. Even after the events of the 17th of July in Altona, when the SPD in Berlin learned that a coup was imminent, nothing was done. On the contrary, at a meeting held on the day after Bloody Sunday, the party leadership agreed not to issue a call for a general strike, and not to authorize armed resistance. This was encouraging, to say the least, for Papen and his co-conspirators, who could now be fairly sure that the coup would pass without serious opposition. The reasons for this regrettable lethargy are easy enough to discern. The Prussian Social Democrats and their coalition allies were already demoralized by their failure to assemble a majority in the Landtag after the state elections of April 1932. As principal Democrats, they felt politically undermined by the verdict of the electorate. For a legally-minded man such as Otto Braun, the move from officialdom into insurgency did not come naturally. I have been a Democrat for 40 years, he told his secretary, and I am not about to become a guerrilla chief. Brown and many of his associates thought the centralization of the Reich and the partitioning of Prussia were inevitable in the long run. Did this perhaps disincline them to take a stand over the issue of state rights, however appalled they might be by the political machinations behind the coup? The balance of forces was in any case stacked against the Prussian government. The call for a general strike, the weapon that had brought down Kapp and Ludwitz in 1920, would have been futile, given the high level of unemployment in 1932. There had always been friction between the Prussian ministries and the army ministry in Berlin and it was clear that the Reichswehr leadership did not oppose the foreclosure of Prussia. Resisting the coup might thus mean a fight between the Prussian police and the German army, and it was uncertain how police units would react. The Nazis had been quite successful in some areas in infiltrating police social networks. It was forbidden under the decree of the 25th of June, 1930, for policemen to be active national socialists, but the Nazis got around this by placing activists within the association of former police officers a body of conservative outlook that was receptive to the Nazi critique of the Republic and maintained multifarious links with the men still in active service. Had they been raised, the 200,000 paramilitaries of the Republican Reichsbanner would have faced Nazi and conservative militia forces numbering over 700,000. Finally, there was the fact that the Social Democratic Minister President Otto Braun was ill, not to mention physically and emotionally exhausted. Instead, the Prussian coalition leaders looked to the German Constitutional Court in Leipzig, which they presumed would declare the coup illegal, and to the forthcoming national elections, which they believed would punish the conservatives around Papen for their wanton destruction of a respected republican institution. 
both hopes were disappointed. In the national elections of the 31st of July, 1932, the Nazis emerged as the strongest party in Germany, with 37.4% of all votes cast. It was the party's greatest ever performance in a free election. In a mealy-mouthed verdict, the Constitutional Court rejected the charge that the Prussian authorities had been negligent in pursuing their duties, but failed to deliver the outright condemnations of the coup that the Democrats so desperately needed. The moment for a last-ditch defense of the Republic had passed. You only have to bear your teeth at the Reds, and they knuckle under, the Nazi propaganda chief Josef Goebbels gloated in his diary entry for the 20th of July. On the following day, he added, the Reds are finished. They have missed their big chance. It will never come again. The putsch against Prussia ushered in the terminal phase of the Weimar Republic. Papen, Schleicher, and the Cabinet of Barons, a team of conservative technocrats of noble lineage who were virtually unknown to the wider German public, began to tighten the screws. Vorwärts, the moderate daily paper of the SPD, was banned twice, and official warnings were issued to the left liberal Berliner Volkszeitung. There was also a small but significant adjustment to Prussian judicial practice. In the province of Hanover and the Colonia court district, the guillotine was still used for judicial executions. However, as Reich Commissioner for Prussia, Papen ordered on the 5th of October 1932 that the use of the guillotine, a device bearing the imprint of the French Revolution, be discontinued. In its place, state executioners were to use the older Germanic and Prussian handheld axe. Here was a clear signal of Papen's intention to roll back the French Revolution, of which the Social Democrats were the ideological heirs, and annul its historical consequences. Small wonder that some among the Nazi leadership feared the Papen government would do too much and leave nothing over for us. Papen's days in government were already numbered. During the chancellorship of Heinrich Brüning, the SPD had tolerated the chancellor in order to secure the system against a Nazi challenge. But after the coup against Prussia, Papen forfeited any hope of further support from the Social Democrats. Frustrated by the intrigues of Papen and his collaborators, the Nazis too returned to open opposition. There was now no prospect that the chancellor would be able to muster a majority within the new parliament. On the 12th of September, 1932, the new Reichstag passed a vote of no confidence. The motion had the support of 512 deputies. Only 42 deputies supported Papen. There were five abstentions. It was hardly a workable parliamentary base. There were now two possibilities. The Papen government could once again dissolve the Reichstag and announce new elections. Then, at least they would have three months' time, 60 days until the election and 30 more until the new Reichstag met. 90 days of reprieve before the process restarted itself. German democracy had been reduced to this, the machine-like repetition of the electoral reflex at the heart of the Republic, a rhythmic spasm that would eventually tear the system apart. But there was an alternative, namely the dissolution of the Reichstag, without elections. There was even a precedent for this course of action in Prussian history. Bismarck's open break with the Prussian parliament during the constitutional crisis in 1862. At that time, Bismarck had succeeded in overcoming a deadlock between government and parliament by breaking the constitution and ruling without legislature. This alternative was open to Papen and Hindenburg. Reich President Hindenburg was old enough, he was born in 1847, to have lived as a young adult through the crisis of the 1860s. He was also a man of Bismarck's own class and social background, whose family must have followed these events with intense interest. Papen considered the option of a Bismarckian coup d'etat, but turned it down. It was clear that a coup would bring grave risks. It might even provoke civil war. This possibility was discussed in the National Cabinet. There was also uncertainty about the attitude of the Reichswehr, whose political spokesman, Kurt von Schleicher, was fast emerging as the Chancellor's rival. Papen thus opted to call yet another election for the 6th of November, 1932. But the results of this contest, in which the Nazis shed a few percentage points but remained the strongest party, made it clear that a new Reichstag would be no more willing to tolerate Papen as Chancellor than the old one had been. It was certain that the new Reichstag would use its first session to pass a vote of no confidence. Papen had to go. He was replaced on the 1st of December 
1932, by his former friend, Kurt von Schleicher. Schleicher's first achievement as Chancellor was to get the Reichstag to agree not to meet until after Christmas. Elections during the Christmas season, and for the third time in one year, would have been too much for the German folk to bear. The Reichstag's Council of Elders agreed that Parliament would not meet again until the 31st of January, 1933. By the time it did so, Franz von Papen had persuaded his old friend, Hindenburg, to appoint Hitler Reich Chancellor. After extensive negotiations behind the scenes, Papen was able to make Hindenburg an offer he couldn't refuse. Hitler had agreed that if he were to be appointed Chancellor, he would take only two National Socialists into the cabinet. The other seven ministers would be Conservatives, and Papen himself would be Vice-Chancellor. Hemmed in thus, Hitler would be forced to take account of the Conservative Camarilla. Within two months, Papen crowed, we will have pushed Hitler so far into a corner that it will squeak. And so it was that Hitler, as Alan Bullock put it many years ago, was jobbed into office by a backstairs intrigue. The Nazi seizure of power had not ended. On the contrary, it had just begun. But the Nazis had a few important cards in their hands. Thanks to Papen's putsch of the 20th of July, 1932, the elected state government of Prussia had been replaced by a Reich Commissariat for Prussia. This meant, among other things, that Hermann Goering could occupy a ministerial post without portfolio in the National Cabinet, and at the same time function as Commissarial Prussian Minister of the Interior, a post that placed him in charge of Germany's largest police force. During the spring of 1933, Goering would make ruthless and effective use of his Prussian policing powers. In this way, and not only in this way, the extravagant maneuvers of the conservatives around the president before January 1933 helped to smooth the way towards a national socialist monopoly of power. Threads of the Prussian legacy were thickly woven into a skein of intrigues that brought the Nazis to power. We see them in the attitude of the army, which stood aloof from the republic after 1930 assessing the situation as it unfolded and playing its own game. We see them in the susceptibility of President Hindenburg to the arguments of the East Elbian landed interest. Chancellors Brüning and Schleicher both lost credit with the president as soon as they began to support land reform initiatives involving the partitioning of bankrupt East Elbian estates. The still vivid memory of conservative hegemony in the old state of Prussia breathed life into the political fantasies of the reactionaries who helped to disable the republic. The corporate arrogance of the Prussian nobility and its presumption of a right to lead were also in evidence. Nowhere more clearly than in Franz von Papen's boast that he and his cabinet of barons had engaged Hitler, as if the Nazi leader were a part-time gardener or a passing minstrel. For Hindenburg, too, a sense of the vast difference in station and dignity between himself a field marshal of the Prussian army, and Hitler, the Austrian corporal, made it difficult to see who Hitler really was, to apprehend the threat that he represented, and to understand how easily he would dissolve convention and order in politics. But the Democrats and the Republicans of the state government were also Prussians, albeit from a very different social world. The energetic Albert Chesinski, hailed from Tolenza near Triptu in Pomerania, Born the illegitimate son of a Berlin housemaid, he completed his training as a panel beater in Berlin, before making a career as a trade union official and political activist. After the revolution, Chesinski could have taken office in the national German government. He was offered the army ministry in 1920, but he chose instead to serve the Prussian state, both as police president in Berlin, 1925-6 and 1930-32, and as interior minister. 1926-30. to 30. In both roles, he pursued a robustly Republican personnel policy. In 1927, he oversaw the drafting of laws eliminating the special police jurisdiction of the rural estate districts. In removing this last vestige of Juncker feudal privilege, Jasinski closed a fissure in the administrative fabric of the state, completed the work of the Prussian reformers of the Napoleonic era, and earned the lasting hatred of the right. As a robust anti-Nazi, Chesinski also attracted the intense loathing of the Goebbels press, which repeatedly and erroneously denounced him as a Jew in a Jewish republic. In December 1931, 
he worked on a deportation order expelling Hitler from Prussia, only to find it blocked by a national government under Brüning. In a widely noticed speech in Leipzig at the beginning of 1932, Krasinski declared it lamentable that the foreigner Hitler should be allowed to negotiate with the Reich government instead of being chased away with a dog whip. Hitler did not forget or forgive these words, and Krasinski wisely fled Germany in 1933, first for France and later for New York, where he earned his living once again as a panel beater. Here was a career driven by a deep commitment, not only to democracy as such, but to the specific historical calling of the Prussian state and its institutions. The same can be said for the man who served at the helm of the Prussian state until 1932. Minister President Otto Braun, the son of a low-ranking Königsberg railway employee, Braun joined the Social Democratic Party in 1888, when it was still illegal in Bismarck's Prussia. He won notice and respect for his work among landless rural East Elbian labourers and the sharpness of his editorial pen. He had held a seat in the old Prussian land tag, one of a small band of Social Democrat deputies who managed to squeeze through the barriers of the three-class franchise. As a champion of the rural proletariat, Brown was the antitype of the old Prussian agrarian elite, whose political hegemony he helped to overthrow in 1918-19. Yet he was as emphatically and unmistakably Prussian as they. His endless appetite for work, his fastidious attention to detail, his dislike of posturing, and his profound sense of the nobility of state service were all attributes from the conventional catalogue of Prussian virtues. Even his authoritarian style of management, which earned him the nickname the Red Tsar of Prussia, could be construed as an ancestral Prussian trait. A social democrat like Otto Braun, the conservative journalist Wilhelm Stapel observed in 1932, is, for all the anti-Prussianism of his party, more a Prussian than a German. His demeanor in office is that of the Junker who leaves an ungrateful king to his own devices and grows his own cabbage. Brown even became a passionate hunter, a pastime he shared with Reich President Paul von Hindenburg. The two men hunted in adjacent areas during the season and developed a comfortable personal intimacy that allowed them to exchange views on the key political issues of the day. Here again was evidence of the curious affinity between the Social Democrat Party elite and the Prussian state that had once been its nemesis. It is striking that SPD leaders of this era found it far easier to handle the responsibilities and risks of state power in Prussia than they did in the German Reich. We might thus say that on the 20th of July, 1932, the day of the Putsch, the old Prussia destroyed the new. Or, to put it more precisely, particularist agrarian Prussia laid an axe to the universalist, state-centred Prussia of the Weimar coalition. Traditional society, one might argue, prevailed at last over the modernizing state. The descendants of von der Marwitz triumphed over the spirit of Hegel. But this metaphorical antimony, though it certainly captures part of the meaning of what happened in the summer of 1932, is perhaps too neat. The men of the Putsch against Prussia were hardly Junkers of the classic type. Papen was a Westphalian Catholic, Wilhelm von Geil a Rhinelander. Both were, in this sense, marginal Prussians. Even Kurt von Schleicher, though the son of a Silesian officer, was an untypical figure, a political intriguer from outside the provincial landowning elite. His politics, a hybrid blend of authoritarian corporatism and constitutionalism, remained difficult to pigeonhole. All three men pursued a politics of the nation, not of the Prussian state, and certainly not of the Prussian province. Hindenburg, the man at the centre of events in 1932, is a complex case. As an East Elbian estate owner and celebrated commanding officer, Hindenburg appeared to embody the Prussian tradition, but his life was formed by the forces that unified the German Reich. He was 18 when he fought at Kunigretz during the Austrian War of 1866. He held from the province of Posen, an area of heightened nationalist antagonism between Germans and Poles. Having returned from retirement at the beginning of the First World War, he used his role at the apex of the German forces on the Eastern Front to challenge and hollow out the authority of the Prussian-German civilian executive. He blackmailed the Kaiser, to whom he professed the deepest personal loyalty, into compliance with his projects, which included the catastrophic policy 
of unconditional submarine warfare. A provocative and futile campaign that brought the United States into the war and doomed Germany to defeat at the hands of our enemies. One by one, he picked off the Kaiser's closest allies, including Chancellor Theobald von bietmann holweg and drove them out of politics. This was not the one-off conscientious objection of a Zeidlitz or a York. It was a systematic insubordination born of vast ambition and an utter disregard of any interest or authority outside the military hierarchy that he himself dominated. At the same time, Hindenburg deliberately cultivated the national obsession with his own person, projecting the image of an indomitable Germanic warrior that overshadowed the increasingly marginal figure of the Emperor King. Although Hindenburg was among those who urged William II to abdicate and flee to Holland in November 1918, he subsequently shrouded himself in the mantle of a principled monarchism. Later again, on the ascending of the office of Reich President in 1925 and on his reappointment in 1932, he put aside his monarchist convictions to swear a solemn oath to the republican constitution of the German Empire. In the last days of September 1918, Hindenburg urgently pressed the German civilian government to initiate ceasefire negotiations, yet he later disassociated himself entirely from the resulting peace, leaving the civilians to carry the responsibility and the opprobrium. On the 17th of June, 1919, when the government of Friedrich Ebert was deliberating over whether to accept the terms of the Versailles Treaty, Hindenburg conceded in writing that further military resistance would be hopeless. Yet only a week later, when President Ebert called the Supreme Command for a clear formal decision in support of acceptance, the field marshal contrived to be absent from the telephone room during the call, leaving his colleague Wilhelm Gruner to play the bête noire, as Hindenburg himself put it. Hindenburg went even further. In perhaps the most mythopoeic moment of a myth-saturated career, he claimed in November 1919, before the commission investigating the causes of the German defeat, that the German armies in the field had not been vanquished by the enemy powers, but by a cowardly stab in the back from the home front. This conceit would haunt the Republic throughout its short life, tainting the new political elite with intimations of treachery and betrayal of the nation. As Reich president after 1925, Hindenburg developed, despite all the social distance between them, an unlikely friendship with the conscientious social democratic Prussian minister-president Otto Braun. In 1932, when Hindenburg stood for re-election for the presidency, Brown endorsed the old man warmly as the embodiment of calm and consistency, a manly loyalty and devotion to duty for the whole people. Yet in 1932, presented with the schemes of the conservative Camarilla, Hindenburg abandoned his erstwhile friend without, as it seems, the slightest compunction, withdrawing from his solemn constitutional oaths of 1925 and 1932 to make common cause with the sworn enemies of the Republic, and then, having publicly declared that he would never consent to appoint Hitler to any post more elevated than Minister of Postal Services, Hindenburg levered the Austrian Nazi leader into the German Chancellery in January 1933. The Field Marshal had a high opinion of himself, and he doubtless sincerely believed that he personified a Prussian tradition of selfless service. But he was not, in truth, a man of tradition. He was not in any deterministic sense a product of the old Prussia, but rather of the flexible power politics that fashioned the new Germany. As a military commander and later as Germany's head of state, Hindenburg broke virtually every bond he entered into. He was not the man of dogged faithful service, but the man of image, manipulation and betrayal. Prussia and the Third Reich on the 21st of March, 1933, the garrison church at Potsdam provided the setting for a ceremony marking the inauguration of the new Germany under Adolf Hitler. The occasion was the opening of the new Reichstag, following the national elections of the 5th of March, 1933. It was a festivity that would usually have been conducted in the Reichstag building itself, but on the 27th of February, the Dutch leftist Marinus van der Lubbe had torched the building reducing the main chamber to a blackened ruin. Built by Friedrich William I in 1735, the garrison church was an eloquent memorial to Prussia's military history. Mounted on the church tower was a weather vane bearing the initials FWR, 
and the iron silhouette of a Prussian eagle aspiring towards a gilded sun. Trumpets, flags, and cannon, rather than angels or biblical figures, decorated the stone of the chancel. The tombs of the soldier king, Friedrich William I, and his illustrious son, Friedrich the Great, lay side by side in the crypt. Josef Goebbels, the Nazi propaganda chief, saw immediately the symbolic potential of this historic setting, and he took personal control of the preparations, planning the event in painstaking detail as a propaganda spectacle. After all, as he noted in a diary entry of the 16th of March, 1933, this was the moment when the new state, inaugurated by Hitler's appointment to the chancellorship, would present itself symbolically for the first time. The day of Potsdam, as it has come to be known, was a concentrated act of political communication. It offered the image of a synthesis, even a mystical union, between the old Prussia and the new Germany. Veterans of the wars of unification were ferried to the town to take part in the festivities. The flags of the most venerable Prussian regiments, including the renowned 9th Infantry, whose recruits were traditionally sworn in under the vaults of the garrison church, were placed on prominent display. The streets of the city were decked with German, Imperial, Prussian and Swastika flags. The red, black and gold tricolor of the Weimar Republic was nowhere to be seen. Even the date was significant. Goebbels had chosen the 21st of March, not only because it was the official first day of spring, but also because it was the anniversary of the opening of the first German Reichstag, after the proclamation of the German Reich in January 1871. At the center of the proceedings was Reich President Hindenburg. Decked out in full uniform, glittering with medals of every shape and size, and clutching his filled marshal's baton in his right hand, Hindenburg processed at a stately pace through the streets of the old town, past ranks of Reichswehr men and brown-shirted paramilitaries with their arms raised in salute. As he took up his prominent seat before the altar, he turned to acknowledge with a solemn flourish of his marshal's baton the empty throne of the former king and emperor, William II, now in Dutch exile. This exercise in humbug was devised in part for the benefit of the two Hohenzollern princes in attendance, one in the traditional uniform of the Death's Head Hussars, the other in the brown outfit of an SA man. In his speech to the assembled guests, Hindenburg expressed the hope that the ancient spirit of this place of renown would enthuse a new generation of Germans. Prussia had earned greatness through never-failing courage and love of fatherland. Might the same apply to the new Germany? In his reply from the reader's lectern, Hitler, wearing a dark, tailored lounge suit rather than his party uniform, expressed his profound veneration for Hindenburg and gave thanks for the providence that had placed this indomitable warlord at the head of the movement for Germany's renewal. He closed with the words that summed up the propagandist function of the ceremony. As we stand in this space that is holy to every German, may providence bestow upon us that courage and that steadfastness that we feel as we struggle for the freedom and greatness of our people at the foot of the tombs of the greatest kings. Having shaken hands before the congregation, the two men laid wreaths on the tombs of the Prussian kings, while a battery of Reichswehr guns outside the church fired a salute, and the choir within belted out the Leuten Choral. There followed a military review through the streets of the city. Goebbels recalled the moment in an effusive diary entry. The Reich president stands on a raised platform, the field marshal's baton in his hand, and greets army, SA, SS, and Stahlhelm as they march past him. He stands and waves. Over the whole scene shines the eternal sun, and God's hand stands invisibly bestowing his blessing over the grey city of Prussian greatness and duty. The celebration of Prussiandom was a consistent strand of national socialist ideology and propaganda. The right-wing ideologue and inventor of the idea of the Third Reich, Arthur Müller van der Broek, had prophesied in 1923 that the new Germany would be a synthesis of the manly spirit of Prussia, with the feminine soul of the German nation. In Mein Kampf, published two years later, Adolf Hitler found warm words for the old Prussian state. It was the germ cell of the German Empire, which owed its very existence to the resplendent heroism and death-defying courage of its soldiers. Its history demonstrated with marvellous sharpness that not material qualities but ideal virtues alone make possible for the formation of a state. Our ears still ring, wrote the Nazi Baltic German ideologue Alfred Rosenberg in 1930, with the trumpets of Fear Berlin and the voice of the great elector, whose deeds spelt the beginning of Germany's resurrection, 
salvation, and rebirth. Whatever one might criticize in Prussia, he added, the decisive salvation of Germanic substance will remain forever its deed of renown. Without it, there would be no German culture and no trace of a German people. No one trumpeted the Prussian theme more consistently than Josef Goebbels, who became aware of its propaganda potential during a visit to Sans Souci in September 1926. Prussia thereafter remained one of the stock themes of the Goebbels' publicity machine. National Socialism, he claimed in an election speech of April 1932, can justly lay claim to Prussiandom. All over Germany, wherever we National Socialists stand, we are the Prussians. The idea we carry is Prussian. The idea we carry is Prussian. The symbols for which we fight are filled with the spirit of Prussia, and the objectives we hope to achieve are a renewed form of the ideals for which Friedrich William I, the great Friedrich, and Bismarck once strove. The continuity between the Prussian past and the National Socialist present was asserted at many levels in the cultural policy of the regime after 1933. A famous political poster depicted Hitler as the latest in a succession of German statesmen, extending from Friedrich the Great via Bismarck to Hindenburg. Shortly after the Day of Potsdam, Hitler and Goebbels reinforced public awareness of these themes with the Days of Tannenberg, a propaganda spectacle centered on the inauguration of a vast national monument on the 27th of August, 1933. Consisting of a circle of vast towers joined by massive walls, the Tannenberg Monument recalled both the defeat of the German order at the hands of the Muscovite army in 1410 and the victory of 1914, by which the Germans took revenge on their erstwhile Russian foes. It also served to project the utterly unhistorical idea that East Prussia had always been the bastion of Germandom against the Slavic East. As the victor of Tannenberg, the 87-year-old Hindenburg was once again wheeled out to perform the liturgical honours for a now irreversibly Nazified Germany. When he died almost a year later, his body, along with that of his wife, was entombed in one of the towers of the monument. In accordance with the dead man's wish that he should be buried under a single slab of East Prussian stone, the entrance to his tomb was surmounted with a huge lintel of solid granite, the Hindenburg stone. This stone had been unearthed near Kohenen in the flatlands of northern East Prussia and was well known to German geologists as one of the largest monoliths in the region. Working to tight deadlines, a team of stonemasons and mining specialists cleared the earth from around the granite mass, cut it with explosive charges and power tools into a vast oblong and transported it to the monument on a purpose-built railway. The official architecture of the Third Reich invoked a distinctively Prussian cultural heritage. We see it in the three Ordensborgen constructed during the Third Reich at Krusensee, Vogelsang, and Sontofen for the elite schooling of future party cadres. With their soaring towers and frowning eaves, these monumental structures recalled the castles of the German order that had once conquered the German East and established itself in the Baltic Principality of Prussia. Another very different Prussian architectural legacy lived on in the neoclassical public buildings commissioned by the regime as part of the national socialist reshaping of German urban space. Hitler's favorite architect, Paul Ludwig Trust, was a disciple of Schinkel, 1781-1841, the canonical exponent of the Prussian building style. Trust's House of German Art, constructed in 1933-7, on the southern margins of the English Garden in Munich, was widely seen as a 20th-century gloss on the austere neoclassicism of Schinkel's old museum in Berlin. Albert Speer, a party member from 1931, who became Hitler's court architect after Troost's early death in 1934, was likewise an admirer of Schinkel. Speer hailed from a family with a long architectural tradition. His grandfather had studied under Schinkel at the Berlin Academy of Building and his most important teacher at the Technical University, Berlin Charlottenburg, was Heinrich Tessenow, who was well known for having converted Schinkel's Neue Wache on Unter den Linden into a memorial for the fallen of the First World War. The facade and courts of Speer's new Reich Chancellery, commissioned by Hitler at the beginning of 1938, and completed after 12 months of frenzied construction on the 12th of January, 1939, made numerous conscious references to Schinkel's most famous buildings. The continuity message was driven home in a sumptuous official volume, 
published in 1943 under the auspices of the Reich Chamber of Architects, entitled Karl Friedrich Schinkel, the forerunner of the new German architectural ideology. The book expressly set out to locate the achievements of Nazi building within the Prussian neoclassicist tradition. Prussian subjects also featured prominently in the ideologically harmonized cinematic output of the German film studios after the Nazi seizure of power. Drawing on trends established during the Weimar Republic, Goebbels deployed Prussian themes as instruments of ideological mobilization. The escapism and nostalgia of earlier productions made way for dramas with an unmistakable contemporary resonance. The Old and the Young King, for example, released in 1935, offered a grotesquely distorted account of the breakdown in the relationship between the future Friedrich the Great and his father, Friedrich William I. The intrigues of British diplomacy were blamed for the misunderstanding between father and son, and there is a scene where the prince's French books are piled up and burnt on the order of his father, a contemporary reference that audiences could not have failed to recognize. The execution of Cutter is presented as the legitimate expression of a sovereign will. The dialogue included such gems of anachronism as the following. I want to make Prussia healthy, and anyone who tries to stop me is a scoundrel, Friedrich William. And the king does not commit murder, his will is law, and whatever does not submit to him must be annihilated, an officer commenting on Cutter's sentence. Other major productions dwelt on anecdotal scenes from the life of Friedrich the Great, or on dramatic plots set in the context of an historic crisis, such as the Seven Years' War or the aftermath of the defeat at the hands of Napoleon in 1806-7. A favoured theme, especially during the war years, was the dramatic interplay between the perfidy of betrayal, of one's country or one's leader, and the redemption that comes with self-sacrifice in the name of the greater good. Nowhere was this theme more trenchantly presented than in the last major film production of the Third Reich, Kohlberg. This was an epic period drama set in the eponymous fortress, where Gneisenau and Schill collaborated with the civil authorities in the town to hold the numerically superior French at bay. Against all odds, and contrary to the historical record, the French are forced to fall back, and the town is unexpectedly saved by a peace treaty. Here was the image of Prussia as a kingdom of the pure will, holding out by courage and fortitude alone. The film's purpose was obvious enough. It was a call to mobilize every last resource against the enemies who were closing in around Germany. It was, as the director Veit Harlan put it, a symbol of the present that should give viewers strength for today, for the time of our own struggle. Whether this objective was achieved may be doubted. There were very few functioning cinemas by the time the film was available for general release. Where the film did find an audience, the response was one of resignation and gloom. Amid the ruins and chaos of spring 1945, there were very few Germans who could still believe that Germany might be rescued by the efforts of a band of patriots. It would be a mistake to see all this purely as cynical manipulation. Goebbels had a remarkable propensity to believe his own lies, and Hitler's subjective identification with Friedrich the Great was so intense that the only decoration in the Reich Chancellery bunker, in which Hitler spent the last days of his life, 16 metres below the streets of Berlin, was Graf's portrait of Friedrich the Great. Throughout the war years, Hitler repeatedly compared himself to Friedrich, the man to whose heroism Prussia owed its historical ascendancy. From this picture, he told the tank commander Guderian at the end of February 1945, I always draw new strength when the bad news threatens to crush me. In the unreal, detached atmosphere of the bunker, it was easy to imagine that the history of Prussia was reenacting itself in the epic drama of the Third Reich. Goebbels bolstered Hitler's morale during the early months of 1945 with readings from Carlyle's Life of Friedrich the Great, especially those passages that described how in the darkest hours of the Seven Years' War, when all seemed lost, Prussia was saved from destruction by the death of Tsarina Elizabeth in February 1762. Hitler drew on the same historical themes when he spent four days in early April 1945 trying to stiffen Mussolini's resolve. The monologues he delivered at the war-weary Duce included long disquisitions on the history of Prussia. So tight was the grip of this historical romance on the mind of Goebbels that the propaganda minister responded with elation and a sense of triumph to the news of the death of President Franklin Roosevelt on the 12th of April, 1945. He believed 1945 was to be the Anus Mirabilis of the Third Reich. 
he ordered that champagne be served in his office, and immediately put a call through to Hitler's apartment. My Fuhrer, I congratulate you. Roosevelt is dead. Fate has struck down your greatest enemy. God has not abandoned us. None of this should be read as evidence of the continuing vitality of the Prussian tradition. Those who seek to legitimate a claim to power in the present often have recourse to the idea of tradition. They decorate themselves with its cultural authority, but the encounter between the self-proclaimed inheritors of tradition and the historical record rarely takes place on equal terms. The National Socialist reading of the Prussian past was opportunistic, distorted, and selective. The entire historical career of the Prussian state was shoehorned into a paradigm of a national German history conceived in racist terms. The Nazis admired the military state building of the soldier king, but had little sympathy for or understanding of the pietist spirituality that provided an ethical framework for all the king's endeavors and left such a deep imprint on his reign. Hence, for example, the almost complete evacuation of Christianity from the ceremony in the Garrison Church in March 1933. The Friedrich the Great of National Socialist Propaganda was a heavily truncated version of the original. The monarch's insistence on French as the medium of civilized discourse, his disdain for German culture, and his ambiguous sexuality were simply airbrushed away. There was little interest in the other Hohenzollern monarchs, with the exception of Wilhelm I, founder of the German Empire of 1871. Friedrich William II and Friedrich William IV, the sensitive and artistically gifted romantic on the throne, disappeared almost entirely from view. Two periods were singled out for their mythopoeic power, the Seven Years' War and the Wars of Liberation, but there was no interest in the Prussian Enlightenment. The Nazis prized the Prussian reformer Stein for his nationalist commitment, Hardenberg, by contrast, the Francophile real politica and emancipator of the Prussian Jews, languished in obscurity. There was some enthusiasm for Fichte and Schleiermacher, but little official interest in Hegel, whose emphasis on the transcendent dignity of the state was uncongenial to the folkish racism of the National Socialists. In short, Nazi Prussia was a glittering fetish assembled from fragments of a legendary past. It was a manufactured memory, a talismanic adornment to the pretensions of the regime. In any case, none of this official enthusiasm for Prussiandom, Preussen tomb, could revive the fortunes of the real Prussia. In 1933, the Prussian land tag was dissolved, after new elections had failed to yield a Nazi absolute majority. The law on the reorganization of the Reich on January 1934 placed regional governments and the new imperial commissars under the direct authority of the Reich Ministry of the Interior. The Prussian ministries were gradually merged with their Reich counterparts, with the exception for technical reasons of finance, and plans were drawn up, though they remained unrealized in 1945, to partition the state into its constituent provinces. Prussia was still an official designation and a name on the map. Indeed, it was the only German state not to be formally absorbed into the Reich, but it ceased de facto to exist as a state of any kind. There was no inconsistency here with the regime's official celebrations of the Prussian legacy. The diffuse abstraction Prussiandom did not denote a specific form of state or a particular social constellation, but a disembodied catalogue of virtues, a spirit that transcended history and would thrive at least as well in the Führer democracy of the Third Reich as it had under the absolutist rule of Friedrich the Great. Hermann Goering, who replaced Papen as Commissary Minister-President in Prussia in April 1933, invoked this distinction when he addressed the Prussian Council of State in June 1934. The concept of the Prussian state, he declared, had been subsumed into the Reich. What remains is the eternal spirit of Prussiandom. Much to the disgust of some of the traditionalist noble families, the new regime made no attempt to restore the old monarchy after 1933. Throughout the 1920s, there had been frequent contacts between the ex-royal and imperial entourage at dawn, and a loose network of mainly Prussian, conservative and monarchist groups in the German Republic. The late 1920s brought closer informal ties with the Nazi movement. William II's son, August William, joined the SA in 1928, an act for which he had the former emperor's permission. The ex-emperor's second wife, Princess Hermine von Schönheik Karulet, 
had friends among the high-ranking party members, and even participated in the Nuremberg rally of 1929. The collapse of the conservative bloc and the success of the Nazis in the German elections of 1930 encouraged the Restorationists at dawn to put out formal feelers to the Hitler movement. Their fruit was a meeting at dawn between William and Hermann Goering in January 1931. No minutes survive of this meeting, but it was seen that Goering spoke positively of the prospect of William's returning to Germany. But despite these friendly signals, there were encouraging noises from Hitler and a second meeting with Goering in the summer of 1932. The idea was unceremoniously dropped after the seizure of power. Hitler had encouraged the Kaiser's hopes only because he wanted to strengthen his credentials as the legitimate successor to Prussia Germany's monarchical tradition. The moment of truth came on the 27th of January, 1934, when Hitler ordered the breaking up of celebrations in honour of the Kaiser's 75th birthday. The fate of the restoration movement was sealed a few days later by new legislation outlawing all monarchist organisations. The royal SA man, Prince August William, was placed under house arrest during the Röhm Putsch and thereafter ordered to refrain from political utterances of any kind. Gradually, the regime erased the memory of monarchy in Prussia and Germany, prohibiting the display of imperial images and memorabilia, while paying the former royal family a substantial retainer to ensure that it caused no trouble. Among those who strongly objected was Count Ewald von Kleist Wendisch Taku, regional chief of the Corporation of the German Nobility, Deutsche Adelsgenossenschaft, in eastern Pomerania. In January 1937, he dissolved his section of the corporation, declaring that the regime's refusal to restore the Prussian-German crown was not compatible with the traditions and honour of the nobility. Characterising the relationship between the Hitler regime and the Prussian traditional and functional elites is difficult. There has to date been no systematic study of attitudes and conduct within the German regional nobilities throughout the life of the Third Reich. But one thing is clear. The conventional picture of the landed nobility haughtily withdrawing to the splendid isolation of their estates and waiting for the Nazi storm to pass is misleading. There was hardly a single East Elbian noble family that did not have at least one party member. The ancient lineage of the Schwerin supplied no fewer than 52 members, the Hardenbergs, 27, the Treskos, 30, the Schulenborgs, 41, of whom 17 had already joined the party before 1933. Many nobles were attracted to the NSDAP because they saw an alliance with the Hitler movement as the key to securing their traditional social leadership roles on new terms. But others joined because they found the party's ideology and ambience congenial. The attitude gap between noble circles and the national socialist movement was narrower than has often been supposed. There was also broad support within the Prussian nobility for the foreign policy objectives of the new regime especially revision of the Versailles Treaty and the retrieval of lands transferred to the Poles. The paucity of Prussians within the leadership echelons of the NSDAP initially had an off-putting effect on some families. According to one assessment, there were only 17 Prussians among the 500 top Nazi cadres in 1933. But as the focus of the party's activity and its electoral base shifted northwards, these misgivings often faded. Fritz Dietloff, Count von der Schulenburg, was initially suspicious of the NSDAP because he saw it as an essentially South German movement, but he later embraced it as a new form of Prussiandom, here again that usefully obfuscating abstraction. The officer corps of the Reichswehr, in which the sons of Juncker families still formed a substantial group, was initially sceptical of the Nazi movement, but shifted after the March elections of 1933 towards a policy of alliance with the new leadership. Many senior officers were reassured by Hitler's reprisals against the brown shirts in the Röhm Putsch of the 31st of June, 1934. The commencement of the rearmament program and the remilitarization of the Rhineland in March 1935 also helped to cement relations. A characteristic example of this transition was the inspector of weapons training in Berlin, Lieutenant General Johannes Blaskowitz, who hailed from Peterswalde in East Prussia and had been educated in the cadet schools of Kurslin and Berlin Lichterfelder. In 1932, Blaskowitz had warned his regiment during an exercise that, if the Nazis make any false moves, we will proceed against them with maximum force, and we will not shrink, even from the bloodiest conflict. By the spring of 1935, however, he was speaking a different language. 
In a speech for the opening of a monument to the fallen of the First World War, Blaskowitz, the son of a pietist East Prussian pastor, hailed Adolf Hitler as the man sent by God in Germany's hour of need. God's help gave us our leader, who has gathered all the forces of national life into one powerful movement, and who has yesterday restored the military sovereignty of the German people, and thereby fulfilled the testament of our dead heroes. Prussians were, needless to say, deeply implicated in the atrocities committed by the SS and security police and by the German Wehrmacht, whose claim to a clean wartime record has been comprehensively exploded. But being Prussian was not by any means a precondition for enthusiastic service in the regime's cause. Bavarians, Saxons and Württembergers also served with zeal and distinction in all branches of the regime's activity. The battalion of policemen whose mass shootings of Jewish men, women and children are so harrowingly documented in Christopher Browning's Ordinary Men were not Prussians, but natives of traditionally liberal, bourgeois, anglophile Hamburg. The Austrians, those historical and cultural antipodes of the Prussians, were strikingly overrepresented in the upper echelons of the Nazi machinery of mass murder. Odilo Globotnik, overseer of the death camps, Artur Zeiss Inkwart, Reichskommissar of the occupied Netherlands, Hans Rauter, the SS and police official who deported 100,000 Dutch Jews to the east, Franz Stangl, the commandant of Zobibor, later transferred to Treblinka, were just a few of the more prominent Austrians implicated in the Holocaust. Such observations do nothing whatsoever to diminish the role played by Prussians in the criminal activities of the Third Reich, but they do undermine the view that Prussian values or habits of mind were in themselves a special qualification for zealous service. Prussians, and especially representatives of the traditional Prussian elites, also figured prominently within the ranks of the German national conservative resistance. Many of the old Pomeranian pietist families, among them the Taddens, Kleists and Bismarcks, supported the confessing church that emerged to resist the regime's attempts to re-sculpt German Christianity. The active military resistance was, to be sure, never large enough to account for more than a very small fraction of men under arms. Yet it is significant that of the conspirators of the 20th of July, 1944, two-thirds came from the Prussian milieu, and many from old and distinguished military families. Among those arrested immediately after the failed attempt on Hitler's life was the former deputy police president of Berlin, Fritz Dietloff von der Schulenburg, descendant of a family whose sons had served for centuries as officers of the Brandenburg Prussian army. Another was the jurist and officer Peter Count York von Wartenberg, a direct descendant of the York who had walked across to the Russians at Tarogan in December 1812. Field Marshal Erwin von Fitzleben, another prominent Prussian conspirator, was the scion of an East Elbian military family who had been chosen by the conspirators to take over the supreme command of the Wehrmacht after the assassination of Hitler. He was arrested on the 21st of July and subjected to weeks of torture and humiliations at the hands of the Gestapo. On the 7th of August, 1944, still bearing the marks of his ill treatment, he was brought before the People's Court, where he stood holding his beltless trousers and enduring the insults of Roland Freisler, Hitler's hanging judge. He was hanged in the execution facility at Plotzensee the following day. No single unit of the German Wehrmacht was more deeply implicated in resistance activity than the Potsdam 9th Infantry Regiment, a Prussian traditional regiment. It was the official successor to the first Prussian foot guards, with strong ties to the Potsdam Garrison Church. This was the regiment of Major General Henning von Trescu, who in March 1943 smuggled a package of explosives onto a plane carrying Hitler back to Berlin. The parcel failed to explode and was retrieved without incident at the other end. After collaborating closely with Stauffenberg and the other military conspirators, Trescu blew himself up with a hand grenade on the 21st of July, 1944. Captain Axel Freiherr von den Buscher of the 9th Regiment undertook to strap explosives to his body and destroy Hitler in a suicide bombing during a demonstration of new uniforms in 1943, but was refused leave to attend by his commanding officer on the Eastern Front. Lieutenant Ewald von Kleist Schmenzin agreed to take von den Buscher's place, but the planned demonstration was cancelled and the opportunity never arose. Other 9th Regiment officers directly involved in the July plot included the son of former Chief of Staff Ludwig Freiherr von Hammerstein-Eckwort, 
Captain Hans Fritzscher of the Potsdam Reserve, and Lieutenant Georg Sigismund von Oppen, whose family ran an estate in Altfriedland, 50 kilometers to the east of Berlin. Hammerstein Ekwort, Oppen, and Fritzscher returned to regimental headquarters in time to escape notice and survive the reprisals that followed the assassination attempt, largely because Fritz Dietloff von der Schulenburg refused even under torture to reveal their names to the Gestapo. Several other members of the regiment were executed or committed suicide during the wave of reprisals that followed the collapse of the July plot. The motives for resistance varied. Many of the key figures had passed through a phase of infatuation with the Hitler movement, and some had even become implicated in its crimes. Some were disgusted at the mass murder of Jews, Poles and Russians. Others had religious reservations. Some sought the restoration of the monarchy, though not necessarily of William II, whose flight to Holland had neither been forgotten nor forgiven. Prussian themes insinuated themselves into the resistance at many levels. The Kreisau Circle, for example, a network of mainly conservative civilian and military resistors centered on the Moltke estate at Kreisau in Silesia, were skeptical of the virtues of democracy, which, as they saw it, had failed to protect Germany against the advent of Hitler, and looked to the unelected upper chamber of the old Prussian Landtag as the model for an authoritarian alternative to modern parliamentary politics. Many of the resistors clung to the idea of Prussia as a vanished better world, whose traditions were being perverted by the taskmasters of the Third Reich. True Prussiandom can never be separated from the concept of freedom. Henning von Trescu told a family gathering when his two sons were confirmed at the garrison church in the spring of 1943. Uncoupled from the imperatives of freedom, understanding, and compassion, he warned, the Prussian ideals of self-discipline and the fulfillment of duty would degenerate into spiritless soldiery and narrow bigotry. The historical imagination of the Prussian elite resistance was anchored in the mythical memory of the Wars of Liberation. The figure of York, who risked the charge of betrayal and treason to walk across the snow to the Russians at Tauroggen, was a recurring example. When Karl Gerdler, perhaps the most senior civilian associate of the military resistance, composed a memorandum urging the army to rise up against Hitler in the summer of 1940, he ended the document with an extended quotation from Baron Stein's letter of the 12th of October, 1808, urging Friedrich William III to show his hand against Napoleon. If nothing but misfortune and suffering can be expected, then it is better to take a decision that is honourable and noble and offers comfort and solace, should things end badly. In later years, he compared the defeats of North Africa and Stalingrad to the salutary disasters at Jena and Auerstedt, a particularly striking example comes from an exchange between the resistor Rudolf von Gersdorf, author of an aborted suicide bombing on Hitler in the spring of 1943, and Field Marshal Erich von Manstein. When Manstein reproached Gersdorf for his seditious views, reminding him that Prussian Field Marshals did not mutiny, Gersdorf cited York's defection at Tauroggen. For the resistors, Prussia became a virtual homeland the focal point for a patriotism that could find no referent in the Third Reich. The charisma of this mythical Prussia was not lost upon the non-Prussians who moved within resistance circles. The social democrat Julius Lieber, an Alsatian who grew up in Lübeck and was executed on the 5th of January 1945 for his part in the conspiracy against Hitler, was among those who looked back in admiration at the years when Stein, Gneisenau and Scharnhorst re-established the state in the citizens' consciousness of freedom. There was an energetic polarity between the Prussia of Nazi propaganda and that of the civilian and military resistance. Goebbels used Prussian themes to drive home the primacy of loyalty, obedience and will as indispensable aids in Germany's epic struggle against her enemies. The resistors, by contrast, insisted that these secondary Prussian virtues became worthless as soon as they were severed from their ethical and religious roots. For the Nazis, York was the symbol of an oppressed Germany rising up against foreign tyranny. For the resistors, he represented a transcendent sense of duty that might even, under certain circumstances, articulate itself in an act of treason. We naturally look more kindly on one of these Prussia myths than the other. Yet both were selective, talismanic and instrumental. Precisely because it had become so abstract, so etiolated, Prussiandom was up for grabs. It was not an identity, nor even a memory. 
it had become a catalogue of disembodied mythical attributes, whose historical and ethical significance was, and would remain, in contention. The Exorcists In the end, it was the Nazi view of Prussia that prevailed. The Western Allies needed no persuading that Nazism was merely the latest manifestation of Prussianism. They could draw on an intellectually formidable tradition of anti-Prussianism that dated back to the outbreak of the First World War. In August 1914, Ramsey Muir, a distinguished liberal activist and holder of the Chair of Modern History at the University of Manchester, published a widely read study that claimed to examine the historical background of the current conflict. It is the result, Muir wrote, of a poison which has been working in the European system for more than two centuries, and the chief source of this poison is Prussia. In another study published early in the war, William Harbert Dawson, a social liberal publicist and one of the most influential commentators on German history and politics in early 20th century Britain, pointed to the militarizing influence of the Prussian spirit within the otherwise benign German nation. This spirit has ever been a hard and a malleable element in the life of Germany. It is still the knot in the oak, the nodule in the softer clay. Common to many analyses was the notion that there were in fact two Germanys, the liberal, congenial and pacific Germany of the South and West, and the reactionary, militaristic Germany of the Northeast. The tensions between the two, it was argued, remained unresolved within the empire founded by Bismarck in 1871. One of the most sophisticated and influential early analysts of this problem was the American sociologist Torstein Veerblan. In a study of German industrial society published in 1915 and reissued in 1939, Veerblan argued that a lopsided process of modernization had distorted German political culture. Modernism had transformed the sphere of industrial organization, but it failed to effect an equally secure and disturbing lodgment in the tissues of the body politic. The reason for this, Veerblan diagnosed, lay in the survival of an essentially pre-modern Prussian territorial state. The history of this state, he suggested, amounted to a career of more or less uninterrupted aggressive war-making. The consequence was a political culture of extreme civility, or the pursuit of war, being an exercise in the following of one's leader and execution of arbitrary orders, induces an animus of enthusiastic subservience and unquestioning obedience to authority. In such a system, the loyal support of popular sentiment could be maintained only by unremitting habituation and discipline sagaciously and relentlessly directed to this end, and by a system of bureaucratic surveillance and unremitting interference in the private life of subjects. Veblen's account was light on empirical data and supporting evidence, but it was not without theoretical sophistication. It aimed not only to describe, but also to explain the supposed deformations of Prussian-German political culture. It was supported, moreover, by an implicit conception of the modern, in the light of which Prussia could be deemed archaic, anachronistic, only partially modernized. It is striking how much of the substance of the special path thesis that would rise to prominence in German historical writing of the late 1960s and 1970s is already anticipated in Veblen's account. This was no accident. Ralph Dahrendorf, whose synoptic study Society and Democracy in Germany, 1968, was one of the foundational texts of the critical school, drew heavily on the American sociologist's work. Even the rather cruder accounts that passed for historical analyses of modern Germany during the Second World War often preserved a sense of historical perspective, rather than settling for generalizations about German national character. Since the 17th century, one writer observed in 1941, the old German spirit of conquest, which had been deliberately developed more and more, and along the lines of that mentality which is known as Prussianism. The history of Prussia had been an almost uninterrupted period of forcible expansion, under the iron rule of militarism and absolutist officialism, under a harsh regime of compulsory education, in which teachers were recruited from the ranks of former non-commissioned officers. The young were instilled with the typical Prussian obedience. The rigors of school life were succeeded by a prolonged period in barracks or on active military service. It was here that the German mind received its last coat of varnish. Anything that had not been done by the schools was achieved in the army. In the minds of many contemporaries, the link between Prussianism and Nazism was obvious. The German émigré, 
Edgar Stern Rubart described Hitler, notwithstanding the dictator's Austrian birth, as the Arch Prussian, and declared that the whole structure of his dreamed of Reich was based not only on the material achievements of the Prussian state, but even more on the philosophical foundations of Prussianism. In a study of German industrial planning published in 1943, Joseph Borkin, an American official who later helped to prepare the case against the giant chemicals combine IG Farben at Nuremberg, observed that the political evolution of the Germans had long been retarded by a ruling class of Prussian Junkers, who had never been unsettled by social change, and concluded that the Prussian Weltanschauung of political and economic world hegemony is the wellspring from which both Hohenzollern imperialism and National Socialism flow. Like many such accounts, this book drew on a tradition of German critical commentary on Prussian history and German political culture more generally. It would be difficult to overstate the hold of this scenario of power lust, servility, and political archaism over the imaginations of the policymakers most concerned with Germany's post war fate. In a speech of December 1939, Foreign Secretary Antony Eden observed that Hitler is not so unique as all that. He is merely the latest expression of the Prussian spirit of military domination. The Daily Telegraph published a discussion of the speech under the headline Hitler's Rule is in the Tradition of Prussian Tyranny, and there were positive comments throughout the tabloid press. On the day of the German invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941, Winston Churchill spoke memorably of the hideous onslaught of the Nazi war machine with its clanking, hill-clicking, dandified Prussian soldiers and the dull, drilled, docile British masses of the Hun soldiers plodding on like a swarm of crawling locusts. In an article for the Daily Herald in November 1941, Ernest Brevin, Minister of Labour in Churchill's War Cabinet, declared that German preparation for the current war had begun long before the advent of Hitler. Even if one got rid of Hitler, Goering and others, Bevin warned, the German problem would remain unsolved. It was Prussian militarism, with its terrible philosophy that had to be got rid of from Europe for all time. It followed that the defeat of the Nazi regime itself would not suffice to bring the war to a satisfactory close. In a paper presented to Cabinet in the summer of 1943, Labour leader and Deputy Prime Minister Clement Attlee warned passionately against the notion that it might be possible, in the aftermath of the regime's collapse, to do business with some kind of German successor government drawn from the traditional elites of German society. The real aggressive element in German society, he argued, was the Prussian Junker class, and the chief danger lay in the possibility that this class, which had allied itself with the masters of heavy industry in Westphalia, might depose the Nazi leadership and present itself to the Allies as a successor government, prepared to settle peace terms. The era of 1918 had been to allow these elements to remain as a bulwark against Bolshevism. This must not happen again. Only the liquidation of the Junkers as a class, Attlee argued, would eradicate the Prussian virus. For President Roosevelt, too, the assumption that Prussia was historically the source of German militarism and aggression played a central role in his conception of policy vis-à-vis -vis Germany. This is one thing that I want to make perfectly clear, he told Congress on the 17th of September, 1943. When Hitler and the Nazis go out, the Prussian military clique must go with them. The war-breeding gangs of militarists must be rooted out of Germany, if we are to have any real assurance of future peace. The memory of 1918, when Woodrow Wilson had refused to parley with the military masters and the monarchical autocrats of Germany, was still vivid. Yet the military system that had sustained the German war effort in 1914-18 had survived the privations inflicted by the Peace of Versailles to mount a renewed campaign of conquest only two decades later. For Roosevelt, as for Attlee, it followed that the traditional Prussian military authorities were no less of a threat to peace than the Nazis. There could thus be no negotiated armistice with the military command, even in the event that the Nazi regime were to be deposed from within or to collapse. In this way, the idea of Prussianism made an important contribution to the policy of unconditional surrender adopted by the Allies at the Casablanca Conference of January 1943. Among the Allies, only the Soviets remained aware of the tension between Prussian tradition and the National Socialist regime. While the July plot of 1944 evoked little positive comment among Western politicians, the Soviet official media found words of praise for the conspirators. 
Soviet propaganda, by contrast with that of the Western powers, consistently exploited Prussian themes. The National Committee for a Free Germany, established as a propaganda vehicle in 1943 and composed of captured German soldiers, appealed explicitly to the memory of the Prussian reformers, above all Gneisenau, Stein and Clausewitz, all of whom had resigned their Prussian commissions during the French occupation and joined the army of the Tsar. York, the man who ignored the command of his sovereign to walk across the ice to the Russians in 1812, naturally held pride of place. This was all eyewash, of course, yet it also reflected a specifically Russian perspective on Prussia's history. The history of relations between the two states was no chronicle of unremitting mutual hatred. Stalin's hero, Peter the Great, had been a warm admirer of the Prussia of the Great Elector, whose administrative innovations served as models for his own reforms. Russia and Prussia had cooperated closely in the partitioning of Poland, and the Russian alliance was crucial to Prussia's recovery against Napoleon after 1812. Relations remained warm after the Napoleonic Wars, when the diplomatic bond of the Holy Alliance was reinforced by the marriage of Friedrich William III's daughter, Charlotte, to Tsar Nicholas I. The Russians backed Austria in the dualist struggles of 1848-50, but favoured Prussia with a policy of benevolent neutrality during the War of 1866. The assistance rendered to the beleaguered Bolsheviks in 1917-18 and the close military collaboration between Reichswehr and Red Army during the Weimar years were more recent reminders of this long history of interaction and cooperation. Yet none of this could preserve Prussia from dissolution at the hands of the victorious allies. By the autumn of 1945, there was a consensus among the various British organs involved in the administration of occupied Germany that, in a tellingly redundant formulation, this moribund corpse of Prussia must be finally killed. Its continued existence would constitute a dangerous anachronism. By the summer of 1946, this was a matter of firm policy for the British administration in Germany. A memorandum of the 8th of August, 1946, by the British member of the Allied Control Authority in Berlin, put the case against Prussia succinctly. I need not point out that Prussia has been a menace to Europe's security for the last 200 years. The survival of the Prussian state, even if only in name, would provide a basis for any irredentist claims which the German people may later seek to put forward, would strengthen German militarist ambitions and would encourage the revival of an authoritarian, centralised Germany, which in the interests of all, it is vital to prevent. The American and French delegations broadly supported this view. Only the Soviets dragged their feet, mainly because Stalin still hoped to use Prussia as the hub of a unified Germany, of which the Soviet Union might eventually be able to secure control. But by early February 1947, they too had fallen into step, and the way was open for the legal termination of the Prussian state. In the meanwhile, the extirpation of Prussia as a social milieu was already well advanced. The Central Committee of the German Communist Party in the Soviet Zone of Occupation announced in August 1945 that the feudal estate owners and the Junker caste had always been the bearers of militarism and chauvinism, a formulation that would find its way into the text of Law No. 46 of the Allied Control Council. The removal of their socio-economic power was thus the first and fundamental precondition for the extirpation of Prussian militarism. There followed a wave of expropriations. No account was taken of the political orientation of the owners, or of their role in resistance activity. Among those whose estates were confiscated was Ulrich Wilhelm Count Schwerin von Schwanenfeld, who had been executed on the 21st of August 1944 for his role in the July Conspiracy. These transformations took place against the backdrop of the greatest wave of migrations in the history of German settlement in Europe. During the last months of the war, Millions of Prussians fled westwards from the eastern provinces to escape the advancing Red Army. Of those who remained, some committed suicide. Others were killed or died of starvation, cold or illness. Germans were expelled from East Prussia, West Prussia, Eastern Pomerania and Silesia, and hundreds of thousands perished in the process. The emigrations and resettlements continued into the 1950s and 1960s. The looting or burning of the great East Elbian houses signalled the end not only of a socio-economic elite, but also of a distinctive culture and a way of life. Finkenstein, with its Napoleonic memorabilia, Benunen with its collection of antiques, Waldborg with its Rococo library, 
Bloomberg and Gross Wunsdorf, with their memories of the Liberal ministers, von Schoen and von Schröter, were among the many country seats to be plundered and gutted by an enemy bent on erasing every last trace of German settlement. So it was that the Prussians, or at least their mid-20th century descendants, came to pay a heavy price for the war of extermination that Hitler's Germany unleashed on Eastern Europe. The scouring of Prussia from the collective awareness of the German population began before the end of the war with a massive aerial attack on the city of Potsdam. As a heritage site with little strategic or industrial significance, Potsdam was very low on the list of Allied targets and had been spared significant bombardment during the war. Late in the evening of Saturday the 14th of April 1945, however, 491 planes of British Bomber Command dropped their payloads over the city transforming it into a sea of fire. Almost half the historical buildings of the old centre were obliterated in a bombing that lasted for only half an hour. When the fires had been extinguished and the smoke had cleared, the scorched 57-metre tower of the garrison church stood as the dominant landmark in a cityscape of ruins. Of the fabled Carillon, famous for its automated renditions of the Leuton Kerala, there remained only a lump of metal. The scouring continued after 1945, as entire districts of the old city were cleared to make way for socialist reconstruction. The imperatives of the post-war city planning were reinforced by the anti-Prussian iconoclasm of the communist authorities. Nowhere was the rupture with the past more comprehensive than in East Prussia. The northeastern part of the province, including Königsberg, fell to Soviet Russia as war booty. On the 4th of July, 1946, the city was renamed Kaliningrad, after one of Stalin's most faithful henchmen, and the Sovietized district around it became the Kaliningradskia Oblast. The city had been bitterly fought over during the last months of the war, and during the early post-war years, it remained a lunar landscape of ruins. What a city, one Soviet Russian visitor declared in 1951. The tram leads us through the humped, narrow streets of erstwhile Königsberg. Erstwhile, because Königsberg truly is an erstwhile city. It doesn't exist. Four kilometres in every direction, an unforgettable landscape of ruins. The old Königsberg is a dead city. Most of the historical buildings in the old centre were stripped and torn down in an attempt to erase memories of its history. In some streets, only the Latin letters inscribed on the steel manhole covers of the city's late 19th century sewage system survived to remind the passerby of an older history. Around the devastation, a new Soviet city took shape, monotonous and provincial, cut off from the world by a military exclusion zone. In the western zones of occupation too, the work of erasure proceeded apace. French policymakers and commentators spoke in the early post-war years of the need for wholesale depressification. The bronze relief panels on the base of the Victory Column, raised in 1873, in celebration of the triumphs of Prussian arms over the Danes, the Austrians and the French in the wars of German unification, were removed by the French occupation authorities and shipped to Paris. They were handed back to Berlin only on the occasion of the city's 750th anniversary celebrations in 1986. Even more emblematic fate awaited the colossal figures representing historic rulers from the House of Hohenzollern that had once lined the Ziggazali, these objects, bombastic masses of carved white stone, were transferred by the Nazi authorities to the Grosser Sternali, one of the axes of the future Reich capital planned by Albert Speer, Hitler's chief inspector of buildings. Here they spent the war draped in camouflage netting. In 1947, they were torn down on the orders of the Allied Control Council in Berlin. In 1954, they were secretly buried in the sandy soil of Brandenburg almost as if this was necessary to prevent the Germans from regrouping for battle around their ancestral Prussian totems. These impulses were carried over into the sphere of Allied re-education policy in the occupied zones. Here, the objective was to eliminate Prussia as a mental construct, or to deprussianize the German imagination. What exactly this would mean in practice was never agreed among the Allies, or concretely defined by any of these zonal administrations, but the idea was influential nonetheless. Prussia was de-emphasized in the teaching of German history. In the French zone in particular, traditional textbooks charting a teleological nationalist narrative, culminating in the formation of the Bismarckian Empire of 1871, 
made way for narratives focused on Germany's pre-national history and its manifold ties with the rest of Europe, especially France. The chronicle of battles and diplomacy that was the staple of the old Prusso-centric history made way for the study of regions and cultures. Where references to Prussia were unavoidable, they were given a markedly negative spin. In the new textbooks of the French song, Prussia figured as a voracious reactionary power that had thwarted the beneficent effects of the French Revolution and destroyed the roots of enlightenment and democracy in Germany. Bismarck in particular emerged from this process of reorientation with his reputation in ruins. Friedrich the Great, too, retreated from his privileged position in public memory, despite the best efforts of the conservative historian Gerhard Ritter to rehabilitate him as an enlightened ruler. Allied policies were successful precisely because they harmonized with homegrown German, especially Catholic Rhenish and South German, traditions of antipathy to Prussia. These endeavors were reinforced, moreover, by the global geopolitical imperatives that governed German politics after the establishment of two separate states in 1949. The German Federal and the German Democratic Republics now lay on either side of the Iron Curtain that divided the capitalist and the communist worlds. While Konrad Adenauer, the first Chancellor of the Federal Republic, pursued a policy of unconditional commitment to the West, the communist eastern neighbor became a political dependency of Moscow, a homunculus from the Soviet test tube. Under the pressure of this partition, which came to seem a permanent feature of the post-war world, the Prussian past retreated to the horizons of public memory. Berlin, meanwhile, islanded deep within the Eastern Republic, acquired a new and charismatic identity. In 1949, when the Soviets blocked supplies to the western-occupied zones of the city, the Allies broke the siege with a massive airlift. Across the Western world, there was a surge of solidarity with the beleaguered outpost. It was a crucial first step towards the rehabilitation of Western Germany as a member of the international community. The city's prominence was further heightened by the erection of the Berlin Wall in August 1961 a spectacular monument to the polarities of the Cold War. In the 1960s and 1970s, West Berlin evolved into a showcase of Western liberty and consumerism, a vibrant walled enclave of neon go-go bars, high culture and political ferment. It no longer belonged to Prussia, nor even to Germany, but to the Western world, a condition memorably encapsulated in President John F. Kennedy's declaration during a visit to the city on the 26th of June, 1963, that he too was Ein Berliner. Back to Brandenburg. In a sparkling essay of 1894, the celebrated Prussian novelist Theodore Fontane, then an elderly man, recalled the occasion of his first literary composition. The reminiscence took him back six decades to the year 1833 when he had been a 14-year-old schoolboy lodging with an uncle in Berlin. It was a warm Sunday afternoon in August. Fontane decided to put off his school homework, a German composition on a self-chosen theme, and visit family friends in the village of Leuvenbruck, some five kilometers to the south of Berlin. By three in the afternoon, he had reached the Halle gate on the city boundary. From there, the road led south across the broad Telto Plateau, through Kreuzberg and Tempelhof, to Gross Beeren. As he reached the outskirts of Gross Beeren, Fontane sat down at the foot of a poplar tree to rest. It was nearly evening, and wisps of mist hung over the newly ploughed fields. Further down the road, he could make out the raised ground of the Gross Beeren Cemetery and the village church tower, glowing in the rays of the sinking sun. As he sat watching this peaceful scene, Fontane fell to a pondering on the events that had transpired in this very spot almost exactly twenty years before, at the height of the wars against Napoleon. It was here that General Bulow, with his Prussians, most of them men of the Landwehr, had attacked the French and Saxon forces under General Oudinot, denying them access to Berlin and turning the tide of the 1813 summer campaign. Fontane had only a sketchy schoolboy knowledge of the battle, but what he remembered was enough to embellish the landscape before him with vibrant tableau vivant from the past. Urged by his commanding officer to retreat behind the capital city and await the French advance, Bulow had refused, saying that he would rather see the bones of his militiamen whitened before than behind Berlin. 
To the right of where Fontane was sitting was a low hill where a windmill turned. It was here that the Prince of Hessen Homburg, like his ancestor before him at Fear Berlin, had led a few battalions of Haviland militiamen against the French positions. Even more vivid than all of this was a story his mother had often retold from his earliest childhood, a small event that had passed into family law. Emilia Labri, later Fontane, was a daughter of the Francophone Huguenot colony in Berlin. On the 24th of August, 1813, at the age of 15, she was among the women and girls who came out from the city to tend to the wounded still lying in the field on the morrow of the battle. The first man she happened upon was a mortally wounded Frenchman, with scarcely a breath left in his body. Hearing himself addressed in his native language, he sat up as if transfigured, grasping her beaker of wine in one hand and her wrist with the other. But before he could raise the wine to his lips, he was dead. As he lay that night under his blankets in Leuvenbrook, Fontana knew that he had found his theme. The topic of his school composition would be the Battle of Gross Beeren. Was this passage about Prussia, or was it about Brandenburg? Fontana invoked a recognizably Prussian historical narrative, though only in fragments, but the immediacy of the recollection derives from the intimacy of the local setting. Ploughed fields, a poplar tree, a low hill, a church tower glowing in the rays of the setting sun. It was the landscape of Brandenburg that opened the portals of memory into the Prussian past. An intense awareness of place was one of the signal features of Fontana's work as a writer. Indeed, the walk to Gross Beeren in 1833 was the prototype he subsequently claimed for the provincial excursion narrative he would later establish as a literary genre. Fontana is now best known for his novels, sharply observed dramas of 19th century society, but his most famous and best loved work during his lifetime was the four-volume homage to his native province known as Walks Through the Mark Brandenburg. The walks are a work unlike any other. Fontana made notes during a long sequence of meandering excursions across the mark and interwove these with material drawn from inscriptions and local archives. The wandering began in the summer of 1859, with two trips to the Rupen and Spreewald districts, and continued throughout the 1860s. Initially published as articles in various newspapers, the essays were subsequently revised, compiled by district, and published from the early 1860s as bound volumes. Readers encountered an unfamiliar mix of topographical observations, inscriptions, inventories, and architectural sketches. Romantic episodes from the past and scraps of unofficial memory gleaned from conversations with cab drivers, innkeepers, landowners, servants, village mayors, and agricultural labourers. Passages of blank descriptive prose and wry vignettes of small-town life are interspersed with meditative scenes. A graveyard, a still lake enclosed by frowning trees, a ruined wall drowning in grass, children running in the stubble of a freshly mown field. Nostalgia and melancholy, those markers of modern literary sensibility, pervade the whole. Fontana's Brandenburg is a memory scape that shimmers between past and present. Perhaps the most remarkable thing about the walks is their emphatically provincial focus. There seemed to be many contemporaries, as Fontana well knew, something preposterous about devoting four volumes of historical travelogue to prosaic, featureless, backwards Brandenburg. But he knew what he was doing. Even in the sand of the mark, he told a friend in 1863, the springs of life have flowed and still flow everywhere, and every square foot of ground has its story and is telling it too. But one has to be willing to listen to these often quiet voices. His aim was not to survey the Grand Récit of Prussian history, but to reanimate locality, as he put in a letter of October 1861. In order to do this, he had to work against the grain, uncovering the hidden beauties of his native country, teasing out the nuances of its understated topography, gradually pulling Brandenburg from under the political identity of Prussia. The mark had to be detached from Prussia's history in order to appear in its individuality. Prussian history is present in the walks, but it seems remote, like the rumour of a distant battlefield. It is the Brandenburgers, with their peppery wit and the spare cadences of their speech, who have the last word. The walks did not escape these strictures of historical pedants, but they were hugely popular with a broader public and have been widely imitated since.
Their success draws our attention to the abiding strength of provincial attachments to the Prussian lands. Prussia remained, at the end of its life, as in the beginning, a composite of provinces whose identity was substantially independent of their membership within the Prussian polity. This was most obviously the case of the more recently acquired provinces. The relationship between the Rhine province and Berlin remained a marriage of convenience, despite the relatively pragmatic and flexible governance of successive Prussian administrations. In Westphalia, which was not, strictly speaking, a single historical entity, but a jigsaw of culturally diverse lands, the later 19th century witnessed an intensified sense of regional belonging, heightened by confessional polarities. In Catholic areas of Westphalia, such as the Bishopric of Paderborn, there was little enthusiasm for Prussia's war against France in 1870. Volunteers were thin on the ground, and many conscripts fled to Holland to avoid service. It is thus misleading to speak of the assimilation of the Rhineland provinces after 1815. What happened was rather that the Western territories joined the Prussian amalgam, forcing the state to constitute itself anew. Paradoxically, and not only in the Rhineland, the introduction of Prussian governance, with its provincial presidencies and provincial diets, actually reinforced the sense of a distinctive provincial identity. These effects were intensified by Prussia's territorial expansion in the aftermath of the Austrian War. Many in the conquered provinces resented the high-handed annexations of 1866. The problem was particularly pronounced in Hanover, where the ancient dynasty of the Guelphs was deposed and its landed wealth sequestered by the Bismarck administration, an act of robbery and less majesté that stuck in many conservative throats. These concerns found expression in the German Hanoverian Party, which advocated a Gulf restoration, but also pursued broader conservative regionalist objections. Gulf Hanoverians might eventually become enthusiastic Germans, but they would never become wholeheartedly Prussian. To be sure, the Gulf regionalists were opposed within Hanover by the province's powerful national liberal movement, which strongly supported the new Bismarckian state. But the national liberals, as their name suggests, were enthusiasts of Germany rather than of Prussia. They hailed Bismarck as the instrument of a German rather than a specifically Prussian mission. Prussia's last great phase of expansion happened to coincide with an intensification of regionalist sentiment across Germany. Archaeological and historical associations run by local worthies dedicated themselves to laying bare the linguistic, cultural and political history of the many German landscapes. In Schleswig-Holstein, this trend was intensified by the Prussian annexation of 1866. There was a burgeoning of regionalist loyalties not only among the Danish-speaking Prussians of North Schleswig, who remained unreconciled to the new order and seceded when they had the chance in 1919, but also among those ethnic Germans who were attached to the idea of Schleswig-Holstein as an autonomous state. Most of the deputies who represented the duchies in the constituent Reichstag of the North German Confederation in 1867 were supporters of regional autonomy. These aspirations acquired a certain academic credibility by the efforts of the Schleswig-Holstein-Lauenburg Society for Patriotic History, whose lectures and publications emphasized regionalist themes. The point should not be overstated. Regionalist sentiments pose no direct threat to Prussian authority. The Schleswig-Holsteiners may have grumbled, but they continued to pay their taxes and perform their military service. Yet the strength of provincial identities is significant. Their importance lay less in their subversive political potential than in the synergies that could develop between regional and national attachments. The folksy modern ideology of Heimat, homeland, blended seamlessly into cultural or ethnic concepts of a composite German nationhood, bypassing the imposed supposedly inorganic structures of the Prussian state. Prussia, as an identity, was thus eroded simultaneously from above by nationalism and below by the regionalist revival. Only in the Mark Brandenburg, and to a lesser extent in Pomerania, did a regionalist identity evolve that fed directly into an allegiance to Prussia and its German mission, though not necessarily to Berlin, which some saw as an alien urban growth on the agrarian landscape of the Mark. Yet even here, as the example of Fontana suggests, the rediscovery of the province and its claims on the sentiments of its inhabitants could entail a turning away from Prussia. Fontana, 
often regarded as an apologist for Prussiandom, was in fact deeply ambivalent towards the Prussian state, and could on occasion be fiercely critical. Prussia was a lie, he declared in the opening sentence of a scathing essay he published during the revolutions of 1848. The Prussia of today has no history. Fontana was among those who argued, not only in 1848, but also after the foundation of the Second Empire in 1871, that the unification of Germany must necessarily bring about the demise of Prussia. It went without saying that the Brandenburg, whose particular history and character he had so painstakingly documented, would survive the demolition of the monarchical state that had sprung up on its soil. The strength of provincial attachments and the corresponding feebleness of Prussia as a locus of collective identity has remained one of the most striking features of the state's afterlife since 1947. It is remarkable, for example, how inconspicuous Prussia has been in the official rhetoric of the organizations formed in West Germany after the Second World War. To represent the interests of the 10 million expellees who were forced to leave the East Elbian provinces at the end of the Second World War, the refugees to find themselves, by and large, not as Prussians, but as East Prussians, Upper or Lower Silesians, Pomeranians. There were also organizations representing the Masurians from the Polish-speaking southern districts of East Prussia, these Salzburgers of Prussian Lithuania, descendants of the communities of Protestant refugees from Salzburg, who were resettled to the Prussian East in the early 1730s, and various other sub-regional groups. But there has been little evidence of a shared Prussian identity, and surprisingly little collaboration and exchange between the different groups. In this sense, the expellee movement has tended to reflect the composite, highly regionalized character of the old Prussian state. To be sure, Prussia was the subject of great public interest in both the post-war Germanys. The official historians of the German Democratic Republic, GDR, soon abandoned the leftist anti-Prussianism of the older communist cadres, and adopted the military reformers of the Napoleonic era as the fathers of the new paramilitary People's Police, founded in 1952. In 1953, the authorities used the occasion of the 140th anniversary of the wars against Napoleon to launch a propaganda campaign in which the events of 1813 were reframed to serve the interests of the communist polity. The theme of Russo-German friendship naturally loomed large, and in 1813 now figured as a people's uprising against tyranny and monarchy. The creation of the prestigious Order of Scharnhorst in 1966 for operatives of the National People's Army, television serials on Scharnhorst and Clausewitz in the late 1970s, the appearance of Ingrid Mitzenzweig's path-breaking bestseller Friedrich II of Prussia in 1979, and the relocation of Christian Daniel Rauch's splendid equestrian statue of the king to a prominent position on Unter den Linden, were just some of the milestones in the evolution of an increasingly sympathetic and differentiated approach to the history of the Prussian state. The aim, at least of the state authorities, was to deepen the public identity of the GDR by annexing to it a version of the history and traditions of Prussia. It was partly in answer to these developments that the authorities in West Berlin and their backers in the Federal Republic supported the immense Prussia exhibition that opened in West Berlin's Gropius building in 1981. And yet, for all the controversy and genuine public interest on both sides of the German-German border, these remained top-down initiatives, driven by the imperatives of political education and social pedagogy. They were about the identities of state, not of the people who live in them. But while the emotional resonance of Prussia had faded, attachments to Brandenburg remained strong. After 1945, the GDR authorities made a concerted effort to erase the regional identities that pre-existed the socialist state. The five lender in the eastern zone, including Brandenburg, were abolished in 1952 and replaced with 14 completely new districts, Betsieke. The aim was not merely to expedite the centralization of the East German administration, but also to create new popular allegiances. To supersede the traditional regional identifications, the new socialist identities. Yet the extirpation of regional identities proved extraordinarily difficult. Regional fairs, music, cuisine, and literary cultures flourished, despite the ambivalence and intermittent hostility of the central administration. 
Official efforts to encourage emotional attachments to the newly minted socialist homelands of the 1952 districts generated only superficial acknowledgement from the majority of East Germans. How hardy the traditional affiliations were became clear in 1990, when the districts were abandoned and the old Lender reinstated. The county of Pellerberg in the Prignitz to the northeast of Berlin had been part of the Mark Brandenburg since the 14th century. In 1952, it was enlarged to encompass three Mecklenburg villages and incorporated into the district of Schwerin, a name traditionally associated not with Brandenburg, but with its northern neighbor, the Duchy of Mecklenburg-Schwerin. In 1990, after 40 years in Mecklenburg exile, the people of the county of Pelleberg took the opportunity to assert their attachment to Brandenburg. 78.5% of Pelleberg voters opted to return and the county was duly transferred to Brandenburg administration. This caused consternation, however, among the inhabitants of the Mecklenburg villages, who had been merged into the Perleberg county in 1952. The men and women of Damberg and Bruno loudly demanded a re-transfer to their ancestral Mecklenburg. Late in 1991, after protests and negotiations, their wish was granted. Now everybody was happy. Everybody, that is, except the people of Clus, population around 150, whose village was officially attached to Bruno, but actually lay right on the old border with Brandenburg. Since the 18th century, Clus had depended for its livelihood upon the cross-border transactions, including a lucrative smuggling trade, and its residents were reluctant to cut their traditional ties with the mark. In the end, there was only Brandenburg. This concludes Iron Kingdom by Christopher Clarke, narrated by Sean Grindell. Copyright 2006 by Christopher Clarke. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Christopher Clarke, care of the Wiley Agency, LLC, and was produced in the year 2017 by Tantor Media Incorporated, a division of recorded books, which holds the copyright there too. Please visit Tantor.com for more information on our growing library of unabridged audiobooks and to take advantage of special offers. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.